Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. An additional proposal has been lodged by the Family Law System Joint Select Committee for a private meeting today from 4.30 p.m. Um, I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call the Leader of the Government. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the remote participation of senators. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. I move that the rules for remote participation of Senate proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its first report of 2020 have effect during the sittings of the Senate from 15 to 18 February 2021. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the routine of business for today. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. I thank the Chamber. I move that today, one, the sitting of the Senate be suspended from 11.50 a.m. till the ringing of the bells to enable senators to attend the House of Representatives for a statement by the Prime Minister concerning the anniversary of the national apology to the stolen generation. Two, when the sittings resume, the Senate return to its routine of business. Three, the routine of business after notices of motion be the tabling and consideration of the statement and no time limit apply. Four, after consideration of the statement has concluded, the Senate return to its routine of business. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. Uh, I move that the following general business orders of the day be considered today at the time for private senators' bills. A. Number 40, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Transparency Measures Lowering the Disclosure Threshold Bill 2019. And B. Number 62, Royal Commission Amendment uh, Confidentiality Protections uh, Bill 2020. The question is the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day number 40, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Transparency Measures Lowering the Disclosure Threshold Bill 2019, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I first introduced this bill more than a year ago, in fact, on the uh, 27th of November 2019. <clears throat> and it sat on the notice paper since then uh, because, of course, this government, the Morrison government, does not want to deal with this issue. They don't want transparency around political donations. They want to continue the cover-up. In the recent re release of the Australian Electoral Commission on the political donations for the financial year shows why. A $75,000 donation from Clive Palmer to the National Party. Simply outrageous that the Nationals are accepting donation from Clive Palmer while he's funding his own political party. This government coalition is a coalition between Liberals, Nationals and Clive Palmer. And because political parties uh, were only required to disclose individual donations above $14,000 during the last financial year, we don't know whether Clive Palmer also made donations to the Liberal Party. He could have donated $13,999 uh, and we wouldn't know about it. We also don't know why the, which Liberal donors this government has done favours for. Last year we found out that the Leppington Pastoral Council had donated 
$58,000 to the Liberals and had been paid $30 million for a parcel of land worth, we found out, one-tenth of that much. Just last week we found out that Peter Dutton had awarded an $880,000 grant to an organisation eight days after it made a donation of $1,500 to the LNP in support of Mr Dutton. How many other Liberal Party donors have won tenders, grants and approvals funded by taxpayers' money? <coughs> we don't know because the system lacks transparency. How many donations are we not seeing because the threshold for disclosure is set so high? $14,300. Federal Labor discloses all donations above $1,000. That's our policy and that is what we think all parties should be doing so, don so that donations are transparent and there for all to see. That's why we've introduced this bill and that's exactly what this bill does. All donations over $1,000 would need to be disclosed. That would mean that <coughs> the Australian public would actually get to see who is funding political parties, not just a tiny piece of the puzzle. With the lower threshold, a whole heap of donations would come to light. There will be greater media scrutiny <coughs> and reporting of donations, which, which will mean greater transparency and more information for voters as they go to cast uh, their vote. This can only be good for the democratic process. Federally, we have some of the worst disclosure laws in the country, and we're lagging behind the states and territories. New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and the ACT all require donations over $1,000 to be disclosed. Western Australia requires disclosures of donations over $2,500 and South Australia requires donations over $5,000 to be disclosed. So all of them lower than, uh, than the federal requirements. We can and should be doing better and we have done better in the past. It will, will not surprise uh, Senator Smith over there to know that it was a Labor government that first introduced a federal donations disclosure regime. That was nearly 40 years ago uh, in uh, 1983 under the Prime Ministership of Bob Hawke. All donations above $1,000 were required to be disclosed. In 2006, though, the Liberals under John Howard jacked this back up to $10,000 and linked it to CPI. This, index, this indexation has caused it to blow out to the current figure of $14,300 for the 2021 year. That's why this bill also removes indexation to the threshold so that it won't increase uh, every year as it does currently. And it will be fixed from now into the future at $1,000. <coughs> so why would the Liberals massively increase this disclosure threshold? unless they wanted to hide the donations they were receiving. Uh, <clears throat> they will tell you it's about privacy, that the people don't want to donate, um, that want to donate don't want their names published. But it's not mum and dad donors who donate more than $1,000 uh, in one year. <clears throat> if people choose to donate more than that, then they ought to be transparent about that donation. <clears throat> Under Labor's proposals, the, the privacy of small donors will still be protected, but a light will be shone on those seeking to influence policy and government decision-making. The Liberals will also tell you that they don't want to lower the threshold because of the increased compliance burden for, the, for, for these parties. Uh, that, um, that it's too difficult and too much effort for political parties to fill in the paperwork. Obviously, with a greater number of donations to declare, there will be a greater amount of work. But transparency and accountability are worth the extra effort, and democracy itself is worth it. If that means providing additional public funding to parties and candidates to ensure their compliance, then we should be having a conversation about that too. The release two weeks ago of the donations data also highlights 
how extraordinarily long it takes the Australian public to find out about the donations political parties have received. It took over 10 months for the Australian voters to find out that Clive Palmer had been donating to the National Party. If a donation is made on the 1st of July, the soonest we can find out about it is 19 months later. And it's a bit better if a donation is made on the 30th of June. That's only seven months to find out about that donation. That is, quite frankly, <coughs> ridiculous and utterly unacceptable. That is why Labor has another bill before the Senate which would require donations above the threshold to be disclosed within seven days. If the Liberal Party is able to accept donations and keep them secret for 19 months, that means they've got all the time uh, to get, give grants, award tenders and do dodgy land deals before anyone finds out about it. And we know that that's what they've been doing, of course. If the Liberal Party is able to accept donations and keep them secret for 19 months, uh, then uh, <coughs> it means that the voters don't have the information when they're casting their vote in a polling booth and simply can't hold the Morrison government to account. Our bill for real-time disclosure would also aggregate donations so that as soon as the total of the donations from a single donor reaches the disclosure threshold, then the party would need to disclose all subsequent donations from that donor, no matter what their value. We know that transparency is the key to preventing and identifying corruption. That's why we've been driving Labor's reform agenda. And it's Labor, not the government or the Greens, who have been driving the agenda for political donation reform, transparency and government accountability. It was Labor who fought for the ban on political donations. The Liberals Party didn't want uh, to stop taking donations from foreign sources, despite the risk to our democracy of foreign influence. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming into accepting our amendments. It was Labor who protected charities and not-for-profits from the government legislation that sought to silence and suppress their political advocacy. And it was Labor who ensured that the public election funding was linked to campaign expenditure preventing candidates and parties from profiting from the electoral system. And it is Labor again who is fighting for a powerful and independent integrity commission. Where is the, uh, where is the government's promised integrity commission? We've seen delay after delay because this government and this Prime Minister doesn't believe in integrity or accountability in government. <coughs> It is a constant battle to get this government to come to the table on integrity reforms, and it is a battle to stop them eroding democracy with uh, draconian measures designed to suppress the vote and silence their critics. We know from uh, Senator McGrath's recommendation as the chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters uh, that the Liberals want to <coughs> firstly introduce voter ID laws potentially disenfranchising our most vulnerable Australians. Abolish compulsory full preferential voting, undermining our compulsory voting system, and introduce increased restri restrictions for charities and not-for-profits, making it harder for them to engage in political advocacy. We will be fighting all of those changes if the Liberals try to introduce legislation before the next election. Australians want honesty in government, but they've received the opposite from the coalition. We've had the sports rorts, the community grants rorts, and now the safer seats rorts. Are there any grants program that they won't rort? The Morrison government expects everyone else to play by the rules, but think that the rules don't apply to them. They want to restrict the abilities of charities to fundraise and, res and uh, restrict their ability to campaign on issues that affect the most vulnerable people in our society. But the government's happy to receive donations from wealthy vested interests and happy with the rules that let them keep those donations secret for as long as possible. Labor is on the side of accountability and transparency in government. That's, why our reforms, um, that's what our reforms are designed to achieve. The government knows who's donating to them uh, and what they're getting for it. It's um, information they can use, which is hidden from us, the media and the public. 
Doing a favour for a donor is obviously wrong. It raises questions, but it's not obvious if no one can see it. We cannot question what we do not know about. We have to trust the government not to take advantage of its position. And given the rorting by this government, you'll forgive me for not trusting them. Australians should know about political donations. They should know before they vote, not months to close to two years later. With our two bills, that is what is going to happen. Lowering the disclosure threshold is something we can do right now to immediately improve transparency. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam De Deputy President. Today I rise to speak on the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Transparency Measures, Lowering the Disclosure Threshold Bill 2019, introduced as a private senator's bill by Senator Farrell. As a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I am pleased to make a contribution to this debate. Senator Farrell's bill proposes to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 regarding the amount at which disclosure of political donations is required. It claims that amending the Act will restore the integrity of our democracy, but what it will actually do is place an unnecessary administrative burden on political parties and increase the red tape load dis disproportionately to the amounts being donated. Don't forget, political parties are largely volunteer-run organisations. Do we want to tie our hard-working volunteers up with even more red tape? A disclosure threshold as low as $1,000 could pick up donations or spending by very small groups such as neighbourhood associations, RSL branches, sporting clubs and other small players who comment favourably or adversely on a federal politician or federal party. It would be unreasonable to expect the smallest donors, like your local footy club, to report with the same intensity as major players. Those donors have only limited financial means and while their interest in politics may be only at a peripheral or hobbyist level, we do not want to discourage that interest or their willingness to donate to a political cause. Diversity in donors encourages diversity in views, making our political landscape more representative. We need to strike a balance that ensures transparency for the largest political donations while protecting the democratic freedom and privacy of smaller players. A disclosure threshold that is set too low will mean a loss of privacy, which in turn compromises the ability to freely sponsor participants in public debate. This bill throws up potential consequences in that it could expose a person to harassment. Aspiring politicians may shy away from further political participation as a result. Privacy rights should not be traded away so lightly. Consider the harassment tactics that have become popular with political activists in recent years. Personal attacks, particularly via social media, have become so commonplace now. We heard harrowing evidence of this during our hearings into the 2019 election campaign. And in an environment where such behaviour is becoming accepted as the norm, there is an even greater need to be cautious about aggressive campaigns that demand greater disclosure of political beliefs. Small businesses which make up the majority of the Australian business landscape are often owned by the same person who serves you at the counter, who does the books and who markets their organ op operation. They are likely time poor and if they were to donate to support a candidate or political party who champions their values, they do not want that act to be arduous. On top of the red tape issue, small businesses are particularly susceptible to cancel culture intimidation. Word of mouth is a key marketing tool for small businesses, but negative word of mouth can cost these small operations dearly. This means they might decide not to make a political donation for fear of harassment or intimidation. A low donation threshold would take away the platform for the diverse opinions that are otherwise heard in public debate today. Many of these opinions come from small players like mum and dad small businesses and local sporting groups. We don't want to silence their voices. We want these players to have a say in Australian public debate. This bill is such a blunt instrument that it not only proposes to lower the cap, but it also does away with indexation of the disclosure threshold by proposing repeal of section 321A of the Electoral Act. This would mean that the $1,000 threshold would be frozen in nominal terms, effectively lowering the cap each year. 
Thousands more Australians will therefore be caught in the red tape reporting net as a result. The Coalition has already implemented several reforms to improve the integrity of the electoral system. These include prohibiting foreign political donations, including those from foreign governments and state-owned enterprises being used to finance public debate, limiting public election funding to demonstrated electoral spending that can be substantiated by receipts, requiring public reporting by key non-party players like left-wing organisation GetUp, applying the electoral authorisation requirements to modern communication channels like SMSs, increasing the funding for the Australian Electoral Commission to use electronic certified lists of electors to guard against electoral fraud and ensure absentee voters have their votes counted in the right electorate, funding a modernisation of the AEC's transparency register to make it easier to locate and extract data and making it mandatory for an election candidate to complete a qualification checklist to show they are entitled to run for election to parliament. We explored the topic of electoral processes and procedures and clarified the relationship between federal and state and territory electoral finance laws in this place just a few months ago when the Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020 was debated. That bill acknowledged that the legislation around elections and referendums held in Australia could be clearer. It also showed how electoral processes could be enhanced and modernised to allow for greater flexibility within the Australian Electoral Commission. More clarity and streamlined election delivery strengthens our electoral integrity and builds confidence in our voting system. To achieve this clarity, the Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020 amended the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and the Referendum Machinery Provisions Act 1984. In amending the Electoral Act, donation and disclosures laws relating to the relationship between federal electoral events and those in the states and territories were clarified. This follows the 2019 High Court decision of Spence versus the State of Queensland and reflected the High Court's findings about the exact limits of the Commonwealth's legislative power. The Miscellaneous Measures Bill also provided greater clarity around the relationship between federal, state and territory electoral laws to improve certainty for those who participated in elec elections across different levels of government. Individuals and entities are subject to different electoral funding and disclosure laws across federal, state and territory jurisdictions, leading to confusion and potentially costly or unlawful errors. After each federal election, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters conducts a review into the election. As a first-time member of that committee, but a long-time volunteer involved in both state and federal campaigns, I found the process enlightening. Naturally, there are always going to be different views from all sides of politics, and we need to ensure that recommendations made and acted upon improve the outcome for the people of Australia. I'm certain that Committee Chair Senator McGrath will elaborate on many of the 27 recommendations made from that inquiry during his contribution later today. However, I want to mention just a few that I believe would provide further confidence in the election process for our community. The first of those is the need to identify voters when presenting at a polling booth. With a background in banking where privacy and security is paramount, I have never understood how anyone can simply walk into a polling booth, state their name and address and be accepted in good faith. Who is to say that they haven't been into every polling booth in the neighbourhood and voted on behalf of their family, their neighbours and anyone else they know the details for? In today's world, you are asked to verify your identity in almost every aspect of life, using pins, thumb or fingerprints and, yes, occasionally even signatures, on a regular basis. Why should voting be any different? Further to this, the Chair's report also recommends that the electoral roll be strengthened to ensure only those with photo ID or other forms of suitable ID can enrol or change enrolment. This is a simple no-brainer to me. Other recommendations included broadening the test for affiliated organisations, exploring the possibility of introducing an electronic certified role, replacing compulsory pre preferential voting with optional preferential voting and introducing Tasmanian initiative the Robson rotation for ordering candidates on ballot papers in the House of Representatives. 
further opportunity to gain insight into the transparency and accountability around political donations and disclosure is currently underway, with the current Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters reporting later this year on our review into the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Electoral Funding and Disclosure Reform Act 2018. This review commenced on the second anniversary of the Royal Assent of the Bill and will allow us to understand the impacts of the amendments made at that time while also providing an opportunity for further community consultation on this matter. We need to ensure that we maintain a balanced approach when it comes to political donations. Yes, we need transparency for the largest political donations, but we also need to protect the democratic freedom and privacy of smaller players. This bill seeks to introduce a disclosure threshold so low that it will rob small donors of their privacy and drive them out of political life. A balanced disclosure regime is one that allows political participation by all Australians. The current disclosure threshold appropriately balances red tape, political participation and transparency of the electoral system. Therefore, I call on the Senate to reject this bill. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Um Senator Askew. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. And I rise to speak mm -hmm. on the uh, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Transparency Measures Lowering the Disclosure Threshold Bill of 2019. Um, now, this is a bill that would lower the disclosure threshold for donations to political parties to $1,000. Now, that's a noble outcome, but I'm extremely disappointed that whilst we're debating this bill today, the Labor Party are not bringing this bill on for a vote. They could have done so. We could have voted this through. The Greens certainly would have supported it, and we do support it. It's a bare minimum reform, but it's a start. And so I'm extremely disheartened that there seems to be an attempt to be seen to be doing something without actually doing the thing. So I call on Labor to rethink their plans to not move this bill for a vote, because surely um, when private senators' time is so scarce, we should use those opportunities to pass good laws. I'm going to talk about how this bill could be further improved, um, but that's the major point here. Is it's great that we're debating reform, but why not bring it on for a vote? Now we know the government doesn't even want to be seen to be doing anything, uh, let alone actually do something. But to have this chance to push them to a vote and to not do so is baffling to me and incredibly disheartening to the Australian population who want reform in this space. They are sick of their democracy being perceived as for sale. So this is a bare minimum reform. Lowering the disclosure threshold is the least that we could do to clean up the influence of big money on politics. It doesn't remove the influence of that money. It would at least have some transparency over the process. But after today, we still won't have that because you're not bringing this bill on for a vote. So um, one wonders, frankly, at the, at, at the point of even debating this if you're not going to move it to a vote. Now, I'm sure everybody knows that big money continues to corrupt our democracy and to prioritise private interests over the public interest and over the interests of um, the broader constituency and people. And in just the last year, we saw these figures disclosed last Monday by the Electoral Commission. In 2019, nearly $170 million was donated to political parties. And the majority of that money came from just five big donors. Now, the alarming thing is the trend here. Between 2016 and 2019 elections, the amount of money that was donated tripled. So the problem of private money buying political parties and funding their re-election campaigns is getting worse. It's gotten three times worse between the last two elections. And these are just the donations that we do know about. And I'll talk a bit about dark money in a moment. But this is a particularly concerning trajectory, particularly since we're staring down the barrel of the next election. The usual suspects like the gambling industry, fossil fuels, pharmaceuticals and the banking sector have continued to give very generously, and they've been rewarded with grants, with contracts, with advantageous policy outcomes or advantageous policy in action in the case of the climate crisis. Just a few examples. The guy whose box factory opening kept the Prime Minister from an international climate summit, Mr Anthony Pratt, donated $1.55 million to the coalition through Pratt Holdings. And Pratt's company, Visi, ended up with a $10 million bushfire recovery grant, and now with a recycling export ban that strengthens their market dominance. 
Collectively, the biggest five fossil fuel giants, Woodside, Santos, Rio Tinto, BHP and Peabody, gave around $10 million to the major parties and to lobby groups in uh, 1920. Uh, is it any wonder that we see government paralysis on the climate crisis and this continued fiction of a gas-led recovery? Chevron paid no tax on their Australian earnings. But they somehow managed to find $92,000 to donate to the major parties. Crown, who you'll hear a lot more about this week, um, gave almost $146,000 to the major parties in 1920, and they've given $2 million since the year 2000. Now, given the evidence that we've heard from the Bergen report just last week about uh, criminal uh, involvement and money laundering allegations, uh, it really is incumbent upon both big parties to give that money back, um, and what's better, to give it to a gambling support service and charity. And we'll be uh, talking about that later today. But more examples of big money buying big outcomes. The big four accounting firms donated 400,000 to the big parties, and over that same period, they got themselves almost 600 million in government contracts. Pretty good return on investment there. And after a brief hiatus during the Banking Royal Commission, the big banks have resumed donating again. The banks, the financial lobby groups and the major insurance and credit firms delivered over $900,000 to the government in 1920, which you know, wouldn't possibly have anything to do with the efforts to, re to relax responsible lending laws, now would it? The Greens have consistently advocated not just for lowering the disclosure threshold, but to actually lower the amount that people, organisations, uh, companies, unions, anybody is permitted to donate to a political party. Um, we'd like to see bans on particular industries who've got a demonstrated history of seeking influence on policy making. Um, we don't think they should be allowed to donate at all. But at the very least, we think that there should be a cap of $1,000 per year, no matter who you are, in how much you can donate to the big political parties. A level playing field of a small, modest amount that hopefully isn't enough to buy influence, uh, but is still constitutional and allows people to express uh, their desires to support a particular party. But big money should not be running our political system. And at the moment, it's running rough. It's gotten worse over the last election period. And now we have a bill which um, attempts to do the barest minimum of reforms that we're not even going to get to vote on today. Real-time disclosure is another issue. We've got that here in Queensland now. Um, but this bill doesn't address speeding up the disclosure time frame. There's a lag of up to 19 months before the public learns who donated what to whom. Now, that delay doesn't help transparency. In fact, it hides possible policy outcomes that may have been obtained from that donation flowing. So we need a rigorous real-time disclosure regime, and we need to properly address this issue of dark money, not just by lowering the disclosure threshold, but by treating things like membership fees, fundraising dinner fees, um, those, those cosy lunches and dinners where you pay a squillion to go and sit next to the minister and speak in her or his ear, um, we need to treat all of that as political donations to actually get some transparency and accountability in the system. Now, as I've said, we support lowering the disclosure threshold to $1,000, but whilst this improves transparency, it doesn't remove the influence of that money. Greater transparency um, would give uh, information but it would still take that 19, up to 19 months to disclose. It will tell us who's buying our democracy, but not in a timely manner, and it won't stop it being for sale. Now, we saw a report this morning where the extent of dark money um, is uh, just off the charts. 40 per cent of the money received by the coalition falls into that category where they don't need to disclose who's giving them that money—40 per cent called dark money because it either falls under the disclosure threshold or is in a category where you don't otherwise have to disclose. So it includes things like fundraising dinners, memberships, subscriptions, um, donations from uh, support bodies that are affiliated with the party. Dark money is a huge problem. 40 per cent of the coalition's funds are dark money, and I think it's 27.7 per cent for Labor dark money. So while lowering the disclosure threshold will address some of that, it still leaves those other categories unregulated, and we have the chance to fix that 
and we should be doing exactly that. This bill doesn't capture membership fees, it doesn't capture subscriptions or attendance at fundraising events, it doesn't lift the curtain on those holding companies and foundations that warehouse donations. So without that reform, significant sources of campaign income will remain hidden. This bill also doesn't stop government grants and contracts going to donors. It doesn't prevent companies applying for government approvals uh, while, uh, while donating and while their application is being assessed. And we've seen a litany of examples, including Santos and Adani, make donations in recent years, round about the time their approvals were given. That's something that the Greens would like to reform as well. This bill doesn't impose any restrictions on the source of political donations. And as we've seen from the media and the revelations this week about Crown, uh, clearly accepting donations from organisations like Crown, who are now in, uh, embroiled in uh, criminal allegations and money laundering allegations, it's just past tenable that any party would uh, continue to receive or even retain donations from folk like Crown. The defence, pharmaceutical, mining, uh, property development, banking and alcohol industries should also be explicitly prohibited from seeking to buy favourable outcomes through donations. And this bill, lastly, doesn't put a cap on the total amount of donations that can be made. It doesn't bring forward that 19-month delay in disclosure. A few weeks ago and um, earlier today, uh, when Senator Farrell spoke to this bill, um, the Labor Party were dismayed that, the, uh, that Clive Palmer and his political party had uh, made donations to the Nationals um, and generally spent an awful lot of money trying to buy electoral outcomes either for themselves or for the coalition. Um, but despite this outrage, which I note is lacking when it comes to fossil fuel donations and the influence that that industry seeks, um, they sadly refused to vote for our motion just last week calling for real-time disclosure and donation caps. Um, it, they said that the parliament needed to debate real reforms. Well, here we are debating some reforms. You're not even bringing it to a vote. Uh, I think you're hoist on your own petard. So I'm uh, moving today a second remaining uh, amendment, which I now do so. It's in my name on sheet 1194, which is drafted in such a way that we hoped people would actually be able to support it. I understand it's now been circulated in the chamber. And it's to call for a cap on the amount of political donations that can be made. We'd like that at $1,000, but we're open to discussion. And it calls for a more timely disclosure of political donations um, so that we're not waiting that 19-month period. Um, again, Queensland manages real time. There's a variety of different uh, time frames that apply in different states. It can be done. It can be sped up. Let's have that conversation. So I look forward to uh, some support, as I'm an eternal optimist, um, for that second reading amendment when the time comes. Um, I might just flag one final uh, point and just really to mention that uh, were this bill have gone to a vote, if the Labor Party had have sought to, to do so, that we would have moved some committee stage amendments to address this point. We don't have that opportunity today, but we may, may have that opportunity in the future, in that lowering this, the disclosure threshold will impose greater reporting requirements on third parties, and our third parties is, um, is defined, and the definition in section 287 means that an organisation becomes a third party if its spending on electoral matters is more than the disclosure threshold, and if you are so deemed a third party, you are therefore um, subject to higher reporting requirements um, beyond just disclosure of those same donations. There's additional obligations that flow. Now, we are concerned, as we always have been, that that might deter smaller organisations from advocating on important political issues during election campaigns. I'm thinking particular, in particular of environmental organisations, given that's my background. Um, this is a very readily fixed issue, and it would simply be to decouple the definition of third party from the disclosure threshold and instead to tie it to an amount of electoral expenditure. Um, now, I understand this issue is before JSCAM, which I also sit on, um, and will probably be addressed in the review of the Electoral Funding Disclosure Review, or EFDR, bill. So we look forward to um, uh, hopefully having a uh, consensus workable solution on that matter, but I just wanted to place on record that we're aware of that issue and, um, and keen to see it addressed. So we had an opportunity here today to debate donations reform. The reforms needed are such a long list. Yes, we need to lower the disclosure threshold, but we've got to cap the amount that people can donate. 
We've got to make sure that that disclosure happens as quickly as possible. We've got to capture all that dark money by making sure that memberships and fundraisers and those other um, uncategorised donations actually do have to be disclosed. People have a right to know who is seeking to buy influence. And frankly, people have a right to a system that is free from being able to be bought. That's why we'd like to see a cap on the amount of donations that can be made to political parties. Uh, and a level playing field, no matter who you are, that cap should apply. Individuals, unions, companies, vested interests, lobby groups, you name it. Let's get the influence of big money off our politics, out of our democracy. This isn't America. Our democracy shouldn't be for sale to the highest bidder. We should be guided by evidence and by the public interest in making decisions, not by who just took you out to lunch and promised to make a mozza of a contribution to get you re-elected. The Australian people deserve that reform. Momentum is building for that reform. The Greens have been pushing for this for 10 years now. Um, that seems to be about the time frame that it takes for other things to get done. It took us 10 years before um, a federal ICAC was uh, at least agreed in principle to by big political parties. Of course, we're yet to see one, um, but we continue to wait. So we will still be here pushing for reform of our political system because people want their democracy back. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, I've listened carefully to uh, Senator Waters uh, and to uh, Senator Farrell's outline of their approaches to the bill. Um, and uh, I have to say, I think there is largely agreement in the Australian community about what the nature of the problem is. Largely agreement, apart from on the government side, that uh, the influence of unregulated, undisclosed money in politics is a deep problem uh, for our political system uh, and a deep problem uh, for the level of trust that there is between people uh, and their government. And we've seen, of course, in the last election, uh, Mr Palmer, Clive Palmer, uh, that disreputable businessman from Queensland, spending an enormous amount of money largely directed against the Labor Party, uh, tens of millions of dollars across the country in an entirely unaccountable and unprincipled way, directing to supporting, in particular in Queensland and New South Wales and Western Australia, the candidates that the Morrison government put forward in that election. We've seen scandals about donations being provided by companies and by organisations who later, later got grants from the Morrison government. But people are, in, I think, entitled to have a deep level of scepticism about this government's commitment to a clean electoral system, to a balanced electoral system. Now, um, when you listen to Senator Waters, it, it, it is as if the impetus for electoral reform somehow comes from the Greens political party, as if they are a pure source of uh, you know, deep concern about the Australian electoral system, and as if nobody else in the system or in the community, in academia, has talk been talking about this issue for decade after decade. Um, it is welcome, though, the Greens' interest in this area. Uh, but I do think, having listened carefully to Senator Waters and looking at the Greens' Uh, policy position in this area, they, get, they have the same, some similar motivations, but they get the answer quite wrong. I do think that the bill that Senator Farrell has spoken to and dealt with offers the right answer to some very complex questions. It only deals with the questions that we've been outlining today. As Senator Water says, there are other issues in the political system that we ought to be having regard to. Uh, so that's the Greens' position. Uh, right motivation, but I think get the answers wrong. I think the Farrell bill is well worth this parliament supporting, but it does beg the question, what is the Morrison government's position about electoral reform? Well, it's two things. Firstly, nothing to see here, move on. And secondly, how can they use this for their own partisan political advantage to gain the system. Of course the regulation of political donations is fundamental to our democracy. 
Donations are a form of speech, in fact. High courts upheld that donations are a form of political communication. Who can donate, how they can donate, the process through which that is disclosed is fundamental uh, for citizens' participation in democracy. The lesson has to be clear from the United States about where you end up going as a society and a community if you allow complete, unregulated, undisclosable, completely not transparent uh, money into the political system. Now, in this country, the laws around political donations are subject to two legal tests. Firstly, does the law burden the implied freedom of political communication? And secondly, is the law reasonably appropriate and adapted to serve a legitimate end in a manner compatible with a constitutionally prescribed system of responsible and representative government? The truth is, all regulation of political donations effectively burden the freedom of political, political communication. The question is, when you regulate, is it appropriate and is it directed towards a legitimate end? We don't want an American-style system that preferences the constitutional rights of a wealthy few over the health of our whole political system. So what should be the legitimate ends of our system of electoral donations? Our system should prioritise accountability, transparency, integrity and equity. The purpose of regulation in this area should be to provide for a vibrant public sphere. It should be to provide for more voices of ordinary Australians in politics, not less. It should uh, engage and, uh, and uh, encourage speech and donations by individuals and organisations that brings more people into the political system, doesn't force the voices of ordinary Australians out. I don't believe that our election system should be entirely publicly funded. Uh, that, that is a recipe supported by some. That is a recipe that leads to a sort of dull centrism where the ordinary voices of Australians are locked out. Now, that, that there is a balance to be struck here between proper public funding and ensuring that political parties are able to participate effectively in the political system without being beholden to donations and supporting the rights of political parties to be supported, whether it's by $10 donations from individuals or larger donations from organisations. Now, I have been engaged in this argument uh, for many, many years, uh, inside this parliament and outside of it. In 2012, the New South Wales government introduced laws that banned donations from any organisation or person who was not an enrolled voter in the state. It aggregated the electoral communications expenditure of parties and affiliated bodies, such as unions, as expenditure caps. So the Liberal Party in New South Wales did, in its interests, what the Greens would like to do in their interests if they were ever in charge. They abolished the capacity of their political opponents to participate in the system. That's what they did. They made it unlawful for unions and community organisations, environment organisations, neighbourhood organisations, to participate in the political system. Now, I supported the Union's New South Wales case, which went to the High Court, which ultimately uh, kicked out the O'Farrell legislation. And it, it turned the New South Wales government down on the basis that I've described. It was not a legitimate end that the government sought. It was, it was a political end that the government sought in its own political advantage. You know, there is quite some history to the labour movement's engagement in politics in this country. Most of our modern political history is shaped by the Labor movement and the Labor Party participating in politics. Almost all of the good things that have happened in modern Australian history have happened as a result of the Labor movement and the Labor Party's participation. And, and people, when considering their approach to donations, ought to have regard to that. You know, if the Nurses and Midwives Association 
want to use their resources to campaign on nurse to patient ratios in the lead up to an election in a way that's openly declared, uh, spending perhaps millions of dollars worth of members' money. Who on earth are a group of politicians to tell them that that ought to be regulated out of existence? If the AMW wants to fight for locally built trains and apprenticeships, the ASU wants to fight for funding for proper funding for uh, better funded domestic violence services, or if the SDA or the United Workers Union want to fight for uh, penalty rates in hospitality and retail, that's what we want in the political system. We want more people making the argument, bringing the argument home. But the Greens bill would see those, vo those voices silenced in many respects. The first meeting of the New South Wales Labor Party, I always say the New South Wales Labor Party, I don't want to upset my Queensland colleagues. The first meeting of the New South Wales Labor Party was on the 4th of April 1891 at the Unity Hall Hotel in Balmain. It's still there, that pub. The Balmain Electoral League accepted a donation from the Dock Workers Union which paid for the registration of all of the Labor League candidates for that election. Our movement has survived for 130 years because of those institutional connections. The bill offered this morning by the Greens, in my view, is, is naive. Uh, it's partisan recklessness. Excluding individuals should be a product of careful and deliberate consultation not a list of the people that you wish weren't participating in the public space. It, it is based on, and I think many people who approach this area of regulation, it's based on this proposition that if all of these voices were removed, that somehow the argument that had merit would rise to the top, that somehow there would be this process where people would fairly consider the arguments. Well, the truth is, Politics is shaped by institutional power, by a struggle for power and a struggle for uh, winning propositions in the public sphere, and we can't legislate whether your disagreement is with big mining or the finance industry. You can't legislate those people out of having some role. It is true that you can, where there is a nexus between uh, pecuniary advantage and public policy, it is a legitimate end. So, for example, in the New South Wales system, I do think that there is a very strong argument for keeping property developers out of local and state government uh, decision making. It makes absolute sense. I think there is a community understanding that the tobacco industry ought not be engaged in that, given how closely related they are to health industry regulation. The case has got to be made out and it's got to satisfy the test that the High Court set out for the parliament. And I don't think that the list that's provided does that trick. I do, I do want to spend a little bit of time, though, on the, on the bill and the government's approach. Lowering disclosure thresholds is pretty fundamental. Our federal sphere has the weakest political donation laws of any jurisdiction. The disclosure threshold is entirely out of step with the states and the territories in Queensland. It's $1,000. New South Wales, $1,000. Western Australia, $1,000. Victoria, $1,040 for some reason. The ACT, $1,000. South Australia, $5,000. In the federal sphere, you can donate up to $14,300 and nobody will know. Nobody will know. There is no aggregation. Multiple donations below the threshold can go unreported. That's why, as Senator Waters outlined to the chamber, that's why 40 per cent of the money received by the coalition parties to campaign in Australia is dark money, is unreported, is unaccountable, is from individuals unknown. Now, in a system where we, we are uh, watching developments overseas, and watching developments in our own jurisdiction with foreign interference, with big money getting involved in politics, with scandal after scandal here, rort after rort here, smug arrogance in the way that this government treats 
government money as Liberal Party money, it is entirely proper, entirely proper that people look at that 40 per cent of Scott Morrison's electoral war chest, 40 per cent of it, nearly half, and nobody knows where it's come from. Nobody knows who's made those donations. Nobody knows which piper is calling the Morrison tune on any particular day. Now, we do need proper electoral regulation in this country. We do need a National Integrity Commission to oversee the intersection between money and politics. You know, we've just seen this week, last week, that Mr Dutton awarded a grant nearly $900,000 to an organisation eight days after it donated to the Queensland Liberal National Party. He took a $36,000 chartered flight to Tasmania to announce a grant that he hadn't even awarded yet. This program wasn't safe for communities, it was safe for seats. That's what Minister Dutton was engaged in. That's why people are sceptical about the role of money in politics, and that's why this place and the other place need to get with the program and get a decent system of electoral regulation so we can rebuild confidence in the system. Thank you, Senator Rees. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Acting Deputy President. I move that, that, that the debate be now adjourned. Um, all in agreement? Thank you. Uh, Clark. General Business Order of the Day number 62, Royal Commission's Amendment Confidentiality Protections Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Steele John. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Press. Um, the Royal Commission into Disability Abuse is a historic opportunity for truth and justice. It was created as the result of a vast community campaign spanning from every section of our country to create a mechanism by which we as disabled people would be able to tell our stories, would be able to disclose the information that we have, the evidence that we have gathered, speaking to the violence, speaking to the abuse, speaking to the exploitation and the neglect of our community. And it should be the case that every person that wishes to give that evidence to the Commission is able to do so, guaranteed safe in the knowledge that giving that evidence, giving that information, sharing that story will not in any way negatively impact on them, will not jeopardise their future employment, will not place them at risk of harm. The reality, however, is that right now, due to a flaw in the law which creates and empowers royal commissions, that guarantee of protection, that guarantee of privacy cannot be given. Right now, the confidentiality of information given to the Commission as confidential is only remained and retained as confidential for the life of the royal commission. And this means that when the Royal Commission ends, the confidentiality protection ends, that information can be FOI'd, that information can be given as evidence. And this flaw in the law removes the confidence and the protection that is needed for people to come forward, for people to tell their stories. This is particularly harmful in the context where we know that if you have experienced violence, abuse, ne exploitation or neglect, you have almost certainly experienced systemic failure. Somebody that has been charged with your protection, has let you down, has abused you. And so in order to get people to come forward and tell their stories, to give the evidence to guide the investigation of these systemic failures, uh, you must be able to give people the confidence that their, protect, their confidentiality will be, protection, uh, will be protected and that giving this evidence will not do them any harm. Will not do them any harm because disabled people have been telling our stories for many decades and we are often subject to harm because we disclose. 
We are often dissuaded from giving our evidence, and it often has a negative impact. The outcome of this absence of protection is that the Disability Royal Commission is not getting the evidence that it needs. It is not hearing the evidence that it needs to hear in order to guide its investigation so that it can uh, make recommendations at the end of this process, having exposed the wrongs and the cover-ups that we need as parliamentarians to form the basis of legislation which will then eradicate, which will then eliminate violence, abuse and neglect of disabled people uh, from our society. And for 18 months, for 18 months, the government have known that this change is needed. The chair of the Royal Commission flagged at the very first hearing, this change is needed. The Commission then wrote to the government in February of 2020 saying this change is needed. The, government, the Commission uh, stated clearly in its October interim report that the absence of these protections are serving as an impediment to the investigation, an impediment to this historic opportunity for justice. Well, we Greens have been clear with the Morrison government. If you do not act, we will. We introduced this bill in October. We put the government on notice that this change was urgently needed. The government have failed to be forthcoming, and so today this bill is being debated and I hope will be voted on and voted for by this chamber. It will very simply it will very simply ensure that if evidence is given confidentially, it is retained as confidential. It will provide safety and security to people given their evidence so that they can begin that process of building up the support they need to tell their story, to come forward and say, this is what happened, this is who knew, this is who I tried to tell. We know that there are so many people in the community that worked in governmental institutions, that work in government still, that have observed the profound failure to bring light into dark places, to ensure justice was done, instead to cover up and to silence. We know that there are people that want to tell their stories and have not done so because of the absence of these protections. This bill solves that problem. It sorts it as it should have been sorted 18 months ago. I commend it to the Chamber in the hope that it shall be voted on and passed and that finally disabled people will have the protection we need to tell our stories, to heal and get justice. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Senator Scar. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, if I can first say, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, how much I admire and have admired uh, since coming to this place more than 18 months ago now, uh, Senator Jordan Steele John's Senator Steele John's uh, passion with respect to this subject uh, and his advocacy with respect to this uh, matter. It, uh, uh, and I also commend Senator Seward. As well, because I know she's had uh, an integral part in terms of uh, maintaining the pressure, which, which absolutely had to have been maintained in order to establishing the Royal Commission. So I just want to place that uh, on the record. And we saw that passion once again on display today. And I think it's fair to say that um, there'd be uh, many Australians uh, suffering under a disability. Uh, today, who, um, who look at you, uh, Cinder Steele John, with great admiration. The government agrees that there is a problem that needs to be fixed, and it does need to be fixed quickly, because it is absolutely essential that disabled people have an opportunity to tell their stories and where confidentiality needs to be maintained, that confidentiality should be maintained. There is absolutely no question about that whatsoever. And I commend Senator Steele John for introducing this private member's bill. Uh, the government did announce in October last year, uh, I must say after, uh, as I understand it, the private member's bill was introduced, but on the 20th of October that the government would be looking and is in the process of drafting legislation to address this very problem. And it is hoped 
that that legislation is introduced in the autumn sittings of this parliament. And as Senator Steele John has said, it is really time critical that this legislation is introduced because when this Royal Commission concludes its deliberations, we must ensure that those people who have made submissions to the, uh, the Royal Commission, uh, their confidentiality, where that confidentiality, confidentiality is absolutely crucial, is maintained on and from the end of the date of the Royal Commission. It's also important that the step be taken as soon as possible. And the reason for that, and Senator Steele-John touched on this in terms of his contribution, we need to send a message. We need to send a message to everyone in the Australian community that the Australian government is aware of this issue. All members of this Senate, including Senator Steele-John, are aware of this issue, and it needs to be addressed. And it will be addressed. It will be addressed. And I'm happy to stand behind that statement I've just made on the record. It will be addressed before the Royal Commission comes to an end. So please, if you have a story to tell the Royal Commission, please tell your story. I read in preparation for this debate the uh, interim report from the Royal Commission, which was released in, uh, towards the end of last year. And I just want to read the quote which stands out at the front of the interim report, because I think it really sums up and goes to the crux of why this debate is just so important. And the quote that introduces this interim report is as follows, and I quote, What is happening to people is not okay and the stories need to be told, end quote. And I'll repeat it. What is happening to people is not okay and the stories need to be told. And I commend, I commend all of the, uh, the the chair of the Royal Commission and also the six commissioners for the work that they've done. And I note indeed that one of the commissioners, uh, the Honourable Rosalind Atkinson AO, served with distinction in the Queensland Supreme Court. So I, I congratulate the Honourable Ronald Sackville, all of the other six commissioners, uh, the Honourable Ros Atkinson of my home state, Ms Barbara Bennett, Dr Rhonda Galbali, Ms Andrea Mason, Mr Alistair McEwen and the Honourable John Ryan for the work which they've done. And it is quite incredible. It is quite incredible that they've received so far 1,928 submissions, 7,608 telephone conversations, they've issued 12 issue reports and received 468 responses. Just an outstanding response. An outstanding response. I want to take some time, and it's not happy uh, reading, to read some of the case studies which have been drawn out in the interim report of the Royal Commission. And I think in doing this, we emphasise the need and the requirement for there to be confidentiality. Because when I go through these uh, case studies, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, you'll see the vulnerability, the vulnerability of the people of which I will talk uh, in terms of reprisals, in terms of being disadvantaged or discriminated against because they actually told their story. And in all of these cases, uh, there's a footnote that names have been changed and some details removed to protect people's identities. And the narrative has been based on submissions to the Royal Commission. So it's quite clear on the face of these submissions that there is a need for confidentiality to be maintained. The first case study, this is from the victim's perspective. And a lady by the name, or who's given the name Jane. Jane began having seizures as a baby, resulting in development delays and challenging behaviours. Her mother, Marie, told us in her submission that Jane's autism wasn't properly diagnosed until her early teens. By the time Jane was in her late teens, Marie was worn out because of lack of support. So she and her husband made the decision for Jane to live in a care home, supported by a large agency. She describes it as a traumatic option but the only one possible at the time. Marie told us that Jane was excited at the idea of living independently. But although Jane was very happy with the night and weekend staff, she had many issues with the day staff. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, you can, you can, I can try to put myself in the position of the parents of this daughter, Jane, and the angst that they went through when trying to work out what's best what's best for Jane. And they came to this decision 
that Jane needed to be um, given the opportunity to go into a care home supported by a large agency. So they made that decision in good faith. But what they found was this. Jane's behaviour management plan was never followed. Jane was subject to humiliation, intimidation and bullying. Her mother, Marie, complained to the day service staff and eventually to the general manager. Her emails went unanswered and she felt the staff avoided her. Again, can one imagine the emotional turmoil that the mother, Marie, is going through at the treatment of her daughter, Jane, and what Jane is going through? In a submission, Marie describes ringing one night to speak with Jane. The staff member who answered asked if the agency had been in touch, in touch regarding the critical incident. Marie hadn't heard about it. Then Jane told her she had been sexually abused by a staff member. Marie told us that when she called the agency the next morning, they asked, Oh, you think that happened? Question mark. Do you want us to get the police involved? Question mark. Marie was adamant that she did. Two weeks later, Jane was interviewed by the police. Marie told us that in the 20 months it took for the case to go to trial, Jane was in a constant state of anxiety and the agency offered her no support. Jane developed a fear of new people supporting her. When new support people were introduced, she was scared of them and told Marie they were hurting her. Jane's behaviour escalated and police were called. Marie recounts in her submission that the staff member was found guilty and sentenced to prison. The prosecutor was surprised because it is, and I'll quote, quite rare for a person with a disability to win a case of abuse, end quote as they are not considered reliable witnesses. However, the conviction was overturned on appeal. Marie told us she felt that a factor in this outcome was that Jane had to engage with a series of prosecutors who lacked understanding of autistic people while the defendant had one lawyer for the entire process. Marie says that Jane was left angry, fearful, anxious and distrusting and behaved accordingly. She says the service provider suggested Jane would benefit from a stay in their lockdown facility to help people with challenging behaviours. Marie wanted to see the facility in a behaviour management plan, but says this never happened. Instead, she says, they placed Jane there one weekend when they were short-staffed and suggested Jane have no contact with Marie or her favourite people. Again, can, can you imagine the emotional burden and toll this is taking um, on Marie, the mother of Jane, let alone what Jane was going through? Marie states that when, after 10 days, she was allowed to see Jane, she was appalled at the conditions. There was nothing to do, and Jane had been denied her personal possessions. Marie believes this place and how she was treated has become a trigger to the fears and nightmares Jane still experiences. Marie and her husband brought Jane home. Marie told us Jane was severely damaged by the experience and blamed Marie for sending her there. She said Jane was fearful of home support staff and reacted aggressively. Marie's submission describes Jane having post-traumatic anxiety attacks. During these attacks, which are like seizures and can last for hours, she requires incontinence pads, rails on the bed, a helmet and a wheelchair. This is a young woman who is normally very physically able and is continent. Jane is living out of home again and things seem better, but what happened to her continues to have an impact on her daily life. Marie told us she would like to see more comprehensive training for people working in the disability system and the legal system. So that's the story of Jane and Marie and what they went through as a family. And then there's the perspective of an employee. Now, employees are in particularly perilous positions if they turn whistleblower and disclose what is happening in a facility which they believe is untoward, unethical or inappropriate. They can be the subject of persecution in terms of their employment, but it can also affect their future opportunity to obtain employment because future employers might say, well, if they blew the whistle on that employer, maybe they might blow the whistle on me. So this is Lena's story, Lena, an employee. When Lena arrived for her first shift as a disability support worker in a day centre, she expected it to be as advertised. Lena said, on paper, the roster of programs looked fantastic, she told us. Participants, some with high needs, could choose different activities. They should have been enjoying their life, but they weren't. Instead, she was confronted with 32 people, some restrained, some wearing face guard masks and some lying on the floor. There were only two staff and Lena was told to get on with it the best you can, 
End quote. And it goes on. That's Lena's story, an employee. Her confidentiality needs to be protected. And then we have the story of Toby and Gavin. And again, their names have been changed and some details removed. Toby's dad, Gavin, made a submission in which he described Toby's experiences in employment. Toby, who, was, who has moderate intellectual disability, knows kitchens. He'd been working in different kitchens for businesses large and small for 15 years when he started a job in a hotel early last decade. Toby wasn't too bothered by the initial pranks until what Gavin calls the bad staff started. What began as jokes soon became unwelcome, prolonged, repetitive, intimidating and harassing. The attacks were mostly perpetrated by a particular chef who was often left in charge. Gavin described just a few of these incidents. One was where Chad and his mate locked Toby in the freezer, leaving him cold and scared and screaming. Another time they sprayed Toby's shaved head with oil, then set his head and T-shirt alight. Chad told Toby he had to pay him $10 for every day he was kept in the job. Sometimes Toby paid, Gavin said, and when he didn't, Chad would remind him how much he was owing. Sometimes Chad and his mate would stand behind Toby, grabbing his buttocks and pushing their groin into his backside, shouting obscenities. One time Chad and his mate took a large kitchen knife, made Toby close his eyes and drag the blunt side along his arm. Next time they promised they would do it for real. It's the story of Toby and Gavin. I think their confidentiality needs to be protected. Now we have the story of Dev and Yana. Yana's son Dev has Williams syndrome, is autistic and has a mild intellectual disability. She told us that in 2014 he was admitted to a children's hospital where he was neglected by staff. And then Dev and Yana's story recounts how uh, the hospital and in particular certain doctors failed to do what they needed to do in order to give Dev the attention he needed. And again, I think it's important that their confidentiality is protected so that they can have access to the medical support which they need without uh, anyone referring to the testimony which they've given to the Royal Commission. And these stories, Madam Acting Deputy President, go on and on and on. And they are an absolute searing indictment of not just the individuals involved, but of a system which has not been delivering what it ought to be delivering to people with a disability in our country, living here in an advanced economy, a civilised nation. They certainly deserve better, and when their stories are told, they have every right to expect confidentiality, and I look forward to the government's legislation to give them exactly that. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak in support of this bill, and Labor will be supporting this bill. Uh, the bill will amend the Royal Commissions Act 1902 and make consequential amendments to the Freedom of Information Act 1982 to ensure ongoing confidentiality protections for people giving evidence to the Disability Royal Commission. Currently, evidence that is received in private sessions conducted by the Disability Royal Commission is treated as confidential and is guaranteed to remain confidential after the Commission's work is completed. However, the same privacy protections do not apply where evidence or information is received by the Commission outside of a private session, even if, prior to the evidence or information being given, the Commission indicated to the person providing the evidence or information that it would be treated as confidential, and after it was received by the Commission, the material was, in fact, treated as confidential. Quite astounding uh, that such information will not be protected by privacy protections in the same way. Disability advocates have argued persuasively that this may discourage some people from giving evidence to the Disability Royal Commission. The amendments in this bill have been sought by disability advocates, including the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations, and also by the Chair of the Disability Royal Commission, Ronald Sackville AOQC. 
In fact, it is difficult to find anyone who is opposed to these amendments. Last year, the Morrison government even announced that it would introduce similar legislation. And yet the Morrison government is so allergic to following through on its announcements that, as is almost invariably the case, it has done nothing. We will soon find out whether the Morrison government's aversion to following through on its announcements extends to voting against legislation that would do more than implement the government's own policy commitment. A truly bizarre situation. Let's be very clear. The Disability Royal Commission is ongoing and the amendments in this bill are likely to have a material impact on the willingness of people with disabilities to make submissions to the Commission. There is no reason to delay the introduction of this relatively simple set of amendments, and there, is, and there are plenty of reasons to expedite them. As we learned from the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse, it is critical that survivors of abuse in institutional settings be allowed to tell their stories in private and that requests for confidentiality be respected and backed by legislation. Otherwise, many will not tell their stories at all. In 2013, the Gillard Labor government amended the Royal Commission's Act 1902 to allow the chair of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse to authorise a fellow commissioner to hold a private session to receive information from victims and others affected by child sexual abuse. As the then Attorney General said at the time, a traditional Royal Commission hearing setting will not generally serve as the best way to facilitate participation in the Royal Commission by those people affected by child sexual abuse. For many, telling their story will be deeply personal and traumatic. While we cannot know at this time how many people will wish to participate. Sadly, we know that this crime has affected many in our community. Over 8,000 personal stories were told to commissioners in private sessions during the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, and many others were able to tell their personal stories confidentially outside of private sessions, and they could do so because of the privacy protections that were inserted in the Royal Commissions Act and Freedom of Information Act in relation to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. Against that background, it is important to emphasise that the specific amendments in this bill are consistent with the privacy protections that applied to the Child Sexual Abuse Royal Commission. Clearly, the privacy protections that applied in relation to the Child Sexual Abuse Royal Commission should also apply to the Disability Royal Commission. That is what this bill seeks to achieve, and that's why we ask the government to support these amendments. The privacy concerns driving the introduction of this bill are not the only issue that people with disability and advocates in the sector have raised in relation to this Royal Commission. The Disability Royal Commission was established in April 2019 in response to community concern about widespread reports of violence against and the neglect, abuse and exploitation of people with a disability. It set out to investigate preventing and better protecting people with disability from experiencing violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation, achieving best practice in reporting, investigating and responding to violence, abuse neglect and exploitation of people with disability, promoting a more inclusive society that supports people with disability to be independent and live free from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. The Morrison government dragged its feet for two years before establishing the Royal Commission, which Labor first called for in 2017. It was finally announced in 2019 but only at the prospect of losing a vote on the floor of parliament. At the time, then Leader of the Opposition Bill Shorten said, we have to recognise that while ever we are a nation who devalues people with a disability, then we will never actually get to the root cause of violence and the prevention of violence, abuse and neglect. But the Disability Royal Commission has been plagued by this government's continuing disinterest in the systemic problems that exist in Australia's disability frameworks. 
the terms set out by the Disability Royal Commission are at risk of not being properly investigated, while the Morrison government overlooks the basic requirements of people seeking to make a submission to the inquiry. Since its establishment, Labor has called for the Morrison government to heed the calls of more than 60 disability advocacy groups and address the composition of Disability Royal Commission to remove commissioners who have conflicts of interest and to replace them with people who have lived experience of disability and the support of the sector. The Royal Commission is inquiring into episodes that are highly sensitive as well as confronting for those affected. It is only appropriate that the commissioners be people who can hear such evidence objectively and without any perception that their consideration of this evidence be biased in any way. In 2019, the majority of the Senate supported a motion calling on the Morrison government to remove two of the commissioners and to replace them with a set of positive criteria identified by the disability community. The Morrison government has ignored these concerns and people with disability remain uncomfortable with making submissions to a Royal Commission overseen by former disability bureaucrats with real or perceived links to institutions of abuse and neglect. For too long, people with disability have had to reiterate, nothing about us without us. These calls have been frustrated by this Royal Commission, which has heard from more experts and carers than it has witnesses with lived experience of disability. The vetting process of expert witnesses providing evidence has been questioned following the appearance of Mr Simon Wardale, who a coroner found in relation to the death of a disabled woman under his care, fell into error by failing to remain alert to the possibility of a serious head injury and to act decisively. Mr Wardale appeared as an expert witness as part of last September's public hearings into the use of psychotropic medication, behaviour support and behaviours of concern. That he has been provided a platform to speak on behalf of people with a disability is unacceptable and raises serious concerns about the process used by the Royal Commission to invite witnesses to appear before it. Often, the reason people with disability fall prey to abuse can be directly linked to the inherent power imbalances that exist in carer or treatment patient relationships. A Royal Commission investing violence against and the neglect, abuse and exploitation of people with disability should therefore hear from people with disability first and foremost and properly vetted experts and carers secondary to supplement that evidence. Despite the issues with confidence in the Disability Royal Commission, Labor supports the people with disability and advocates who continue to fight for ownership of the inquiry. The calls to action so far made by the Disability Royal Commission have been constructive. In March 2020, the Royal Commission issued a statement of concern that the federal government had not included people with disability in the emergency planning for the coronavirus response. In August, the Royal Commission held hearings into the experiences of people with disability during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, revealing that the Morrison government did not mention disability once in its first pandemic response plan. The hearings heard stories such as Ricky, aged 45 in Melbourne, who was forced to survive on muesli bars for nine days while bedridden without access to a support worker when coronavirus hit. What a way to treat our fellow Australians. The oversight of 4.4 million people in a national emergency is symptomatic of the struggle that Australians with disability face in a society that, without leadership from its government, continues to exclude and overlook them. Labor supports the finding by the Royal Commission that it was a serious failure that no Australian government agency with responsibility for disability policy, including the Department of Health, made any significant effort to consult with people with disability or their representative organisations during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. In its 560-page interim report handed down in October 2020, the Royal Commission noted these attitudinal and communication barriers and the high rates of violence 
many people experience. The report did not make a clear set of recommendations, but urged the federal government to do more to support people with disability during the coronavirus pandemic. Labor is calling on the Morrison government to act immediately on the issues presented by the interim report to prevent the further exclusion of people with disability from national planning and response. At the same time Commissioner Ronald Sackville handed down the interim report, the Royal Commission made a request to government that the, April 2022, sorry, that the April 2022 reporting date be extended by an extra 17 months until September 29, 2023, to produce a final report due to the scale of work required and the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr Sackville has reasoned that the broad scope of the inquiry's terms of reference as one of the biggest of any Royal Commission that that means no firm recommendations could be made in the interim report and the Commission needs an extension to hand down a final report. He is expected to request an extension to September 29, 2023. Labor supports the Royal Commission's request for an extension and urges the government to address the barriers preventing many people from making a submission before its closing date. Almost two years into the inquiry, it is long overdue that these concerns be addressed. Labor will continue to call on the government to act so that the Royal Commission can maintain its integrity and people with disability, their families and carers and the disability sector can have confidence that their evidence is heard independently and impartially. So in conclusion, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, Labor will be supporting these amendments. Uh, we don't see any distinction between the arrangements that were made by the previous Gillard Labor government in relation to the Child Sexual Abuse Royal Commission and this Royal Commission uh, into the abuse of people with disability. Uh, arrangements were changed for the child sexual abuse to ensure that evidence could be provided confidentially with privacy protect protections uh, outside of private sessions, and we think the same thing should be done in relation uh, to the Disability Royal Commission. Uh, people with a disability have been waiting far too long for these terrible abuses and neglect to be properly investigated, and we should all be doing everything we can to ensure that their evidence can be provided safely, confidentially, securely, uh, to inspire confidence in this Royal Commission and to ensure that at last people with disability who ha have suffered abuse and neglect actually can be heard properly securely, that they can have confidence that their concerns will be dealt with. These abuses have gone on too long and confidentiality is required to make sure that they are properly addressed. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I rise this morning to speak on the Royal Commission's Amendment Confidentiality Protections Bill. Now, while I and the government won't be supporting this legislation, we very much take the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with a disability very seriously. That is why the Morrison government established the Disability Royal Commission in the first place. All forms of violence against and abuse of neglect and exploitation of people with disability are abhorrent. We cannot act as a society, we cannot as a society allow it to happen and we must take action to eliminate it from our society. This bill from Senator Steelejohn comes after issues were raised by the chair of the Royal Commission, the Honourable Ronald Sackville, regarding the confidentiality of information given to that Royal Commission. The requested amendments to the Act so that people with a disability would have reassurance that their information will be protected both during the life of the Royal Commission and after it has concluded its work. I thank Senator Steelejohn for bringing this legislation forward. His passion and interest for the disability sector is undeniable. There is no denying that Senator Steelejohn has the best interest of those providing evidence to the Royal Commission at heart when he introduced this legislation. And while I respect the Senate Senator's intentions in bringing forward this legislation, the legislation proposed is unfortunately inadequate to deal with all of the subsequent issues raised by Commissioner Sackville. However, while we are not supporting this legislation, 
the Morrison government is committed to amending the Royal Commissions Act. These amendments will address specific matters raised by the Chair about the confidentiality of information given to the Royal Commission and other broader matters not captured in this bill proposed by the Greens. The government has listened to people with a disability, their families, their carers, as well as the broader Australian public about the importance of ensuring people have the confidence to come forward and tell their story. As a result of these consultations and the request from the chair of the Royal Commission, the Morrison government will introduce our own legislation. Our bill will ensure that people with a disability will be able to engage with the Royal Commission with certainty that their information will be protected. People with a disability are equal citizens and have the right to the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms, including respect for their inherent dignity and individual autonomy. We established the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability in April 2019, following community concerns about widespread reports of unacceptable and abhorrent transgressions against people with disabilities. Such transgressions are not acceptable in a modern Australia. They never were and never are going to be acceptable. Since the Royal Commission was established, it has received more than 1,900 submissions, more than 7,500 telephone inquiries and held 10 public hearings. An 11th public hearing commences in Brisbane tomorrow. It is clear from the evidence that the Royal Commission has received that the Morrison government was right to call that commission. The outcomes of the Royal Commission will be guided by people's lived experiences and its outcomes must be based on a true reflection of those experiences. In order for the Royal Commission to fully realise the scope of its inquiry, it is important that the Australian community feels comfortable and supported in fully engaging with the Royal Commission. It is critical that people sharing their experiences with the Royal Commission feel respected. Survivors of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation have their experiences appropriately acknowledged, recognised and validated. And the Morrison government is committed to ensuring that the Disability Royal Commission does just that. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, prior to being elected to this place, I had significant experiences with Royal Commissions. I've advised governments and businesses through four Royal Commissions. So I know firsthand from first-hand experience that Royal Commissions already have strong protections in place and can ensure uh, people can engage with confidence about protections for information and identity. These mechanisms include the use of private sessions or the use of pseudonyms in public hearings and reports of the Royal Commission or through making of do not publish orders. The government has listened to the Royal Commission and, advocate, and, and advocates and disability supporters. We understand that the existing protections may not give people the necessary confidence to come forward and tell their story. And while there is extensive protections after a Royal Commission has ended, we understand that there may be some concerns about the willingness of some people to come forward in this Royal Commission. For many people with disability and their families and carers, telling their story to the Royal Commission may be the first time in their lives that they have disclosed their experiences of violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation. For others, it is the first time their story has been heard by someone in a position of authority. We want those people to come forward. We want people to feel confident that if and when they come forward, they will be protected. It is for this reason that the Morrison government is making changes to the Royal Commissions Act of 1902 to further these protections. These further measures will ensure that people with disability and their supporters, advocates and families will be able to recount their experiences and fully participate in the Royal Commission. The amendments to the Royal Commission Act by the Morrison government is proposed for the autumn sitting of this parliament this year. These amendments will go a long way to ensure participants in the Royal Commission feel the information given to the inquiry is confidential and protected. Mr Acting Deputy President, the last thing I or the Morrison government want to do is to leave the disability community concerned that because today we are not supporting this legislation does not mean we are not listening to your concerns. We are 100 per cent committed to ensuring that you are listened to and that you feel supported. Thank you.
Senator Seawood. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, this bill is an extremely important bill. It addresses issues that absolutely need to be addressed in terms of being able to guarantee that people have privacy and, conf and, and are confidential. Now, Senator Vans just said that he's had a lot of experience with royal commissions and has said that, in fact, um, the uh, people will be protected. Well, people uh, won't be, and Senator Steelejohn has really carefully articulated why they won't be uh, so protected uh, by the current legislation that operates and in which people are covered at the moment if they are considering making their contributions to, um, to the Royal Commission. What we are looking for in this, or what we are trying to achieve with this bill, is to ensure that people are guaranteed confidentiality and privacy in perpetuity, so that they are, they do feel the confidence to bring their accounts of what happened to them to the Royal Commission, because at the moment they do not feel that confidence. So this bill is absolutely essential to give people, to give disabled, disabled people the confidence that they can bring their accounts of their treatment to the Royal Commission. Now, I chaired the Senate inquiry into violence, and abuse and neglect of people with disability in institutional settings. And the accounts that we heard during that inquiry absolutely broke my heart in terms of the sorts of treatment that people received in residential facilities, in fact, um, in their uh, homes, in schools, on school buses, in, in, every, in, in every residential setting or a setting where a disabled person was receiving care, we heard of accounts of the mistreatment, the abuse, the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the verbal abuse as well, that disabled people received. People need the confidence that they will be protected. And they are telling us, and in particular telling Senator Steelejohn, that that's not what they feel. So those on the other side should actually listen to disabled people, to hear what they are saying about their lack of confidence, to hear them say that they are, in fact, I think it's fair to say, afraid to give evidence, because these people have already been subjected to violence, neglect and abuse and retribution. We also heard about that during the Senate inquiry, about the retribution that occurs if they dare to speak out, the threatening behaviour, particularly if they are still in the institutions that are still providing some level of care. Senator Steelejohn would not be wasting, because if he thought this wasn't important, he wouldn't bring this bill to the chamber. He would not be asking us to be debating this bill if he had not heard the first-hand accounts from disabled people saying this sort of protection is necessary. Why would we waste the Senate's time on doing something like this? This is of such grave importance, such grave importance that we have brought it to this place as a private senator's bill, because this is so important. If we are going to address violence and abuse and neglect, of disabled persons in this country, this bill is considered necessary by those very people that this Royal Commission is being held into. I commend the bill to the House. Nick, stand up and put a question. Sorry. It's, uh, I understand I don't require a motion to conclude the debate. Are you, are you going to speak? Uh, no, I was just simply going to ask that the question be. No, it's not, that's fine. I, I, as I understand it, with the concurrence of the Senate, I'll just put the question. 
that the bill be read a second. So I put the question to the Senate that the bill be read a second time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone to tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, no, oh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to royal commissions and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated, so unless any senator desires a committee stage, I'll call for the senator to move the third reading. Senator Steelejohn. I move that this bill be read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to royal commissions and for related purposes. It being 11.50, past 11.50, pursuant to the order agreed earlier today, the Senate shall suspend until the ringing of the bells to allow senators to attend the Prime Minister's statement to mark the anniversary of the national apology to the stolen generation. Right. I believe, Senator Waters, you're seeking the call. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to political donations received from Crown as circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted, Senator Waters. Uh, Deputy President, pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion for the consideration of a matter namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to political donations received from Crown may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Now, as people will see um, from the uh, motion circulated in the chamber, the report uh, handed down last Friday, the Bergen report, contained extremely disturbing uh, inferences about Crown uh, pertaining to criminal conduct and money laundering. Now, it's escaped nobody's notice that Crown has donated almost $2 million to both sides of politics um, in the last 20 years. And indeed, in recent years, amounts have been uh, received uh, in quite large form by both sides of politics. Now, I understand that as a result of that, um, the Federal Labor Party are considering not accepting donations from Crown in the future. We today and my counterpart in the House will also be moving a similar motion asking both of the big parties to give that money back. 
Rather than giving it to Crown, why don't you give it to some gambling support services to help people um, who are addicted? So this is a very clear call, and we'll be moving. Uh, and hence the, the suspension of uh, standing orders today. This is an urgent matter. Our democracy has been for sale for a very long time, and this is just the latest example. And it is a most egregious example because criminal conduct is being alleged, money laundering is being alleged, and yet. Both the big parties are still happy to take money from Crown. Now, I welcome the fact that that decision is under review by the opposition, uh, but it's not good enough just to say we won't take any more. We would like both of the big parties to reflect on the money that they have received in the last 20 years and to give that money back. Better to give it to support services for people who are addicted to gambling. Now, I want to take the opportunity to um, share the views of Geoffrey Watson, SC. Who's a director of the Centre for Public Integrity, and he and he makes a very salient point, and, and I'd like to quote him: "The fact that they're donating most heavily in jurisdictions where they have casinos tells you that it's related to some sort of benefit the company receives in respect of its operations." And he goes on to say, "Crown has been a massive donor, uh, has been a donor in massive sums for years. It obviously opens doors and get you, gets you access which you otherwise would not get." Now that's the point here. Crown are not donating out of the goodness of their heart. None of the big donors are donating out of the goodness of their heart. These big corporates, these big vested interests, these big industries are seeking policy advantage. And when it comes to the gambling industry, they have received it because we still don't have decent regulation of gambling policy. Uh, federally and certainly at the state levels as well. And, uh, I know my colleague from Western Australia is very interested to see how the procedures failed in Western Australia, uh, given that it too was implicated in the Bergen report. So this is a desperate plea for us to clean up democracy, um, return that money that you've received from Crown. Um, we think that donations should be capped no matter where they're coming from, but this example is even more egregious than your standard pay for access, pay for policy outcomes. It's now been elevated to the level of criminality, to the level of money laundering, and it is just untenable for big political parties to continue to receive donations from a company that is now so mired in, con in controversy um, that it can no longer be a political donor. Give back the money better. Give it to support services for people that need help with an addiction to gambling. Unfortunately, we know that that is a scourge that grips so many Australians. Um, in fact, in many ways, it's um, caused by the very practices of those industries and particular um, algorithm designs um, and uh, particular design to encourage and deepen that addiction. We'd love to see action on that, and it's no wonder that we haven't. It's no wonder that we don't have a limit on pokies. It's no wonder that the dollar limits on pokies went absolutely nowhere, because the um, Hotels Association and Crown in particular have been paying for a very long time, and they have happily received the benefit of, um, uh, of an absence of policy to regulate their activities. The big parties have got a chance here to start to restore some confidence in democracy. Earlier today, we had a discussion about lowering the disclosure threshold. It's not good enough. We need more. We desperately need to cap donations. We need you to return that money uh, from Crown and give it to support services for people with a gambling addiction. Members of the Australian population deserve to have confidence that their democracy works for them. They are sick to death of democracy being for sale. It's not just the gambling industry. Sadly, the list of people who buy influence is very, very long. And only once a year do we get those statistics. Well, we have those statistics now, $2 million. Give it to gambling support services to help people who are struggling with gambling addiction. Do the right thing. That is exactly why we are moving this motion today. And my colleague, Adam Bant, will be moving it in the House as well. Thank you, Senator Waters. I, just before I go to you, Minister, I do remind uh, Senator Waters and perhaps in advance other speakers that the question being debated is the question to suspend standing orders, and that is what your contributions uh, should be around. And I, I did uh, give you leeway, but I'm reminding people that is the question before the Senate. Minister. I move that the question be put. So the question is that the motion is moved uh, by the... Yes, beg your pardon. So the question is that the uh, motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Oh, Beg your pardon. So the question is that the motion that we be put as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. 
division required. Ring the bells of four minutes. Order, I'll lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters uh, uh, by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I think I'll start again. So the question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davy as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawett as teller for the noes. <laughs>
Order, there being 36 ayes and nine noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now propose to put the motion to suspend as moved by Senator Waters. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. Um, ring the bells for one minute. Whips? Yes? Thank you. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Seward as teller for the noes. Order, there being 10 ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Oops. Uh, I call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number, two, uh, number one, aged care legislation amendment, serious incident response scheme and other measures bill 2020 in committee of the whole. 
The committee is considering the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Serious Incident Response Scheme and Other Measures Bill of 2020, and the question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So the question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Serious Incident Response Scheme and Other Measures Bill 2020 and has agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Move the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. So the question is that motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day Number Two: National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Technical Amendments Bill 2020. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Just excuse me as I find my uh, speech. I was not at. Uh, this chair. So this afternoon, and we are indeed in the afternoon, we are here to debate the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendments. And the bill is named Technical Amendments Bill of 2020. But I want to, in referring to this bill, because you know, whilst what the government has put forward is some technical amendments, we should not uh, step away uh, in any way from the weight of the issues that victims of childhood sexual abuse within institutions have experienced and the profound nature and the profound importance of a scheme to provide redress to those victims and its effective operation. The effective operation of this scheme has been left wanting to a considerable degree. And sadly, the government's technical amendments to this scheme do not add a great deal of weight to the problems in the functioning of the redress scheme and the ability of the scheme to support uh, victims. So in rising to give this uh, second reading speech, I firstly move a second reading amendment be circulated uh, in my name, and that is at the end of the motion, add, but in the Senate, that we note the deficiencies in the bill as drafted, and that we urge the government to respond to calls from survivors to improve the National Redress Scheme and to deliver quicker, fairer and better outcomes for the recipients, as recommended by the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse. And I move that uh, amendment now as part of my second reading speech. Survivors of institutional child sexual abuse have in our nation already waited too long for redress. It's been two years since the national apology to survivors, but we also know uh, that the Royal Commission was launched uh, nearly a decade ago and that that Royal Commission did substantial work uh, towards the arrangements 
for the redress scheme. Uh, and in my participation in this place, uh, since uh, in looking at this legislation, uh, both before I left in 2014 uh, and when I resumed uh, service here in the Senate back in 2016, uh, this issue has long, long been before the Senate. In the decade uh, since the Royal Commission was first announced, when in 2012, when the Royal Commission uh, was launched and Julia Gillard, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Gillard, said to victims of this abuse, she said, we hear you, we believe you. But the government, and indeed this parliament, also made a commitment that our words would be backed with action, backed with a willingness to commit ourselves to action to deliver redress to victims of this abuse. Survivors have waited too long and have already been through so much. We made a commitment to deliver redress that was timely, redress that does not re-traumatise, redress that does not leave survivors missing out. And so we have seen in the 31 months since the commencement of this scheme a mere fraction of the projected numbers of survivors have received redress. And indeed, a mere fraction have, been, uh, have actually applied for redress also. So we can see that too many are waiting, many are ill, many are aged, some are dying, and some have missed out altogether because the institutions that uh, they were subjected to abuse within are not yet part of the scheme or have been unable to join the scheme for legal reasons that we will debate uh, later or ha indeed have simply been unwilling to. In my own home state of Western Australia, one such example uh, is Fairbridge. Child migrants who were sent to Australia from the UK and Malta when they were small children. Children who were told they were orphans. Many of them were not orphans. Children who were used and abused at this institution and who have no redress as yet within this scheme. These people who were children at the time they suffered this abuse were children hurt by the British programs of child migration. These were programs that stretched across a number of countries in which children were sent away to unsafe and indeed unprotective and uncaring places around the globe. And there are other examples of victims who are unable to access redress because of the refusal of the Jehovah Witness Church to join the national redress scheme. And I call on those within the Jehovah Witness Church to acknowledge that it would be right and just for them to join this scheme. I know the church has a strong doctrine where it seeks to put itself outside the law and simply operate according to the principles of its own faith. But I ask them, please, as an institution, as a Christian institution, 
please step up and do the right thing. There are hundreds and thousands of followers of the Jehovah Witness Church. We see their Kingdom Hall and their assets right around the country. And I would call on you to make sure that justice is done to the victims of sexual abuse within your institutions to make sure that those victims can get justice. It is time for us to get redress delivering on its promise for survivors. This is why Labor will be moving a series of amendments to address the long-standing structural and emerging issues within the National Address Redress Scheme. And it's a, been a privilege for me to serve as a committee member, uh, and I've only been serving in that role for a short time, uh, where, as a member of the Joint Standing Committee into uh, the re arrangements for redress, because indeed it takes brave victims to continue to tell their stories not only about the abuse that they suffered but also about how their experiences now intersect with the institutional and justice arrangements of the redress scheme. And it is not easy for them. Uh, as the example of uh, victims within the Jehovah's Witness Church uh, and those from Fairbridge uh, and others have shown. It is a scheme that has been rolled out by the government and unfortunately it has not fully realised the recommendations of the Royal Commission. It has failed, frankly, to deliver of the prom on the promise of redress that it promised victims. So Labor's amendments today seek to better reflect the experience of survivors and indeed the spirit of the original recommendations that came out of the Royal Commission. And I have to note that some of these issues have been raised by Labor from the outset in our original critique of the bill when it was first passed, that many of these issues were indeed foreseen and remained unaddressed at that time. But of course, Labor did not want to get in the way. We supported the passing of the bill because we wanted to see the system get up and running so that it could serve victims' needs. But now, again, we have an opportunity to raise these issues, and we hope and we call on the government to support this and respond accordingly. These are essentially today the same amendments that we moved to this legislation in the House. They are modest amendments that give the government flexibility to negotiate with the states and territories and the latitude to fix the issues with the scheme in the most effective and efficient way. And it also gives ability to take into account relevant findings from the review of the scheme. In most of these cases, it's simply a case of the government getting up and showing leadership, showing leadership and conviction that backs the needs of victims who deserve a functioning redress scheme an accountable redress scheme. We call on the government to clearly say to survivors and to the public and indeed to this parliament what they we call on them to say what will you do to fix the substantial issues with the scheme or at least explain why you won't do it. This shouldn't be put into the too hard basket and as I'll outline now the changes that we put forward don't jeopardise any aspect of the scheme. The opposition wants to say to the government, we want to work with you constructively to get the scheme actually delivering for 
survivors. So, in terms of the purpose of the bill, as the government's outlined its technical amendments, um, it's important that the opposition acknowledge our, our position on those. We acknowledge that it puts forward administrative amendments. Uh, and I won't go through those because I have insufficient time. But the Royal Commission said that an estimated 60,000 survivors would be eligible for redress. But as at January uh, 2021, there's 9,232 applications, just, over five, uh, just under 5,500 decisions, 4,660 applications, uh, and 4,620 payments. This is just a fraction of uh, those victims that should uh, have access to the scheme, and many of the reasons that there aren't more applications in come down to the onerous nature of making an application. It would take over 30 years for the estimated 60,000 victims to get redress if the current uh, pace of uh, making findings and giving out money uh, is maintained. And these delays are a form of further trauma. I look forward to being Senator able to uh, discuss Lord our Brown amendments further. Sorry. In the Senator Pratt, Senator Seward. And, no, sorry. Sorry, Senator Seward. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Technical Amendments Bill 2020. This bill makes a series of important technical amendments to the operation of the National Redress Scheme. The Greens are broadly supportive of this bill. However, we do have concerns about the operation of these amendments, which we will monitor and to which I'll make some comment uh, now. First off, we have uh, the issues around associate institutions. This bill changes the way associate institutions in a group are determined, listed and described for notices and offers of redress. Under these changes, survivors will, be, will no longer be provided with a full list of associates of participating institutions when they accept or reject an offer of redress. During this, the inquiry, stakeholders raised concerns that these changes could have unintended consequences for survivors. The National Community Legal Service No More highlighted in, in, it is important that survivors understand which institutions they will be releasing from civil liability if they accept an offer of redress. Stakeholders suggest alternative ways the full list of associated institutions could be provided to survivors. For example, the scheme operator could allow survivors to request this information in writing. Associates of participating institutions could be identified on the redress scheme's website, or a full list could be provided to survivors earlier in the application process. We will be monitoring the implementation of these changes closely to ensure that survivors continue to be provided with information about associates of participating institutions and are able to make informed decisions about redress offers. I would note here that if this isn't working, there will inevitably be more amendments to this bill once the independent assessor's report is uh, provided to the government and the necessary amendments, which we all know will need to be made, are uh, de debated, we'll put the government on notice that this particular amendment is not working, we'll be seeking amendments to it again. Under the current redress scheme, government institutions can become funders of last resort, for example, where non-government institutions no longer exist. The current redress act, ass act assumes that only one government institution will be involved as a funder of last resort. This bill makes changes to clarify that one or more participating government institutions can become funders of last resort. Some stakeholders expressed concerns that this change could lead to further delays for survivors seeking redress. The Australian Greens strongly echo these concerns and urge the scheme operator to ensure these changes do not result in further delays for survivors. I will have uh, more to say on this issue shortly. Engaging independent decision-makers is another area that this bill touches on. 
or amends. At the moment, the appointment of each independent decision maker must be approved by the Minister for Families and Social Services in consultation with state and territory ministers. This bill instead allows the scheme operator to appoint decision makers in consultation with states and territories. It is expected that this change may reduce delays experienced by survivors to receive a decision on their application. Legal firm Ryan, Carlisle and Thomas noted that devolving responsibility to the scheme operator would not provide su sufficient scrutiny for the appointment of decision makers. Again, we will be monitoring the implica implications and implementation of this new appointment process very closely. The commencement of the National Redress Scheme in 2018 represented a milestone for survivors of institutional child sexual abuse. However, this legislation was flawed from the beginning. Make no mistake. We sought to amend it, the Greens sought to amend it at the time. Uh, if people recall, this was coming up to the deadline of when this, this legislation would be, come into effect. And if, unfortunately, if we delayed the act any longer, that would delay redress for survivors. So it was a catch-22 situation where we knew the legislation was flawed, but we didn't want to disappoint survivors. We are now dealing with the consequences. Uh, the proposed amendments that were in fact debated in this very chamber would have meant that some of the issues we are dealing with right now would not have had to have been dealt with. And it certainly would mean that some of the issues that we'll have to deal with once a new bill comes up in response to the independent assessor's uh, review of the implementation of the bill, the two-yearly review, after that will certainly um, need changes, and some of those changes will in fact address the issues that were raised in 2018. We all know that the redress scheme is not as good as it could be. There are many issues that need to be urgently fixed. As a member of the Joint Select Committee on the Implementation of the National Register Scheme, I've been made aware um, yet again of many of these issues. The committee's first interim uh, report found that the National Redress Scheme application process can re-traumatise survivors. Preparing an application is often a stressful and traumatic experience for survivors. It can take months for survivors to finalise the application, particularly as, uh, because of the re-traumatising re of people when they're actually, and the triggering when they're actually filling out the form. The lack of published guidelines for decision-making um, limits the ability of survivors and the advocates to understand what should be included in their application. Survivors continue to experience long wait times, although I do acknowledge that the department is working to try and get this under control and it has improved for certain applications. It's just not good enough that survivors can have their civil claims resolved, in fact, faster than it can take to get uh, an, a redress application um, done and completed. We need to make urgent reforms to the application process to ensure that it does not further harm and traumatise survivors. I continue to hold serious concerns about the government's cap on the redress payments of $150,000. The Royal Commission actually recommended, as we all know in this place, a $200,000 cap on redress payments, which the government rejected. This lower cap may be, may be a reason for survivors to pursue civil actions instead of going through the redress scheme. Lawyers have suggested that civil actions result um, to, uh, in awards of hundreds of thousands of dollars compared to the average redress payment of around $80,000. The practice of indexing payments is, un um, of, is unfair and needs to be reformed. Over 449 payments have been adjusted due to their prior payments, with the average value of the adjustment being $34,574. Some survivors have also had their redress payments reduced to zero because of indexation. The practice of, of indexation of prior payments needs to be removed urge immediately. There is also significant gaps in survivors getting access to counselling and psychological care services and supports. This includes gaps around access in rural areas, access to culturally safe and sensitive healing programs and specialist financial counselling. 
The government has, pla has placed time and monetary caps on access to counselling and psychological services, which goes against the Royal Commission's recommendations. All survivors and their families should be able to engage with high-quality, specialised counselling and psych psychological care services um, in order to address uh, their trauma and also to limit re-traumatisation, as I've just articulate, articulated, as occurring through the process. The funder of last resort provisions continues to let survivors down as they are too restrictive as was articulated in this place during the debate on the primary legislation. These issues were, were addressed during that discussion and we sought to amend it, but unfortunately those amendments weren't supported. These provisions need to be amended. And I'm sure when we see the uh, independent assessor's report that, and review report, we will need to come back and re, uh, readdress this issue of funder of last resort. Under the current scheme, the government can become a funder of last resort for institutions that no longer exist, known as defunct institutions. But these provisions only apply where the government has supposedly equal responsibility for the abuse that occurred in the now defunct institutions. The government should be a funder of last resort regardless of whether they are involved in the institution or in the, in the responsibility for the child. Um, that had uh, now the adult, but the child when they were abused. Survivors shouldn't miss out on payments because of these narrow provisions. As of October 2020, there were 88 applications for redress that named a funder of a last resort institutions, but only 29 of these applications have been determined, and of these, 20 payments, um, only 20 payments have been made. It's clear that the funder of last resort resort provisions are preventing significant numbers of survivors from accessing redress. The government needs to consider how we can expand the funder of last resort provisions to ensure that all survivors have, have equal access to redress and don't, don't experience unfair waiting times. It is distressing that some uh, institutions, including those named in the Royal Commission, have not yet joined the National Redress Scheme, even though they have been named. While these institutions have been publicly named and shamed, they continue to drag their feet. We need to consider the impact this is having on survivors who feel the distress and feel like they have nowhere to go. I appreciate that the minister is taking these issues seriously and we are making process on compelling institutions to join the scheme. But as was just articulated, the Jehovah's Witnesses still have not joined. It is outrageous that they do not accept the responsibility for the children that were abused in their care. We need to think about ways that we can work together to take all possible actions to ensure the institutions are held to account. It is imperative that the government takes every possible action against these institutions which fail to uphold their moral, social and ethical responsibilities by declining or unnecessarily delaying their participation in the scheme. The second anniversary review of the National Redress Scheme is, hopefully, just about complete. I am confident that this independent review will make clear recommendations on how we can improve the Redress Scheme. That's, I'm confident of that because I'm sure that the survivors in particular who have been giving um, their comments and evidence to the uh, review will be voicing their very strong concerns about the failings of the redress scheme. And if they are listened to, there will need to be recommendations made about amendments. It's especially important that the review looks into publishing the assessment uh, framework policy guidelines, streamlining applicant and decision-making processes and creating a direct complaint avenue for survivors. The Australian Greens will continue to closely monitor the outcomes of this review and push for change so that Redress Scheme supports all survivors and holds all institutions to account. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also rise this afternoon to make some comments in regards to the National Redress Scheme for Institutionalised Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Bill. And of course, this bill deals with some technical amendments. I think it's important to say at the very, very, very beginning, and Senator Seawitt did mention this briefly, but I think it's beholden on every senator 
to acknowledge the work and the progress that is already happening in the National Redress Scheme. And I've heard comments made about the Royal Commission report and recommendations, and I'll reflect on two observations about the Royal Commission outcomes that haven't actually been, have not actually been reflected in the experience of the scheme. But I just want to reiterate that at the 31st of December 2020, just three months ago, 450 institutions covering over 60,600 sites had in fact signed up. 9,117 applications had been received by the scheme. 4,350 payments had been made to survivors, totalling $377 million, and a further 540 offers were awaiting a decision by the applicant themselves. So let's just put that in context. In the first year of the scheme, 47 institutions had joined. In the second year of the scheme, it had grown by 176, and in the third year of the scheme, it had grown by another 223 institutions. I'm someone who believes publicly and privately that the National Redress Scheme is working, is growing, is making the necessary progress that many of us had hoped it would make. Is there an opportunity for continued improvement? Yes, there most definitely is. I'm someone who believes that the scheme will always be, and should always be, in a state of constant recalibration. If it is to be responsive to the needs and the interests and the concerns of survivors, as shared with government and parliamentarians via survivors themselves and survivor groups, then it must be, and we must recognise, that it will be in a constant state of recalibration and improvement. There were two observations made by the Royal Commission that I do think need to be reflected upon. One is that the Royal Commission, and it's not an error or a fault of the Royal Commission, I mean, it couldn't see the future, but I think it is fair to say that the Royal Commission overestimated the number of applications that the National Redress Scheme may get, overestimated the number of uh, applications the scheme may receive. What the Royal Commission didn't foresee was the complexity of those applications. And I see Senator Seward, if I may, sort of nodding in agreement with my observation. And I think this is a very, very important point to be mentioned up front. Because when we came to design the scheme, it was designed with a variety of assumptions, and this is a reflection on the good work that the Royal Commission and senators in this place and other parliamentarians had contributed to, but we've got to recognise that those early observations may not have been the experience of the scheme thus far. And on those two points, I think that's very, very true. The number of applications received has not been the number as great as the Royal Commission would have expected, but the complexity of those applications um, have, has been greater. And that was not foreseen by the Royal Commission. And this is a particularly important point. When people come into the chamber and say, well, the Royal Commission was expecting X, but therefore the scheme has only delivered Y, and therefore the scheme is unsuccessful. Not true. Not true. The second point I would make is that as the scheme develops and matures, different sorts of survivor groups and their needs come to the fore more sharply. And I'll reflect on this um, a little bit later in my contribution. There are two particular groups, sorry, there are two particular groups that I think require much greater uh, and urgent uh, attention, uh, and I'll come to those in, uh, in, a, in a brief moment. Labor is moving a variety of amendments. These amendments, as Senator Pratt alluded to, were moved in the House of Representatives. Let me be very clear about this. These are amendments that ignore a critical feature of the scheme, and that is that it is actually not a Commonwealth scheme. It is, in fact, a Commonwealth in cooperation with states and territory scheme. So whatever our views might be in this parliament about what changes and improvements should be made to the scheme, they have to be agreed to by the relevant ministers in states and territories. 
I think that is a good design feature, but it does present some challenges where particular jurisdictions might have a view that other jurisdictions don't hold on to. The other point I would make in regards to Labor's amendments, if I've understood them correctly, is they actually don't make any real changes, and many of these matters are already under active review by the independent reviewer, Robin Crook, and as Senator Seawitt alluded to, uh, the committee of which I chair, the Joint, Sen the Joint Parliamentary Committee on the Implementation of the National Redress Scheme. We are hoping to see that report ourselves very, very soon to make our own judgments about how effective the independent review process has been uh, on you know, collecting and, and identifying further improvements and recalibrations to the scheme. Mr Acting Deputy President, much of the credit, I believe, for getting so many institutions to join the scheme must go to the very, very clear commitment of the Morrison government and its forthrightness in following through on its justified threat to name and shame institutions and to strip them of their tax and charitable benefits. But now is the time to refocus our efforts on two specific survivor groups whose access to justice, in my view, has been blocked. Both of these groups, of course, have a strong West Australian character. Redress, in my view, and I think I will probably speak for many on the parliamentary committee, but redress must now be urgently delivered to those Fairbridge kids who are among the 3,580 British child migrants sent to the Kingsley, Farm, Kingsley Fairbridge Farm School near Pinjarra between 1913 and 1982. The original Fairbridge Society cause ceased operating in the early 1980s when it was rolled into the Prince's Trust. That organisation has established Fairbridge Restored Limited to act as the legal entity responsible for meeting the liabilities of Fairbridge Farm Schools. While Fairbridge Restored was publicly named for its failure to join the scheme last year, we now understand that its reluctance is due to legal barriers in the United Kingdom rather than a lack of willingness or good faith on their part. That is evidence that has been made available to the parliamentary committee. And again, I see Senator Seward nodding. But it's clear to me and to others in this Senate chamber that the unique and unforeseen circumstances surrounding Fairbridge kids warrant special attention. It is reassuring to know that this is a view that is also shared by the National Redress Scheme, with the Secretary of the Department of Social Services having described the matter at a public hearing as having a sense of urgency and noting that they are very committed to resolving this issue as quickly as we can, the secretary said. The second priority in 2021 must be to improve the level of awareness and access to the scheme for Indigenous survivors. We know that factors including poor understanding of the scheme in regional and remote areas, access to records and historical documentation, and even a reluctance to ask questions out of fear of being judged are preventing greater Indigenous participation and therefore access to justice. There can also be cultural unwillingness to detail accounts of historic childhood sexual abuse, which is stopping many older Indigenous survivors from even starting an application. Late last year, the committee heard from the CEO of the Kimberley Stolen Generation Aboriginal Corporation, who detailed for it key areas where the scheme could improve to better address the needs of Indigenous Australians, including increased access to culturally appropriate, um, culturally appropriate support in remote communities. Uh, in evidence to a parliamentary committee, the Kimberley Stolen Generation noted that Aboriginal people don't see counselling the same way as non-Indigenous people do. That's not what works for them, and it's not culturally appropriate for them either. Of the 3,123 applications for redress received between July 2019 and June 2020, 1,052 were from Indigenous survivors, representing 34 per cent of all applications for that period. When I was in the Kimberley region just a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to meet with the Kimberley Stolen Generation, and they reiterated to me their very, very strong view that, better, that more can be done to provide better access and therefore justice for Indigenous uh, Australians, but that there was a plan and that they had some excellent ideas about how that could be. Because people live in remote areas of our country, they should not be denied access to the scheme. 
they should not be denied access to the scheme. When I was reviewing the contributions of members of the House of Representatives over the weekend in preparation for some remarks today, I think you could come to the wrong conclusion. And that wrong conclusion is that nothing is happening in regards to national redress. Nothing could be further from the truth. A lot is happening. The timeliness has improved. Indeed, the investment by the Australian government of an additional $104 million over the next four years is timely, is necessary. But we should not allow ourselves to fall asleep at this particular wheel. More must be done. More can be done. I would hasten to add that my sense, my considered sense, is that across the parliament, in the Department of Social Services, who are responsible for the National Redress Scheme, in the community, there is a great willingness. There's a great sense of urgency to make sure that justice can be delivered in the most timely and effective way for survivors and for their families. I will leave those brief remarks there, Mr Acting Deputy President, just to say finally, very finally, might I extend um, the appreciation of the Joint Parliamentary Committee, but also all those other people that have come in contact with the National Redress Scheme have had a good experience and just extend our appreciation to officers in the Department of Social Services and the National Redress Scheme for the important work that they do on this very, very important matter. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and um, thank you also to uh, you, uh, Senator Dean Smith, for your ongoing and strong advocacy on behalf of survivors. Um, in my first speech in this parliament and several times since then, I have uh, indicated that my father was sent out um, to Australia. Uh, he was um, in a home for immigrant children in Birmingham in the United Kingdom, and uh, he ended up at Fairbridge, as, as Senator Smith knows. Um, he came out at the age of 12. Uh, he wasn't um, one of the children who didn't know who his family was. Indeed, he came from a very large family, and his mother had um, taken up with a, with a new man who didn't want the existing children that were in the family. And so my father and his brother, Uncle Arthur, my Uncle Arthur, were put into the Birmingham Children's Home. And, um, uh, despite the fact that they grew up in Coventry. Now, my father's passed away now, but thankfully, because of the British government's actions in saying sorry, he was able to go back to the UK uh, and meet with his family. And they, of course, um, always knew that he was missing. Uh, he met, for the first time ever, a sister who hadn't been born when he left, but she knew all about her brother Bill. And, and her brother Arthur, who had been sent out to Fairbridge. And there's no doubt uh, that my father's life at Fairbridge was very harsh. There's no doubt about that. And Uncle Arthur's um, life at Fairbridge was harsh as well, um, despite other reports around the abuse that did occur at um, Fairbridge. Um, my father was spared that, but he knew other uh, children from Fairbridge who gave evidence um, to the Royal Commission of the abuse that they had suffered. Um, so I've got a personal stake in this matter, I guess, and it, it is rather ironic today that um, we've just had the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition give um, their comments around Sorry Day, and we heard from the Minister, Ken White, and our shadow uh, Ms Linda Burney, and um, the flavour of all of those speeches was that we are sorry for what happened to the stolen generations in this country. Um, horrific, horrific times, uh, and yet comments were also made that it had taken too long. And I think for survivors of um, abuse, sexual abuse, despite the best intentions, um, I mean, often on these matters we are poles apart, but on this matter we are not. But it's still taking too long. And um, sadly, uh, as the time goes by, survivors uh, start to pass away. 
and that's the case in my father's case and, and, and Uncle Arthur's case. Uncle Arthur sadly never <clears throat> got the chance to go back and meet um, with uh, his UK family, who clearly loved both Uncle Arthur and my family. And uh, to see the resemblance, to see where my dad grew up, um, to see the schools he went to, the pub that my uh, grandparents drank at, all of those sorts of things which are part of everyday life, uh, which were denied to him, um, were really important. And I'm, I'm you know, still sad that Uncle Arthur never got that chance. So the Royal Commission estimated that some 60,000 survivors would be eligible for redress. And certainly we don't want to see um, survivors waiting any, any longer than necessary. And other contributors have gone through that, um, the Royal, that we have received less than that. But of course, there's a great shame about being sexually abused. And not every person who has been abused is ever going to come forward. Um, that's a shame of it. So we need to be making a scheme that makes it easy for people, not, not harder. And we need to create, of course, a framework that's robust and that's transparent and where monies are accountable, but a, ro but a scheme that's not onerous for people to come forward and, and put their hand up and claim the redress that they are so justly and fairly entitled to. Um, but the scheme has received nearly 10,000 applications. It's made uh, about 5,500 decisions. It's finalised uh, 4,600 odd applications, and the, the monies to date are around uh, just under $4 million. Um, but we know there's 512 applications on hold. Uh, waiting on institutions to join the scheme. And this is unacceptable, and we've heard from contributors to um, this debate this morning that it is unacceptable. There's no doubt that uh, the laws and our society and our culture at the time um, enabled this sexual abuse to happen, and we do need to um, not allow institutions to remain outside of the scheme, uh, if they're a named institution and they've been, um, you know, the sexual abuse has occurred, they must be part of the redress. And certainly one of the amendments that uh, Labor is seeking, will seek to move later today, is that um, a requirement that the minister does name and shame these institutions who refuse to join the scheme. And I know that the minister has been very strong on naming and shaming, but we do want it to be a requirement because, as time goes on, ministers change and so on and so forth. So we want it to be a requirement. Uh, it is shameful that we've had to get to the point where we've had to threaten institutions who clearly have not done the right thing, that they'll be named and shamed and that their tax uh, allowances and so on will be under question. It is shameful that we've had to really go in hard like that. But nevertheless, uh, let's put the victims before um, the institutions and be very clear that we, we want to see that um, it is a requirement. Because really, we don't want survivors who've suffered enough um, to be waiting any longer than than absolutely necessary uh, bef before they get what they are so justly entitled to. And there's no doubt that um, there's the action of the abuse itself, and then, of course, there's that ongoing impact where you'll still see people in their 60s and 70s breaking down and feeling ashamed about what happened to them uh, when they were young children. So that's uh, an amendment that Labor's keen to um, pursue. And, not any, these aren't new amendments that suddenly have arisen today. They have been the view of Labor for a very long time. We also want to see the cap increase. This has been uh, right from when we heard the evidence. Um, this has been our view that the cap ought to be increased um, from the current amount of 150 up to 200,000. Um, because what we believe is happening is that survivors are being pushed into civil processes. And that undermines the scheme in and of itself. If the scheme 
is seen by some to be inadequate um, because the cap's too low. We don't. You want to have the um, the redress to civil processes there, but being the exception um, in in rare circumstances. We don't want it to be used increasingly because people are not satisfied um, that. Uh, receiving the full cap amount currently of 150 is ad in inadequate. We think it ought be um, up to 200,000, and, and this is an opportunity with Labor's amendment for the government to actually do the right thing. Um, <clears throat> we do uh, we do have an, uh, an amendment that looks at um, the indexation of prior payments. Um, and um, it is heartbreaking to hear the stories of people who get barely any re redress uh, once a tiny payment from years ago is indexed. And it's fair to say state governments um, and institutions themselves have had a number of goes at this, of trying to get it right. Um, and um, now we're at the point where we've got amendments that we say will make it right, and we really do want to see them. Um, taken up. Uh, the, the issue of funders of last resort has certainly been around for a while, um, and there are some institutions. Um, Fairbridge does not uh, neatly fit the issue, and Senator Smith went into its various iterations. But um, we do need a state, the governments, whatever form, whether it is the Commonwealth or the the states to be funders of last resort because we can't have um, survivors left high and dry because their institution um, no longer operates through no fault of their own um, when clearly um, redress is needed. Um, we do believe that that um, should be something that happens as a matter of course. And our amendment will, if it gets up, will seek to ensure that governments act as funders of last resort when people would have um, otherwise missed out. And I don't think it's the intention of the government or anyone in this place um, that people miss out. That's not, not the intention behind this amendment. It's just us saying we really do need it to be shored up. Um, we also want, and, and again this is not new, the government to consider um, establishment and advance payment scheme. As I said earlier, and I, no doubt other senators have said, we have people ageing out. and We see that all the time um, with uh, claims that go back um, a generation or 20 or 30 years, is that lawyers can play fancy games um, in civil proceedings to time matters out and a person uh, then dies. Um, so we are saying that an advance payment where you would get the bulk of the monies up front, so they are of use to the person who finally gets to um, an, some money and an, a public acknowledgement of the hurt and the suffering that they endured, uh, would get the bulk of those monies up front that they can use in whatever way they see fit. Um, there's a similar scheme currently being used in Scotland and that's been well received by survivors uh, over there. And um, given the decades and years that many survivors have waited for a chance at redress and justice, it's vital that people don't die waiting. And again, as I said, I don't, that's certainly not the government's intention. I don't want anyone to be under the misapprehension that that's what Labor's saying. We just think it is an additional measure that we um, can give a person at advance payment. Um, so that's what we're seeking with that amendment. Um, our amendments, as I said, are, are nothing new. They have been around a good while, um, and uh, we really do want the government to consider them um, in a serious manner and to be able to agree to them. Um, so. The prior, uh, the, that, and that issue of um, the indexation. Um, the assessment matrix also, the redress assessment matrix has also been widely criticised. And again, we start with an idea, if it doesn't 
work properly, then let's look at it and review it and get something that does. Um, we know that many survivors need counselling and psychological care from time to time throughout their lives. Um, but what we do, and certainly we heard this in evidence, uh, the evidence that I heard at one of the Senate inquiries was particularly, and Senator Smith mentioned First Nations people too, um, is to make that counselling available through a survivor's life. Because as you go through the various as a, as a victim, the various stages of grief, of anger, of coming to terms with issues, um, new issues will come up. And all of us who have experienced trauma um, know that there will just be a moment when you're really doing nothing and suddenly it all comes and hits you. And that could be five years after the, after the, the whole affair, or it could be 20 years, or it could be 30 years. There's no doubt if we accept that there's long-term impact and damage, then we've also got to accept that um, counselling ought be available throughout a victim's life. I think it's one of the, the least things that we can do, and we need, do need to establish a benchmark, um, a safety net, if you like, that really does capture um, and protect um, and enhance the rights of survivors in whatever way we can. And um, I want to be part of a parliament that, that does that, that we honour um, and we continue to honour uh, survivors of uh, sexual abuse by institutions. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, can I thank all um, senators who have made a contribution on this bill uh, and also acknowledge the, uh, the very bipartisan or multi-partisan way that um, everybody in this chamber has approached this very, very serious issue um, and the response that, that we as a parliament want to, uh, to provide. Um, this bill uh, in of itself um, seeks to amend the primary legislation for the scheme um, and the bill will, is, is proposed to increase the efficiency of the scheme for its remaining eight years of operation and to make sure that we assist in finalising outstanding applications. Uh, the amendments address minor and technical issues with the current operation of uh, the bill uh, of the Act, and will address unintended consequences or oversights in the initial drafting of the primary legislation underpinning this scheme. Consistent with the survivor focus of the scheme, survivor groups support the passage of this bill, as does the Standing Committee on Community Affairs. All jurisdictions have supported the progression of this bill in accordance with the scheme's governance arrangements and are required to be consulted on and approve all future changes to the Redress Act due to the cooperative basis under which this scheme continues to operate. So, Regardless of the amendments raised um, uh, that are being put forward here, um, I do acknowledge a very, very strong shared desire to continue to improve this scheme. Um, the bill adds to the strong improvements that have already been put in place to the scheme, and the government remains committed to improving the scheme and encouraging all institutions that have been named to join. Um, already, pleasingly, the government has, uh, has been working, uh, and 191 institutions have joined the scheme in its third year of operation. The number has been contributed to through the use of naming and shaming of recalcitrant institutions. The government has already implemented measures to name and shame institutions which fail to sign up to the scheme and financial penalties for those who fail to join the scheme. These two levers coming into force six months after the first meaningful contact with an institution once named. The Morrison government has also commenced the legislative two-year review currently being undertaken by Robin Cruck, AO. The report has a focus on all aspects raised in the Shadow Minister's amendments and incorporates extensive consultation with survivors. This report will be made public. Changes of, the nature, of this nature would also need to be endorsed by the Redress Board comprised of state and territory ministers, meaning the amendments would unlikely be able to be implemented regardless of their passage through this place. As such, the, amendment, the, amendment, the government does not support these amendments, um, and we remain absolutely committed um, to uh, the continuous improvement of this scheme and making sure that survivors continue to inform the decisions around any changes to the scheme. So, What I would be saying in response specifically to the amendments that have been put forward. In relation to the naming and shaming amendment, I mean clearly we have done everything that we said we would do. We named and shamed institutions uh, on the 1st of July last year, uh, and pleasingly, pleasingly on the 1st of January this year, we didn't have to name or shame any other institutions. But if in the future 
we find institutions who have a responsibility and a moral obligation under this scheme to join the scheme, we will name and shame those organisations if they do not do the right thing by survivors. I also said, as I said, um, we have taken um, action, um, real and tangible action, against those organisations by making sure that we have now in the process, um, through a consultation and hopefully um, will be uh, gazetted very soon, that the charitable status of organisations that refuse to join the scheme uh, will be revoked. We have also said as a federal government that we will not allow any institution that has not joined the scheme that should join the scheme to ever be eligible in the future for any government grants. And I'm pleased to say that many of the states and territories are and currently at in the process of making sure that that actually is the case for um, the, the grants that are issued through state and territory um, grant processes. But what I wanted to make sure today that we don't do is, with the two-year review, which currently is underway, we are seeking the advice of survivors to make sure that any response that we make to the two-year review is absolutely informed by survivors themselves. We do not want to preempt that review, despite the genuineness, I think, of the, the amendments that are before us today. Um, and in principle, the government has no issue with the, the sentiment of the amendments that are being put forward by uh, the opposition today. But what we want to make sure is that the two-year review that's currently being undertaken is allowed to take its course. It is due to report at the end of this month. We are only talking about a few weeks. As I said, we will make this report available, publicly available for everybody to see. And then through the process, the appropriate process of the National Redress Board, I will then take this to the Redress Board, which is made up of the ministers in the states and territories, to make sure that the process of the board and its operation as an across governments um, initiative, governments of all states and territories and the federal government coming together to make sure that we deliver the redress that Australian survivors of institutionalised child sex abuse so rightly deserve. The question is the I second can... reading amendment moved by Senator what being 2 pm. We will move the questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. I refer to the deeply distressing story published today in which a former staff member of Minister Reynolds has made public her alleged rape in March 2019 by a then colleague in the Minister's parliamentary office and the subsequent conduct of the Minister and the Government. That conduct included the Minister and her then Chief of Staff meeting with her staff member in the same room the alleged rape occurred. Can the Minister assure the Senate that she and her office have exercised and will exercise an appropriate duty of care, including the provision of support for the victim of an alleged sexual assault in the Minister's office in March 2019. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I can say that, of course, I'm aware of today's reports, and I'm extremely concerned about the well-being of my former staff member. Women should be safe, and they should feel safe in the workplace at all times. My only priority throughout this matter was the welfare of my then staff member and ensuring that she received the support that she needed. That including ensuring that she was clear about the support available to her and her right to make a formal complaint to the Australian Federal Police, should she choose to do so. At all times, my then Chief of Staff and I ensured that we sought advice from and we followed advice from ministerial and parliamentary services regarding the support available. I was at pains to ensure that my staff member felt empowered to determine how she wanted to handle the matter, and that remains the case. At the time of the initial meeting with my staff member, I was not aware of the details or the circumstances of the alleged incident in my office. Had I known, I would have conducted the meeting elsewhere. And given the sensitivities surrounding this issue, it would not be appropriate for me to comment further. Thank you. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister assure the Senate that she personally ensured her staff member was referred to support services and that her staff member was accessing them, and she made clear her personal support for the staff member to report the incident on her terms and that her job would be secure regardless of, of her decision? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And 
I believe I've answered all of those questions uh, in my first answer. And as I've said, order. given oh, the sensitivities, sorry, Reynolds, it would Senator be appropriate. Wall on a point of order. Senator Wall on a point of order. Uh, point of order, direct relevance. The minister has not answered that question in her first answer. I know she seems to want to give one answer and then say I'm not taking this any further. It is a reasonable question to ask whether or not this woman thought, understood that her job would be secure regardless of her decision. The minister was speaking for a very brief period of time, um, and so I've allowed you to highlight that part of the question, Senator Wong. Senator Reynolds, had you concluded your answer? You had. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <coughs> Thank you. Order. Order. Senator Gallagher has the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister assure the Senate that neither she, her staff, nor any of the Prime Minister's staff said or did anything which may have implicitly encouraged her former staff member not to pursue the incident with police? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said in my first answer, my first and only concern was then and remains her welfare, including her right to understand all of her options and for those to be presented to her, which they were. Uh, she did continue after this incident in my employ and then moved to Senator Cash's office uh, for the preceding two years. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister confirm to the Senate that the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is on track? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Bragg, for the question. Uh, Mr President, rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine is one of the most significant public health campaigns we have had to con conduct this century, and uh, this government, Mr President, is on track to deliver that program. In fact, Ms. Minister Hunt has announced this, this, this afternoon that the Pfizer vaccination, vaccinations have just touched down in Sydney, which Mr President, is a significant milestone for this country. The Australian government aims to have as many people vaccinated as soon as possible. Identified priority groups will be the first avail uh, to get the available doses of vaccines, and more and more people Mr. President, will progressively have access to a vaccine as more doses become available. Our world-class vaccination program will commence with identified priority populations, including aged care and disability residents and workers, frontline healthcare workers and quarantine and border workers to receive the vaccine first up, Mr President. They will be part of phase 1A. Order. On its, uh, it is on track to deliver as planned and begin rollout this month, Mr President. Phase 1B will include adults aged 70 years and over, other healthcare workers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, younger adults with an underlying medical condition, including those with a disability and critical high-risk workers, including defence, fire, police and emergency services and the meat processing workers. Mr. President. All these groups have been identified as critical to receive the vaccine as soon as possible. And Mr. President, phase 2A includes adults aged 50 to 69 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people 18 to 54 years, and other critical high-risk workers. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please outline how many vaccines will be rolled out? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Bragg, for this question. Australia is fortunate, Mr. President, to be in the position of having secured enough doses to to cover the Australian population three times over. So far, the Australian government has agreements in place for our community in Australia, which includes 20 million Pfizer doses, 53.8 million Astra AstraZeneca doses and 51 million Novax doses. Mr. President. We also have access up to up to $25.6 million uh, doses through the COVAX facility. 
As I've outlined, the first delivery of Pfizer doses arrived today, and the international AstraZeneca doses supplies to Australia are likely in March, subject to both TGA approval and shipping, of course, Mr. President. Domestic AstraZeneca uh, production via CSL of 50 million doses is likely to be ready for supply to Order, meet our Senator program. Colbeck. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the vaccine rollout plan is supporting vulnerable Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. COVID-19 risks the lives of those most vulnerable in our society, and we have prioritised those most at risk, Mr. President, our senior Australians and our frontline workers. We are protecting those who are most likely to experience serious disease, Mr. President. We are maintaining the functioning of health care and other essential services to preserve health, social and economic security, and extending the vac vaccine, vaccination to the general population as quickly as possible. Each phase of the rollout strategy Mr. President, is structured to align with specific population groups based on their risks, as advised by the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. At every step, Mr. President, our highest priority is to safeguard our most precious of resources, our people. Our number one aim is to prevent death and severe disease and limit the transmission of this insidious Water. virus Senator to the mass, Colbeck, maximum time extent the has expired. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. 2020 saw the largest expansion of casual employment ever in the history of Australia. Between May and November, 62 per cent of all jobs created were casual. Isn't it true the government's so-called comeback is built on the backs of casual workers? The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Farrell for his, uh, his question. Uh, I don't have the uh, specific uh, figures that Senator Farrell has quoted in front of me, but I will take those uh, on uh, uh, face value, as Senator Farrell has, uh, has articulated them. And I would, of course, observe, uh, as I understood his question, they relate to the jobs um, profile in Australia in 2020, which, of course, is characterised by being completely uncharacteristic of any previous year in living memory. That is, a work, jobs and economic environment completely struck by a global pandemic in which Australians and, in fact, the international community found their lives disrupted, their workplaces disrupted uh, and, in fact, f whole economies disrupted. What this government did and continues to do was to seek through a number of initiatives, including uh, additional payments, including ex uh, additional uh, job seeker payments, including job keeper itself, and, and ultimately the development of the job maker plan, was to ensure that as many workers as possible were supported in the workplace, and as many workers as possible who unavoidably lost their jobs due to the pandemic were also supported as best as possible. That was an extraordinary undertaking by this government in 2020, one of the most significant investments of funds in Australia uh, in anyone's living memory or lifetime. So a number of jobs that, to which Senator Farrell has referred obviously returned in a different manifestation than they previously had. That's correct. But what the JobKeeper statistics now show, Mr President, is that the economy is improving. And indeed, that Australians, Australia has gone ahead of many other major advanced nations with a larger proportion of Australians who were in work Order, before this Senator crisis Payne, still in work today. Time has expired. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr President. I do have one. Uh, can the minister confirm that instead of doing something to fix the scourge of insecure work, the Morrison, uh, Mr Morrison's proposed industrial relations ch changes uh, will in fact make that situation worse. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I absolutely disagree with Senator Farrell. 
What the government's reforms will provide is the strongest ever casual conversion rights to employees who want to become permanent and spread those rights to all those employees who don't have conversion rights now, for example, like those in the coal industry. For whatever reason, those opposite don't want this. They apparently think that casuals working should Order. stick with the rights they were given with those opposite Order. over Senator a decade Watt. ago. They see casuals who want permanent Senator work Watt. as, and I quote, collateral damage, unquote, Mr President. What our reforms will do is to introduce stronger penalties for wage underpayment and wage theft to ensure employees' entitlements are secure, as well as a more efficient path to recover underpayments where they do occur. Again, those opposite don't want that. In fact, so committed are they to do nothing Order. about wage theft that the opposition's industrial relations spokesman Order. thought it would be Senator a good Payne. idea to do a press Time conference the outside of 7-Eleven. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Thank you, Mr President. Twenty-three employment law academics have warned Mr Morrison's industrial relations changes will, and I quote, not just fail to address pressing labour market issues such as wage stagnation, insecurity of work and entrenched in inequalities, it will exacerbate them. Are these experts wrong? Senator Payne. Mr President, thank you. I don't have the benefit of uh, the material that Senator Farrell has referred to. And in the absence of that, Senator Farrell, I would continue to uh, refer the senator to the facts that exist within the government's legislation. Our reforms will incentivise permanent work, complete with paid leave entitlements in our vital retail and hospitality sectors, as well as to help give more hours of work for the more than 100,000 part-time employees in those sectors who are going underemployed under the system that those opposite actually set up. And again, they don't seem to want to fix that. They don't seem to see the unemployed, underemployed as important. Our reforms are focused on boosting pay by reinvigorating an enterprise bargaining system that on average pays 69 per cent or $500 and more a week than award wages, but which has seen the total number of agreements more than half, from 25,000 down to 10,000, under the broken system that was put in place by those opposite. Even former Order. Prime Minister Senator Keating Payne, thinks the current the system as put in place expired. by those opposite. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business and my fellow West Australian, Senator Cash. Could the Minister please outline to the Senate how Australia's small businesses are recovering from the economic impacts of COVID-19 and how the Morrison government has assisted to keep their doors open throughout the pandemic? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for his question. And can I also acknowledge uh, Senator Small as someone who is a small business owner himself. He built a small business uh, from scratch uh, in the southwest of Western Australia. He knows what it's like to actually have sleepless nights. Uh, he knows what it's like to employ people. He knows what it's like uh, to actually pay wages. Um, and Mr President, it's people like Senator Small the small business men and women across Australia uh, that the Morrison government continues to deliver for. Why? Because, as we know, they are the backbone of the Australian economy. They are the employers of over six million Australians. Every day, over six million Australians wake up and they are able to go to work, have the dignity of work, because of the small and family businesses in Australia. When you come to look at what they do in local communities, uh, as we know, they are the lifeblood of their local communities. Uh, they sponsor the sporting teams, the community events, and they often offer young Australians their very first job. Mr President, in terms of the economic support that the Morrison government has provided to the lifeblood uh, of the Australian economy throughout COVID-19, we've provided $251 billion in economic support throughout the pandemic. In particular, as we know, JobKeeper has been an essential policy. It's now estimated to have provided $90 billion, $90 billion worth of support, and it is a wage subsidy on a scale that has never been seen in Australia. 
In terms of the cash flow boost, giving businesses back their own hard-earned money, this saw over $35 billion provided to over 800,000 businesses. And in relation to the supporting apprentices wage subsidy, that has kept around 119,500 apprentices on the tools in 62,600 small businesses. They are the backbone of the Australian economy, and the Morrison government backs them every step of the way. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister advise how the government will continue to build a stronger Australia by supporting small and family businesses throughout 2021? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, in 2021, the Morrison government will continue to put more money back into Australians' pockets. We'll protect more of what they've earned because, let's face it, it's their hard-earned money, and of course, support families and businesses. In terms of our legislated tax cuts for small and medium businesses, the full expensing for new investments, something Senator that was welcomed widely by businesses across Australia, and our loss carryback measure. This will all provide it's a suite of policies, and it will all provide that much needed support, that much needed boost for small businesses, who, as we know, many still continue to do it tough. We need to help them to ensure that their business is able to grow so that they can continue to create more jobs for Australians. In terms of our $4 Senator billion dollar boosting apprentice commencements wage subsidy, this is supporting small businesses out there to actually take on a new apprentice into their business. They're the backbone of the Australian economy. Small businesses and the Morrison government will back them every Order. step of the Senator way. Cash. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Minister, how has the government's record of delivering for small and family businesses put in place the conditions to allow our small businesses to recover, invest and employ more Australians as we emerge from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, on this side of the chamber, the Morrison government side of the chamber, we are, have a proud record of supporting small business. And in fact, as Senator Small would know, it's not just about being the business Senator owner and running the business. You work enormously hard. Senator you are the HR department often. You are the bookkeeper often. You're the marketing department. You're often the floor staff. And often you need to get the family to work in the business on the weekends. But every day, small business people across Australia, they get up, they go to work because they are passionate about their business. They're passionate about giving other Australians the opportunity of work. The one thing that I'm always humbled by when it comes to small business is they don't ask for a lot from government. They don't ask for much, but what they do need and what they do want is to be supported to do what they do best. Run Order. their business, run their business, and employ Australians. Mr. President, in terms of our tax cut for small businesses, this was so important. We gave them back money, their hard-earned money, so that they could reinvest back into their business. Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Birmingham. I refer to today's reports of an alleged rape of a young Liberal staffer that happened in this building. The PMO provided support to Minister Reynolds' office in relation to this incident. The government, in a recently issued statement, says, and I quote, that it regrets in any way if Ms Higgins felt unsupported through this process. Uh, end quote. Ms Higgins has said she did feel unsupported. She was interviewed in the room she was raped. She didn't access the employee access program. She felt she was discouraged from reporting the rape to police. She was shunted from office to office, and no one in the government or the minister, uh, minister's office has apologised to her yet. And now the minister seems to have a confused recollection of whether she even understood there was a rape allegation that had been uh, disclosed. What action will you take to ensure that her experience is not repeated? When will the safety of women be put ahead of political interests? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. Uh, safety of everybody in any workplace is of paramount importance, especially the safety of women in the workplace and their ability to feel safe and secure in their working environment. And today's reports are deeply distressing. Throughout the entire process, the government's concern was to support Ms Higgins's welfare in whatever way possible. We understand that this matter has now been put under consideration by the Australian Federal Police. It is an important step, and the government has consistently supported that option from the outset. We will await the outcome of that process. I am advised that at all times guidance was sought from Ms Higgins as to how she wished to proceed, 
and to support and respect her decisions. The important best practice principle, as the Prime Minister's statement that you referenced, or the statement that was tabled in the House of Representatives that you referenced, the important best practice principle of empowering Ms Higgins is something the government has sought to follow. Ms Higgins, I understand, was notified that should she choose to, to pursue a complaint, including a complaint to the police, that was within her rights, that she would be assisted and supported through that process. You indeed did uh, reference uh, Senator Waters and uh, the fact that there are uh, support services available uh, through the Department of Finance uh, for all employees under the uh, Members of Parliament Staff Act uh, to be able to access. Uh, of course, where an assault is alleged to occur, uh, I would encourage anyone to pursue that with the appropriate police and authorities, but also to know whether an assault or instances of bullying, harassment or otherwise, that all employees can access confidential support and counselling through the Employee Assistance Program. Uh, that program is there for their support, and the Department of Finance will treat them with respect Order. and confidentiality Senator as they wish. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks very much, President. This is at least the third public report of Liberal staffers being assaulted at work, telling their boss about it and feeling like nothing was done to support them. Given the frequency with which these issues arise, what policies does the Liberal Party have regarding how to respond to assault allegations appropriately, and have these policies been reviewed, either in response to earlier allegations by a Ms Potter and a Ms Marnie, or in response to the Four Corners report, or Ms Higgins's situation? What have you done? Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, clearly, the support services that are available are available to staff of all members of parliament, regardless of the party affiliation of uh, those uh, employing members or senators. Uh, and that support is available uh, on a comprehensive basis to all, uh, and as I emphasised before, is handled uh, in a confidential manner, uh, where any staff uh, who may feel subject of any type of bullying, harassment uh, or indeed uh, other actions uh, should feel Order. Senator Waters, a point of order. It's a point of order. My question was about Liberal Party policies and whether they've been reviewed. It wasn't about the EAP. Uh, I think the minister is being directly relevant because the question was quite long for a supplementary question, and I think the minister is directly addressing the subject matter raised. You've restated your preferred part of the question. I'll call the minister to continue. Thanks, Mr. President. As I was saying, those processes apply to everybody, and all staff in the building should have confidence that their steps are completed with utmost confidentiality, uh, including, of course, uh, that I, as the minister uh, or any other politician, would not be informed of such engagement unless it was at the wish of the uh, staff member involved. Uh, in relation to individual political parties, uh, the Liberal Party has indeed updated Order. codes Senator in recent Birmingham. times. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. Um, this building is a high-risk workplace. Um, Ms Brittany Higgins said of the sight of the Prime Minister standing next to Young Australian of the Year Grace Tame, herself a survivor of sexual assault, quote, he's standing next to a woman who has campaigned for let her speak, and yet in my mind his government was complicit in silencing me. It was a betrayal. It was a lie. Would you support requesting the Sex Discrimination Commissioner to undertake a culture review of the Parliament House to recommend ways of keeping staff safe? Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. And well, as I said, the, uh, the importance of staff safety is uh, paramount. Uh, it is crucial that we ensure uh, that the processes that are available to staff uh, are thorough. Uh, and certainly, as uh, Minister in this space, I am committed to working with the Department of Finance to ensure that staff can have confidence in those processes and procedures and make use of them. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. And I give the Minister the opportunity to respond to the question she declined to answer earlier as follows. Can the Minister assure the Senate that neither she, her staff, nor any of the Prime Minister's staff said or did anything which may have encouraged, implicitly or explicitly, her former staff member not to pursue the incident with police? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said in my first answer, um, my first and only concern was for the welfare of my staff member. I took, I received, and took all appropriate advice from ministerial and parliamentary services, and all of that information was communicated to my former staff member at the time. Uh, it was actually me who suggested that she might like to consider talking to the Australian Federal Police. And it was actually me who facilitated the first meeting with the Australian Federal Police with an appropriately qualified officer. Um, and the process from there was a matter between uh, my staff member and the AFP, appropriately so. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. In the statement the government has issued today, to which the minister has referred, uh, it is asserted, I quote, Minister Reynolds stated there would be, to Ms Higgins that there would be no impact upon her career. Uh, can the minister advise when and how she did make that statement or those statements and what guarantees were given by the minister to Ms Higgins to assure her there would be no impact on her career? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I have said, uh, all the way uh, through this process, I was at pains to make sure that my staff member understood the support that was available to her, and that my chief of staff and I were there for her, whatever decisions she should make. Uh, she continued in my office uh, until the election, and then she went voluntarily. Uh, took a job, at, I understand, a promotion into Senator Cash's office. So uh, we did everything we could to make sure that she had choice in what she did, and that she was, uh, as she did, she remained in my office, and then uh, went to another office, as I understand it, on a promotion. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. What steps did this minister take? to ensure that Ms Higgins was confident that her career with the Liberal Party would not be negatively impacted by a decision to make a complaint to the police? Senator Reynolds. Well, I think, Mr President, I've answered that a couple of times. My primary responsibility and my only concern was for the welfare of my staff member. Uh, all, all advice was taken and that was communicated on multiple occasions to my staff member and I made it clear that whatever decision she took, it had to be her decision, uh, which is very important. She absolutely had, and uh, there was no indication for me at all um, that her job was at risk. And in fact, as I said, it was my suggestion to her that she consider talking to the Australian Federal Police, and I facilitated that first meeting to ensure that she understood that she had that option available to her. And indeed, uh, since, uh, since that time, uh, she continued to work for me and she's continued to work for Senator Cash in a promotion. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. The government's proposed industrial relations bill in its current construct is overly complex and seriously undermines the better off overall test that protects workers from dodgy wage deals. Australian workers and small businesses have sacrificed so much during state and federal government virus lockdowns and restrictions, while big business have largely flourished. Pausing the boot test for two years would effectively leave the door open to big business cutting wages and conditions and ultimately leave many Australian workers worse off. Minister, is the Morrison government prepared to sink the boot into its changes in order to enable One Nation and other crossbench senators crossbench members to continue genuine discussions on industrial relations reform that won't hurt Australian workers and will protect Australian workers. The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Roberts uh, for his question. And let me begin by responding to uh, the, uh, the last part of his question and absolutely assure him that, of course, the government is prepared to engage in constructive discussions and negotiations with, uh, with you, Senator Roberts, the colleague Senator Hanson, with all members of the chamber uh, on these matters. Of course we are, as we have done in the past on a, a whole range of uh, pieces of legislation and continue to do. 
We do have, uh, it would seem, Senator Roberts, a different view about the uh, implications in relation to the better off overall test in the legislation. And I've noted your view. I think, however, there are outside this chamber a number of, and perhaps uh, inside in some cases, a number of false claims being made about the proposed changes to the better off overall test under the enterprise bargaining framework. For example, there have been suggestions that we are removing the better off overall test. And that is not the case. The bill does not remove the test. In fact, enterprise agreements will continue to leave workers better off than they would be under the relevant award. That's one of the reasons that the bill is making enterprise bargaining easier, so that more agreements are able to be made and more workers are left better off. We see that the changes we're making to the better off overall test will ensure that the Fair Work Commission gives significant weight to the views of the parties, that it considers actual and reasonably foreseeable work arrangements, not hypothetical ones, and considers the overall benefits to workers. Senator O'Neill. What the bill also does is to build on the existing public interest exception to the better off overall test, which has actually been in Commonwealth industrial legislation for decades, including in the Fair Work Act, as was, of course, introduced by those opposite. This long-standing exception only applies in exceptional circumstances and where it's not contrary to the public interest. It's not a provision that's used very often, but it is sometimes necessary to save a business and protect jobs during a short-term crisis. The Order, bill Senator Payne. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. Answering my questions in Townsville, the CFMEU Mining and Energy Division's legal director, Mr Bukarika, had the courage and integrity to acknowledge that the union's Hunter Valley Division had enabled the permanent casuals wrought. Until we get to the core of the industrial relations problem, the government's proposed changes add needless complexity and transfer the risk from big business to small business. When will the Morrison government admit its role through six years of inaction that enabled big mining companies, labour hire firms and the Hunter Valley CFMEU to collude in redefining Order. the term casual Roberts, and then in exploiting the casual has workers? Expired. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I would, of course, uh, uh, acknowledge Senate, that uh, Senator Roberts and I have discussed a number of matters, particularly relating to uh, particular coal miners uh, in, uh, in Australia uh, in recent times, as he has raised them through the estimates process in which I've been present representing the Minister for Industrial Relations. So I acknowledge your long-standing uh, and abiding concern for those people, those individuals. Uh, I'm not familiar with the advice from uh, the um, uh, the CFMEU uh, legal adviser on this matter that you received in Townsville, Senator. But it is, uh, it is not the case that the government agrees with the characterisation that, uh, that has been made. Uh, the government's view is that these initiatives, this, uh, this reform, in fact will contribute in a positive sense uh, to responding to the economic crisis caused by um, COVID-19 or the triggered by COVID-19. Uh, we see ourselves at a critical point in our recovery, and as we navigate our way out of this COVID-19 induced Payne, economic time crisis, for the answer it's our has ability expired. to— Time for the answer has expired. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Minister, our country's largest employer is small business. Will you give Australian workers an assurance that you are prepared to drop the Morrison government's changes to the better off overall test and simply focus on genuine industrial reform that won't hurt already struggling workers and small business? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I absolutely agree with uh, Senator Roberts about the importance of small business in this country, as, the, as Minister Cash advised us in response to an earlier question from Senator Small. Uh, I won't give that guarantee, Senator, because the government does not share the same view of the legislation. But I will undertake, of course, the government undertakes, the minister himself undertakes, to work closely with senators to address issues of concern. Senator Fawcett. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is also to Senator Payne, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the Minister update the Senate on the World Health Organisation's recent mission to Wuhan and the Australian Government's support uh, to international efforts to prevent and, where necessary, respond to future pandemics such as COVID-19? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, <clears throat> and I thank Senator Fawcett. Uh, particularly for this important question, because throughout COVID-19, the Australian government's sole focus has been protecting the health and the well-being of all Australians. Yeah. Our domestic response has been guided by expert health advice, and it has been 
amongst the most successful in the world. We believe that transparent scientific investigation of how this virus emerged is essential to preventing future global pandemics. So last week, Mr. President, the WHO convened scientific team studying the origins of COVID-19 concluded its mission to Wuhan, and those investigations are, of course, critical. I particularly want to acknowledge and recognise the contribution of Australia's professor, Dominic Dwyer, a renowned microbiologist from Westmead Hospital in Western Sydney. Australia has consistently advocated for the expert scientific team visiting China to have access to all data information and key locations relevant to their inquiries. Australia joins our key partners, including uh, UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab, US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, in reiterating the need for full access to all information relevant to determining how this pandemic emerged. While there was a lengthy press conference at the conclusion of the mission last week, we are yet to see a formal report with findings, analysis and recommendations for future work. We will consider those scientific findings carefully when they are released, and Australia reiterates again the need for transparency and independence throughout this process. The World Health Assembly resolution of May last year delivered a very clear mandate to identify the source of the COVID-19 virus and how it was transmitted to humans. Our collective ongoing work is vital as we all want to establish the origin and spread of this pandemic so that we can learn the lessons and prevent future Order. devastating Senator outbreaks Payne. of disease. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Would the minister outline uh, Australia's ongoing work with international partners to ensure that international health architecture is fit for purpose to tackle future health challenges? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the World Health Organization itself is an important partner in the Indo-Pacific, and I want to acknowledge its work in our region. What COVID-19, however, has shown is there is a need to strengthen, to reform the WHO. As a member of the WHO Executive Board, Australia has consistently advocated the importance of principled collective action from the international community. I have discussed this work with the Director General of the WHO, Dr Tedros, on a number of occasions and stated clearly Australia, that Australia will remain a constructive and pragmatic contributor to these uh, efforts. Uh, last month, Australia joined the G7 and the Republic of Korea in calling to strengthen and reform the WHO to ensure it remains fit for evolving challenges including with the continued strong support and involvement of its member states and the international community. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister update the Senate on Australia's ongoing advocacy for an independent, comprehensive and a partial, impartial evaluation of COVID-19? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Australia remains closely engaged with the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, uh, led, of course, by former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, and the former President of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. We've welcomed the Independent Panel's progress report of January 19. Australia has advocated for strengthening the WHO's authority to quickly access and investigate an outbreak, and our national submission to the panel focused clearly on building an independent and authoritative WHO, reducing the risk of zoonotic disease transmission and strengthening WHO operations on the ground. The panel's progress report stated that the WHO's power to, and I quote, validate reports of disease outbreaks and deploy resources to affected areas is gravely limited, unquote. Following the WHO investigation team's media conference last week, Australia will continue to advocate for a review and a report that is both thorough and Order. credible. Senator Payne. Senator Urquhart. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Documents released under Freedom of Information have revealed that Minister Dutton announced two grants for two councils during the Braden by-election worth $194,000. The grants were announced a month before the rules for the grants opened and against the explicit advice of his own community safety experts who warned they, and I quote, do not reflect the order of merit and you may be criticised either in the media or by the Australian National Audit Office. 
Why did the minister ignore the advice of community safety experts and fund the grants? The minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the senator for the question. Uh, in issues such as this, the facts really matter. And let me share some of the facts uh, with those opposite. This government is absolutely committed to making Australian communities a safe place uh, to live Order. and to work. The Safer Communities Fund, provided to address crime and anti-social behaviour, uh, helps communities to reduce violence and improve safety in local communities. Since Order 2016, the government has committed $180 million to this program. Let Order, me put a Senator few Keneally. facts, as I said, on the record in relation to this question, in relation to round three of the Safer Communities Fund. A total of 465 Order. applications, totalling over $58 million, were received uh, for funding Order, for approximately $17 million. Of these 465 applications, the Department of Home Affairs recommended 70 be approved. Each of these applications Order. that the Department recommended received funding. The Department also reckoned that Minister Dutton select 15 from a reserve list of 210. All 210 of those applications have been assessed as suitable for funding. In fact, to enable, to enable this to be funded, the Minister himself reduced a number of grants to enable funding to a number of Labor seats. So, to Labor seats. So, for example, Order. Nick Champion, the member for Spence, uh, funded Order. six CCTVs Senator under these savings. Catherine King, the member for Ballarat, also funded four fixed uh, CCTVs. Senator Watt. Uh, and the list goes on and on. In fact, in fact, in fact, the Senator spending between Labor and Coalition seats is almost identical. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. It has also been revealed Minister Dutton awarded the National Retail Association a grant of almost $1 million after they donated to his campaign. Why did the minister make the nearly $1 million grant to his campaign donor? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, facts matter, and they matter in this case a great deal. So this really desperate attempt to try and smear the Minister for Home Affairs is sad and it's clearly not supported by the evidence and let me share with you why. The National Retail Association donated both to both sides of this chamber. The member for Griffith received a $2,000 donation from the National Retailers Association in 2018 and 2019. The other point to make is that because Labor are so obsessed with the politics, uh, and throwing mud, they actually, they actually failed to take into account a much more significant public event, uh, a very sad and a frightening event that occurred on November 2018. And of course, that was the Burke Street terror attack of the 9th of November. On the 9th of November, one male attacker set his car on fire and stabbed three people and attacked police at Melbourne. Of those three stabbing victims, one tragically died at the scene. So you, that person Order. was Senator Sisto Reynolds. Malaspina. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Urquhart, a final. Oh, Senator Wong, oh, sorry, Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, Minister Dutton was warned not to use, misuse taxpayer dollars. He gave his Liberal donor mates a grant of almost one million dollars. His rolled gold rorting now includes an eye-watering thirty-six thousand dollar taxpayer-funded RAAF flight to Tasmania to announce his dodgy grants. Why does the Morrison government treat taxpayer money like it's Liberal Party money? Yeah. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And as I started to explain in relation to this, the facts matter. And the convenient fact is Labor have left out why that grant was made. Again, in response to that terrible terrorist attack in Melbourne, because the National Retailers Association applied for a funding under the Protected Crowded Place project to assist retailers deter, delay and respond to a terrorist attack. That is a convenient fact that you have left out. And noting the significant events affecting the public uh, and retailers over the months of November 2018, his office asked the Department of Home Affairs to consider this proposal and have the Department of Finance cost it. It was assessed and recommended to be funded as it represented value for money and a proper use Order. of Commonwealth resources, consistently with Public Government's Performance and Accountabilities Act 2013. It was used—and again, you've conveniently 
do not recall Order. that this Senator was Keneally. used for a most important Order. response Senator to a terrorist attack. Reynolds. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Rustin. Can Order. the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison's government's Order. Sorry, home builder grants— Senator Rennick, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ask you to start again. I can't hear the question. Order on my left. I can't hear. Senator Rennick has the call. Senator Rennick, you can start again. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's home builder grants are helping to drive our coronavirus economic recovery? Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Rennick for his question. Well, I think everybody in this place understands the huge contribution that the construction centre construction sector has always played in being a key pillar of our economy, and it is a very essential pillar of our economic recovery as we recover from the coronavirus pandemic. And so the Morrison government's home builder program is providing Australians with grants to build a new home or to renovate an existing home. And I'm pleased to say that as of the 31st of December 2020, more than 83,000 households had applied for this particular grant. And I'm pleased also to inform that 80 per cent of the applications have been for new home construction. And in your home state, um, Senator Reddick uh, of Queensland, there have been more than 18,000 applications to this actual program. And that has been absolutely fundamental in uh, assisting the, uh, the state's building industry. Uh, and with the AB, uh, ABS is now reporting that approvals for private sector houses rose by 7.5 per cent in December, reaching the highest levels that we've seen since 1994. Uh, at the outset of the pandemic, um, we, uh, sales of houses virtually stopped overnight, and up to 500,000 jobs across many industries were put at risk. But as we ended 2020, new home sales were up 32.5 per cent compared on the previous year. A remarkable turnaround thanks to this amazing program and the investment that we've made in the construction industry. Home Builder was uh, created as a stimulus to increase confidence and encourage buyers back into the market as the devastating impacts of the coronavirus pandemic started to hit the market. We now can say that with no doubt whatsoever that the Home Builder program has well and truly exceeded our expectations and its goals and has kept hundreds and thousands of tradies in work who otherwise would have been unemployed. We extended the program and we are absolutely delighted. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. How does the Morrison government help Australians who want to enter the housing market for the first time? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we all know that home ownership is an absolutely intrinsic part of the Australian dream, and it's also a very important component of creating lifelong stability for Australians. And that's why, as the, as the government, we have given young Australians the mechanism and confidence to invest in their future. Saving for a deposit can be particularly difficult, so our first home loan deposit scheme helps Australians buy their first house by making their deposit only as little as 5 per cent. And as part of our economic plan to rebuild our economy, the scheme was extended to allow an additional 10,000 young Australians who are buying their first home to be able to access this particular program with a guaranteed loan until 30 June 2021. When we first introduced the Home Builder program, those offers in opposite insisted that nobody would take up the offer and it was only for the rich. We now know that first home buyers were the biggest cohort to use this grant, and despite the pandemic, we've seen the highest number of first home bonus in 11 Order. years. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. How is the Home Builder program supporting Australia's construction industry? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the livelihoods of more than one million Australians lie in residential construction. One million Australians. And we know that for every new home that is built in Australia, it will support 43 tradies through that process. That's bricklayers, that's glass manufacturers, Australian jobs in rural areas and in urban areas. And they are the beneficiaries from the construction support of our Home Builder Grant Program. Treasury has estimated that the Home Builder Program will support $18 billion worth of residential construction projects. Uh, and I'd like to quote the CEO of the Master Builders, uh, Danita Warren, who said, there is no doubt that the federal government's decisive action to implement Home Builder saved the day for thousands of small builders and tradies 
the people they employ and the communities they support around the country. We will, as the coalition government, always prioritise jobs, support home buyers, and get our tradies back to work to support a strong Australia. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is again to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. The Minister has today referred to a meeting in her office between the Minister uh, and, amongst others, uh, Ms. Higgins. Can the Minister confirm was this the only meeting? that the minister was personally engaged in with Ms Higgins in relation to the alleged assault. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Oh, look, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Wong for that question. Uh, Senator Wong, I'll have to take that one on notice. I'll just explain why, because I understand that this situation is still subject of an open AFP inquiry, so I'll just need to take advice in terms of how much detail is appropriate for me to comment, and that I will get back to the chamber, Senator President. Order, order on my left. Order, Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Earlier in question time today, the minister explained the location of the meeting by indicating she was at that point unaware of the alleged assault. Can the minister explain how she claimed she was unaware of the alleged assault at the time of that meeting, given the meeting took place after Ms. Higgins had reported the assault to the minister's chief of staff? Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, Senator Wong, I will again take that question on notice because it does no, it, it goes to a very important matter, and that, that this is still the subject of an open AFP investigation since no, since April 2019. I will I can confirm the details of that first meeting, and as I said at that first meeting, I was unaware of the circumstances of the alleged incident. I will seek some further legal advice in terms of the detail uh, of how much I can uh, communicate publicly, and I will come back to the chamber as soon as I can on that. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister explain how she now claims she was unaware of the assault at the time of the reported meeting, given her answer also today that she told Ms Higgins in that meeting that the minister would support her going to the police? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator Wong, I did not in fact say uh, that it was at that meeting about the police. What I did confirm, what I did confirm is that all throughout this, I took all of the relevant advice from ministerial and parliamentary services. That information was communicated to my staff member and including my recommendation to her um, that she consider uh, talking to the AFP and seeking advice from them which again is something that I facilitated for her. Now, in terms of any of the f further detail on that, I will go and seek advice because it is the subject of being advised of an ongoing AFP investigation into the matter, which was opened in April 2019, and it's my advice that that investigation is still open, or at least ongoing. So I do need to make sure that I do not prejudice anything that she may have decided to do then and now. Order. Senator. Order. Order. Senator Mullen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Given the importance of health security and economic recovery in the Indo-Pacific, will the Minister please update the Senate on the progress of Australia's provisions of vaccine to the Pacific and Southeast Asia? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Molan for the question. Uh, Australia is proud to be offering full COVID-19 vaccine coverage for the Pacific and Timor-Leste in close partnership uh, with New Zealand, uh, the United States, and France. Uh, we are committing $523.2 million over three years to a COVID-19 ac vaccine access health initiative for the Pacific and Southeast Asia. This funding complements the $80 million we've previously committed to the multilateral COVAX facilities advanced market commitment for developing countries. Uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, we will work with partners like the World Bank to meet the needs of much larger populations in our region. This initiative will provide safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and support health security in our region. And those points, safety and effectiveness, are critically important. Uh, we will only support the rolling out of vaccines to our neighbours once they have been approved by a stringent regulatory authority, and countries are adequately prepared to administer the right vaccines for their local conditions. 
Senator Payne and I are in regular contact with our counterparts in the Pacific and Southeast Asia to underline our commitment uh, and to progress the next steps of our cooperation on vaccine access and rollouts in their nations. We expect that vaccines procured by the COVAX facilities AMC will be the first available to countries in our region. Garvey and the WHO's best estimate is the AMC will begin to supply before the end of March 2021. Finally, I'd like to recognise that our Pacific partners have handled this situation extremely well so far, and this is a testament to the incredible leadership across our region. Our focus is on trying to save lives and livelihoods. Access to WHO-approved COVID-19 vaccines will help economies reopen and ensure stability. Our regional vaccine initiative will enable the purchase of vaccines by our neighbouring countries and will provide them with the necessary technical support to prepare Order, for vaccine Senator introduction. Senator Selger, time for the answer has expired. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, can the minister please update the Senate on the comprehensive nature of Australia's COVID-19 support measures to the Pacific and Southeast Asia? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. Again, thanks, Senator Molan. Our response is comprehensive in that it not only delivers access to vaccines but also critical economic support to countries in our region that have been profoundly affected by COVID-19. Our vaccine access initiative will deliver a holistic package of end-to-end -end support. It's not just for the procurement of WHO-approved vaccines. Uh, we're providing technical assistance and logistical support, such as training of health workers and cold chain storage, as well as the development of national immunisation policies. Economic measures will support health security, social stability and help drive economic recovery across the region. They're also designed to help protect the most vulnerable who are disproportionately affected by the pandemic, including women and girls and those with a disability. These targeted initiatives will meet the urgent needs of our neighbours and enable the region's recovery from COVID-19 in the longer term. It's not just delivering vaccines, it's about making sure we work with our partners to maintain essential health services and enhance security Order, to Senator those Sosselia. who need it most. Senator Molan, a final supplementary Thank question. you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on how Australia is working with other nations to coordinate our COVID-19 support to the region. Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Molan uh, for the question. I am pleased uh, to inform the Senate that all Pacific Island nations and Timor-Leste uh, will be provided with the support to achieve full vaccine coverage in line with their own national priorities, and that process has already started. We're working closely with New Zealand, France and the United States in relation to realm countries, French territories and US compact states. Uh, this coordination is critical to ensure our Pacific family can have access to vaccines that are safe and effective and can be accessed to support the economic recovery of the region. We believe uh, that Australia and the region will not be safe until everybody is safe. Uh, that is why uh, we are making a significant global contribution to ensuring uh, that all of our close partners have access to a safe and effective WHO-approved COVID-19 uh, vaccines uh, and full international support to deliver them. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Motions to take note of answers. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Payne and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Farrell and Walsh. So, can I say what we've seen over the last 12 months is extraordinary service, extraordinary sacrifice, and extraordinary dedication by our essential workers in our country, and a dawning realisation that essential workers are not only those who put out fires, rescue us in nat natural disasters and provide police emergency and health services. Hospital staff, cleaners, security workers, workers all through the supply chain striving to keep essential goods available, workers in our ports and airports and public servants in Centrelink, health and tax. I just want to quote um, ACTU Secretary Sally McManus, who pretty much summed up um, when she said, the economy, local businesses will not be able to recover if workers are facing pay cuts. She was, of course, talking about the plans of this government 
to cut uh, the wages and the conditions of workers in this country under IR laws. Fam she went on to say families need the confidence to spend. You can't heal the economy by hurting working people. Prime Minister Morrison, summing his best sincere face, announced we're all in this together in April last year. We've got to put down our weapons, he declared. Well, it's quite clear now that this government, the Morrison government, has picked up those weapons and is armed to the teeth. Their plan is a pathway for employers to cut pay due to the impact of COVID-19 on their businesses, to wipe out back pay claims for misclassified casuals, and they want so-called flexibility, so flexibility for part-time workers to pick up shifts without overtime rates. The minister in her answer talked about the boot test. So the government wants to suspend rules that prevent enterprise agreements from undercutting minimum award standards. And just to put this change into perspective, it wasn't even discussed. It wasn't even on the agenda at the government's we're all in this together IR meetings last year. We know that suspending the boot test will result in cuts to take home pay for one in four workers that are covered by enterprise agreements. Weaker boot protections will spur a wave of new enterprise agreements, allowing employers further opportunity to suppress labour costs, which are already tracking at their slowest pace in post war history. We know that the government's proposal would also allow part time employees covered by the 12 awards in the retail, food and accommodation industries to work extra shifts at ordinary rates without, without the overtime loading. This has been refer referred to as part-time flexibility, but in truth we all know that it's casuals employment by another name. And allowing extra work without overtime will cut take-home pay. This allows employers to effectively use part-time workers as yet another form of casual labour. This government believes that any job can be casual so long as workers are desperate enough to accept it. There can be no doubt that this will feed the further spread of insecure employment without paid leave entitlements. And in the news today, we see the proposal by the, uh, uh, the, the government on the bill is labelled as an immediate threat to public health by a significant group of public health experts from the Australian National University. Casual workers with no sick leave who have already borne the brunt of this pandemic, and now the government brazenly is attempting to legislate to have as many casual workers as possible. In reality, the changes to both part-time and casual employment rules will discourage new hiring. If existing employees can't be costly flexed in line with employer needs, why would you hire anyone else? This bill has been spruiked by two hollow men, marketing man Prime Minister Morrison and Attorney General Mr Christian Porter, and it's a scam. The changes that it will introduce will be marked, marketed by these hollow men as a trigger for post-pandemic job creation. But again, that claim is hollow. It's a hollow claim made by hollow men. These statements were nothing that they made back in the short uh, the sh statements about we're all in this together in 2020. Very short lived statements. These are hollow men and they Thank should you, leave Senator IR Urquhart. alone. The time for your contribution has expired. Just before you sit down, I just want to clarify I may have noted it wrong that you said you were taking note of questions asked by Senators Farrell and Walsh, but I didn't think Senator Walsh asked a question today. Oh, apologies, that was just Farrell? Yes, okay, so I'll just remind people we're taking that's who we're taking note of. Uh, Senator Scar. I had the, uh, the same question, Madam Deputy President, so thank you for uh, clarifying that. I thought I must have uh, faded away into a dream during, uh, during question time, but uh, never mind. Uh, can I say, in, in relation to uh, Senator Urquhart's reference to hollow, what is hollow, and more than that, disappointing? What is profoundly disappointing is that we're at a position in this country where there are things that could be done, reasonable things that could be done to improve our industrial relations system. 
which are in the best interests of employers and employees, which are fair and which are reasonable, which have checks and balances, which would promote more employment and, in particular, in particular promote the opportunity for young people who uh, don't, have not had the opportunity for employment, which other people have had in our society, promote the opportunity for them to get their first job and to get experience. And it's a, it's a real shame, a profound shame, that we can't come together and come up with a system of reforms to make it easier, not harder, for small business, in particular small business, to take that step to hire that extra worker, to give that extra young person a go, to give young people more hours, provide them with more opportunity and therefore more experience so that they can progress through their life and their career with the benefit of that work. And it's a real shame, I believe, that these modest, what are relatively modest proposals for IR reform have once again come bogged down in this ideological debate. In relation to casual workers, I'd just like to make the initial observation that I've gone back and had a look at the 2009 Fair Work Act and the definition of casual worker in that act was totally unacceptable. I mean, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. I don't know what the thinking was at the time of the then government with respect to how they defined casual work in the Fair Work Act. I'd love to know. I should maybe go back and have a look at the parliamentary record. But there was no definition of casual work. There was no definition. So you, here, you are, here you are in relation to the industrial relations reforms that are being put forward by the government. It actually has a, a definition of casual work. Is that an issue? Do people have an issue with that, that casual work is uh, work where there's no firm advanced commitment to ongoing work? It seems a fair definition to me, absolutely a fair definition to me. So this reform seeks to actually provide a definition of casual work. And the implication of the then government's failure, Labor government's abject failure, to put in a definition of casual work was that so many small businesses, so many small businesses have been absolutely blindsided by a decision of the courts to find that someone who'd been hired as a casual worker paid the loading, paid the extra loading because they're a casual worker, they're not getting the annual leave, etc., etc. So paid the extra 25 per cent to then find out that the law did not consider them to be a casual worker and they have a liability to pay them for the entitlements which they've missed out on, notwithstanding the fact, notwithstanding the fact that they'd been paid 25 per cent loading. How any reasonable person can see that, look at that set of circumstances and determine that reasonable and fair reform is not required is absolutely beyond me. Absolutely beyond me. What do those opposite think will happen? What do those opposite think will happen if small businesses across this country are faced with claims, years old, with respect to allegations and claims made that entitlements have to be paid out where the loading, the 25 per cent loading, was paid? This is an area that needs reform. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed. This is a problem. And I call upon those opposite to actually address that particular problem where a small business has paid someone on their reasonable understanding that they're a casual, they've paid them the 25 per cent loading, and then it's determined years later that they weren't a casual and the same person applies for their entitlements, to be paid out their entitlements. What is your answer to that particular problem? Because that is the question which small businesses around this country are asking every day. If you do not support this change, what is your answer to that issue of double dipping? Thank you, Senator Scar. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And I'm answering questions from uh, Senator Farrell uh, to Mr. Senator Birmingham. Well, that was an interesting um, speech, and I've got a bit of uh, time for Senator Scarra, but I think what he needs to do is actually have a look at some of the facts around what happens out there in the workplace. In actual fact, what would be useful is actually to look at what happens with regards to the work pack case and what happens in the mining industry and what happens with regards to labour hire. In the case of the mining industry, 
where there was a decision taken where workers had been clearly ripped off by being treated as per operating as permanents but paid for as casuals, where well, they were getting paid 40 per cent less for doing the exact same work to the permanent employees standing side by side. Let's be very clear. A casual employee working for a labour hire company paid 40 per cent less than a permanent employee who is getting entitlements of annual leave, sick leave and all those protections you would expect from permanent employment. Of course, that decision from that court was clearly about employers double dipping. And of course, that decision in that court was peculiar to the particular circumstances that that court considered. It considered the fact that those workers were received rosters 12 months in advance. I don't know too many small employers who get rosters 12 months in advance. I can understand why they wouldn't. I don't see many employers in many other industries give 12 months rosters in advance. But if you do, well, then maybe the work pack case does apply to you. And you've been double dipping and ripping off those casuals, just like is happening in the uh, resources industry. Now, I'd like to hope that you know, these people just don't understand on the opposite side. I'd like to hope that they don't really know because they don't really look at what the consequences are. They read the propaganda sheet that they receive. But unfortunately, two of them very clearly too many of them very clearly understand too well that this is an attack on job security for part-time workers by casualising their performance, by turning around and saying to part-time workers, when an employer goes and sees you in the real world and says, I'd like you to do your part-time overtime, to do your part-time overtime at flat rates, when I'd like you to do that, you have one of two choices. The person either says no or they say yes. And everyone knows what happens in too many circumstances when you say no to your employer. And if you do say yes, what happens to the other part-time worker who's receiving those overtime payments for the exact same role? Funnily enough, the person receiving the proper penalty, exercising their proper rights, is not employed, is not engaged. And let's just say every employer does that because that's not true. Every employer doesn't actually operate that way. But what happens is when an employer does operate that way, their competitors have no other option, option but to, to meet the market requirements. If one player turns around and rips off part-time workers in one market and gets a cheaper rate, then those same companies competing are under the same pressure to take the exact same steps. It's not seen in isolation. How can it possibly be? It's not in isolation in the workplace when someone makes that decision. And it isn't in isolation across the market. So when decent employers, good employers, thoughtful employers don't want to go down that course, there's a consequence. That gets, gets us down to the boot test. You know, bad, bad business are licking their lips at this bill. They can't believe their luck. Some even are coming forward with suggestions of how they could take money from workers. McDonald's even put in a submission that they should all be allowed to cut their workers' pay if they ate some chicken nuggets on their break. You know, the old company store approach. This bill is part of the and this bill that the government's talking about is part of the government's multi-pronged attack on Australian workers. You know, I note Senator Bragg is spearheading the attack on workers' superannuation. You know, let's not have dignity in retirement, heaven forbid. That's, that's, the, pre that's the premise of the well-off. And parliamentarians. He believes that cutting your superannuation will somehow trickle into your pay, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Perhaps he can work with McDonald's on their plan to not pay superannuation but to give people fries. The boot test that has been proposed by the government clearly is a substantial wage cut. Any simple review of the proposals from this government cuts wages on penalties, on shift allowances, on annual leave payments. It has a cut right across public holidays. There's all that capacity Thank to have you, that Senator effect. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. The time for uh, your contribution has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, it's like Groundhog Day, time and again. Never seen an IR scare campaign that the Labor Party can't get behind. And really, that is just what's so sad, 
and desperate when it comes to the modern Labor Party. And I would like to support Senator Scar in his comments. And I think this is potentially what is the most disappointing part of the modern Labor Party, is their inability to ever have a sensible discussion about reform. They are totally incapable of looking at any changes without running back to the old scare campaign tactics. But I don't know why we're surprised. I mean, when we look at those opposite and those in the other place, I mean, at times you'd start to wonder and question whether or not it's la la land that they live in when it comes to running a business, employing staff. I mean, we know that's not part of their pre selection criteria. Having ever run a business, having ever employed people, having ever faced the burdens of red tape, have looking at you know, the challenges about being every part of a business from payroll to marketing to HR. We know that those opposite and those that sit in the on the opposition benches in the other place have little to no understanding of the challenges of small business. And that is completely obvious when you look at the way that they've politicised and tried to respond to the current COVID pandemic and the efforts the Morrison government has made in securing small businesses' future, in ensuring that those small businesses are able to survive and rebuild on the other side of this pandemic. And yesterday, watching Sally McManus be the spokesperson for Labor, the spokesperson for industrial relations reform, when we know there's not an employer that Sally McManus wouldn't like to see the back of, there seems to be this disconnect when it comes down to it, that we want to talk about jobs, we want to talk about pay and conditions, but we just want to demonise all employers. There is an inability to accept from Labor that employers are the people that create jobs. Without supporting employers and ensuring their businesses can succeed, that we can cut red tape, we can make it easier for those businesses to do what they're good at, to conduct their core business, that more jobs will be created, boosting the opportunities and options for all Australian workers. But of course, options like choice is a dirty word for the Labor Party. Why do the Labor Party hate choice? Why do they think they are so incapable that Australian workers can make a decision? What's better for them? Is it better to receive loadings to continue work as a casual? Is it better to move to a permanent position? But why do the Labor Party have so little faith in Australians and Australian workers that they are able to make that choice? Why do you think it's appropriate to cut casuals' wages, if that's how they choose to remain, by, on average, $153 a week? I am looking forward to Mr Albanese, the opposition leader, coming out and explaining to workers, whilst removing their choice, he determines they should take, on average, a $153 pay cut. So we know that this will be about choice. This will be an option for workers. And we know that this flies in the face of the groupthink ideology so embraced by Labor, that unions know best, do as we tell you. I mean, when you look at the behaviour of some of the union bosses, we do know it's do as I say, not as I do. We know best for you. Big Brother will look after you. Don't you worry about that. Don't challenge your little head with any of those independent thoughts. But again, we can't see a Labor Party here that's, opting, that's actually looking for workers, because we know what this is about. It's only about one job in this country, and it's a job that's looking very shaky at the moment. And this is all about the job of opposition leader Anthony Albanese. And so that's perhaps why now, after the industrial relations spokesperson for Labor, Tony Burke, came out declaring that all Australians in insecure work should be able to take all their leave entitlements with them at a cost to business of up to $20 billion a year. But we see Mr Burke running away from that a little bit now, but perhaps that's as he's trying to remain as, as supportive of his neighbour, Chris Bowen, as he uh, looks to the future of his own thank career. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, when asked today why the government's new IR laws 
are actually designed to make insecure work even more entrenched. The government again today ignored the advice, the expert advice, of 23 law professors in this country. 23 law professors in this country who say that this IR law will not only fail to address the wage stagnation that is absolutely plaguing our economy at the moment, it will not only fail to address the insecure work that so many Australians face today, in fact, these IR laws will actually exacerbate these problems. And again, the government has decided to ignore these 23 law experts today. Uh, and they've decided today to double down on their claims, double down on their tired, old, false claims. False claims that we've heard over and over and over again from this side of politics. False claims that somehow cutting pay is important to boosting jobs. Somehow cutting pay is going to boost jobs and boost the economy. That is the tired old play from this Liberal government. False claims they have doubled down on today that making more Australians casual and insecure, that is going to somehow boost the economy. False claims that somehow scrapping the better off overall test is going to magically leave Australians better off overall. Uh, when it is clearly designed to leave Australians worse off, apparently, according to this government, in service of uh, a stronger economy. Well, Australians see through this Liberal government's spin. They know that in the middle of this health crisis uh, and in the middle of an economic crisis, the Liberal government is actually just reaching into the bottom drawer to pull out their tired old playbook to pull out their tired old plans. Attacks on workers, attacks on unions, attacks on people's basic rights at work. Cuts to workers' pay, cuts to workers' rights. That is the, the recipe that this government has for Australians uh, to get through this pandemic and to set the economy on the right foot. Well, Australians know better than to believe that. Australians know that they have faced persistently low wages under this government even before the pandemic. And they know that Scott Morrison's response that this industrial relations bill will only make that problem worse. A pay cut is not going to help the stagnant wages of Australians. Casualising more Australians is not going to address the epidemic that we have of insecure work in this country. Wages have been flatlining under this government even before COVID-19. And it is a big problem. It's a big problem for workers who can't afford to put food on the table for themselves and their families. And it's a big problem for the economy as a whole, because what we actually need is for people to have the pay packets to be able to open their wallets and spend in their local communities and spend in their local businesses. That's what we actually need to get this economy moving. And we need people to have secure jobs to get this economy moving. We need people to have the security of a paycheck next week, the week after and the week after that. The hours of work that they need next week, the week after and the week after that, in order to be able to spend, in order to be able to put money into local business, local community and to give our economy the boost that it needs. But too many Australians are stuck in low paid and insecure jobs under this government. Casuals, contractors, freelancers, labour hire workers, gig workers, people stuck in jobs with no certainty of work for the next day, the next week, the next month ahead. And what we actually need is a government that has a plan to boost wages and a government that has a plan to boost job security, not to make 
more workers casual and not to deliver a pay cut to more Australian workers uh, and not to hang out the very essential workers who saw us through 2020. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers uh, to my question to Senator Birmingham representing the Prime Minister. We've got a culture problem in this building, and how many more examples are we going to be faced with before this government does something about it? We've seen uh, this morning incredibly confronting um, reporting of an actual rape in this very building that is, what, 18 months ago now, almost two years ago now, and this government has sought to sweep it under the carpet. Now, in examining this issue today, I had cause to troll back through history, and there have been so many other examples. And I am so disheartened that there still seems to be no action to fix either the culture of this place and in this political party, the Liberals in particular, or action to actually fix the systems that might either prevent this, ideally, or at the very least support survivors of sexual violence and assault. I asked um, the minister representing the Prime Minister, um, and the Prime Minister of course made a statement earlier today, belatedly, saying that he regrets if Ms Higgins, Brittany Higgins, who's the woman who was raped in this building by um, a Liberal staff colleague, the Prime Minister regrets if she felt unsupported. Well, that does not cut it. Ms Higgins deserves an appropriate redress. She deserves a formal apology, and she deserves an actual process to clean up this sordid mess so that no other woman has to be subjected to this sort of treatment in future. But the Prime Minister, um, he regrets if she felt unsupported. Well, she did feel unsupported, and you can't imagine why. She was brought into her employer's office, the very office in which she was raped. She was essentially, and she says, she was essentially uh, told not to pursue the matter with police. She left that meeting with the implication that if she did pursue this matter with police, her own career would be at stake, and we know that that is such a common theme in these types of incidents. Um, and ultimately the AFP got involved, but it's been almost two years and still we've seen no result. And still we don't even have an admittance by this government that there is a problem, let alone anything that they're doing about it. I asked the minister, have you got a policy about this? And I asked him, well, have you reviewed that policy, if you even have one, after the example of Ms Higgins, after the example of what happened uh, with Ministers Tudge and Porter that was recently revealed on Four Corners? After the example of uh, Ms Potter and Ms Marnie, which was reported uh, nigh on two years ago, the examples just keep on coming. Where is the review of your inadequate policies? Now, the minister saw fit to bang on about the employee assistance program, which I'm sure is a noble program, and yes, it exists for, for everyone uh, working under the MOPS Act to access, but it is hardly an appropriate response when I've asked about Liberal Party policy and whether that's been reviewed to clean up the fact that women are not safe in this building. It's an entirely inadequate response. It is a dodge to the question, and it is an insult to all survivors of sexual harassment and assault and rape um, in this workplace um, and anywhere, for that matter. So I was extremely disappointed that the government had the opportunity to say they were doing something and they didn't take that opportunity. So the natural implication is they're not doing anything about this. They just want these women to shut up and go away. Now, um, Minister Reynolds, who was the, the woman's employer at the time, um, was asked about well, what's happened to Ms Higgins. And she um, ultimately conceded that well, Ms Higgins then went to work for Minister Cash and might have even had a promotion. That's pretty rare. Usually it's the woman that loses her job. But one wonders whether or not this promotion, presumably with a, uh, a slight pay increase, was that the price that Ms Higgins had to pay? Um, was that what she got so that she didn't speak out? It, it just boggles the mind that this government continues to think they can ignore this issue and do nothing about it. The Prime Minister didn't face the media today. Um, that that camera-loving Prime Minister, who loves to uh, entertain us all with extremely lengthy press conferences, foregoed that opportunity today. And one wonders whether or not it's because he is complicit in this cover-up and he is should be the person showing some leadership 
in tackling these issues because they keep on happening. And yet nothing. A, a blandly worded statement where he's sorry. She, no, he's not even sorry. He regrets that she feels unsupported. What an absolute joke. So I note that the Young Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, said she was uh, rather Brittany when she saw um, the Prime Minister standing with Grace Tame, said she felt sick in the stomach and that she thought that this government was complicit in silencing her. They are. Fix it. Do better. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. So we'll move to. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day, Senator Friavanti Wells? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, pursuant to notice given on 4 February 2021 on behalf of the Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation, I withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of three legislative instruments as set out in the list circulated in the chamber. Thank you. Are there any other notices of motion, Senator Seward? Um, I give notice uh, of a motion on gambling that I will soon give to the clerk. Thank you, Senator Seward. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I will call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. On behalf of the Prime Minister, I table a ministerial statement on the anniversary of the National Apology to the Stolen Generation, and I move that the Senate take note of this statement. Mr President, today we reflect on the anniversary of the apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples given here in the Australian Parliament on Ngunnawal land 13 years ago. We take this opportunity to honour the local custodians, the Ngunnawal people and the first peoples across all of our great southern land. I join the Prime Minister in thanking them and their elders, past, present and emerging for 65,000 years of continuous stewardship of our land. We also honour the immense contributions being made by our Indigenous parliamentary colleagues serving in this parliament. We honour the Minister for Indigenous Australians and the Shadow Minister and the contributions they make to our nation. Here in this place, we particularly honour Senator Patrick Dodson, Senator Malandary McCarthy, Senator Lydia Thorpe and Senator Jackie Lambie. Thank you for the work that you do. Each of you bring a crucially important perspective to this place, a perspective that adds knowledge and understanding to the deliberations and the conversations, not just in the formal chambers or committees of the parliament, but perhaps even more importantly, in the informal engagements had between one another. You also set a most crucial and valuable example. You provide, we hope, inspiration and hope to new generations of young Australians through the leadership roles that you play. I look forward to other Indigenous Australians joining us in this parliament in the years to come, and ultimately, we hope, for it to be commonplace rather than exceptional to be serving alongside Indigenous women and men in our parliaments. This past weekend marked 13 years since then Prime Minister Rudd gave an apology on behalf of the nation to Australia's Indigenous people, particularly to the stolen generations. The apology was a moment for our country to take steps towards healing. It was a significant step in and of itself. I reiterate those words today. I am sorry for the injustices of the past. We are sorry as a parliament. Whilst we observe the anniversary of such a significant milestone in our nation's history, this is also an opportunity for us to reflect upon practices undertaken by governments in the past that wrongly sought to disrupt and indeed destroy the world's longest living culture. We pay respect to those members of the stolen generations, the survivors, and to those who have followed in their footsteps and those who are no longer with us. To the victims of past government policies that forced removal and cultural assimilation. A state that acted with absolute control over Aboriginal people's lives without even recognising them as citizens clearly was a mark of shame. The apology was our opportunity as Australians to say it was wrong for parliaments and governments to remove Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families and communities and their country 
just because they were Indigenous. As Minister Wyatt so rightly put it over the weekend, this is an opportunity, this occasion, the anniversary, for us to acknowledge the terrible loss and suffering and to remark upon the resilience and determination of those who worked so hard to ensure that wrongs were acknowledged and to preserve the culture of their peoples and nations into the future. What followed the national apology was an effort to close the gap. In the decade that followed, we saw mixed results, an inconsistency in outcomes. I was pleased, as Education Minister, to see positive progress in terms of the targets around Year 12 educational attainment towards the Closing the Gap targets. Such steps in education provide encouragement, some hope for the future. But elsewhere, there was a failure to achieve the scale of progress or the permanent change the nation aspired to. In July last year, we signed a new national agreement on Closing the Gap, an agreement reached through a historic partnership between Australian governments and Indigenous peak organisations. We understand that the best outcomes occur when governments and Indigenous Australians work together. This agreement marks a new chapter in our efforts, and in echoing the comments, comments of the Prime Minister, a new chapter in our efforts, one built on mutual trust, respect and dignity. Progress is being made as we, across Australia, think differently and recraft our approach, but we know there is so much more to do. On the 9th of January, Minister Wyatt launched the second stage of the Indigenous Voice co-design process. I thank Professor Dr Marcia Langton and Professor Tim, Tom Calmer for their work alongside more than 52 members across three co-design groups. I encourage all Australians, especially all 800,000 Indigenous Australians, to provide their feedback to that process. We continue to reflect, as a nation and a parliament, on our shared history and to mark the hope of that day 13 years ago. Changes across a country like Australia can happen at all levels, from governments through to citizens. I'd like to acknowledge a very thoughtful, personal and thought-provoking journey shared by ABC journalist Ellen Fanning of her discovery of two Indigenous women, Angelina and Maria Cooney, who were sent, through forced, uh, who were sent to undertake forced employment with Ellen's great-grandfather. Ellen's research led to a meeting with Maria's granddaughter and great-granddaughter, Christine Stewart and Lorraine Franks. To quote from Ellen's article, she said that after five hours of exchanging photographs and stories, those two Queensland families sweating on a hot Queensland day and smiling, there was still one thing left to say. From Ellen, my family owes a debt of gratitude to your family, because when they came from England and Ireland, they had nothing. They were pretty much illiterate. And off the back of the work and the knowledge of country that your family brought, my family is educated and where we are today. So is thank you the right thing to say? To which Lorraine Franks said, of course it is, of course it is, Ellen. You cannot blame the children of today for what the elders did yesterday. As far as I'm concerned, my mother would be smiling down on us now. I really mean that. Lorraine shows an amazing generosity of kindness and forgiveness that offers remarkable hope. So many Indigenous Australians have shown such resilience, such kindness, such forgiveness. In days like today, we acknowledge the wrongs of what have happened and together seek to work to ensure that it does not happen to future generations. The apology brought this parliament, the, national, the nation, closer together and recognise the significant contribution Indigenous Australians had made and continue to make to this great nation. Today we reaffirm our commitment and lean into that shared hope 
of a future in which we are one and walk together in the pursuit of a better future for all and a better understanding amongst all. I thank the Senate. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Thirteen years ago, I had just returned to Australia from South Africa. I had left this country disgusted and angry at the political obfuscation, fabrication and outright denial around the removal of Aboriginal children from their mothers and families, and the refusal to acknowledge, apologise and compensate for what governments had done under political cover to hide the genocide that had been perpetrated. Taking Aboriginal children away, breaking their links to culture and community, and forcing an assimilationist scheme upon them. Unless anyone who cares to challenge my words in relation to this, in terms of the use of the word genocide, let me point to Article 2 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. The Convention was unanimously adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in December 1948 and ratified by Australia the next year. Article 2 of the Convention prescribes acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. And among those acts of prescription prescribed were the deliberate inflictions of conditions of life calculated to bring about a group's physical destruction and the forcible transfer of children of the group to another group. And un as uncomfortable as the definition might be, that's the definition of the United Nations and Australia ratified that convention in 49, almost 70 years ago. The Human Rights Commission bringing them home report was quite explicit. The forcible removal of children from Indigenous Australians to other groups for the purposes of raising them separately from and ignorant of their culture and people was properly labelled genocidal in breaching of binding international law. I have very vivid memories of the late Sir Ronald Wilson and my brother Mick Dodson, his co-commissioner, launching the Bringing Them Home report at the Reconciliation Convention in Melbourne in May 1997. It was a moment of national truth-telling that the Howard government could not handle. In reaction, its reaction was to deny that these awful things had ever happened to Aboriginal people in this country. And if they had happened, somehow or other, it was for the good of the children involved. There was no need to apologise about what happened and certainly no need to compensate them from this sanctioned activity. One of those children was an old friend of mine, Mr Frank Burns, who was taken from his family in 1943. I was reminded of the wretchedness he experienced throughout his whole life when only last week I penned a forward to his memoir to be published later this year. Frank was just six years of, of old when the authorities dumped him at Mullabula Station in the Kimberley, which was run by the Western Australian Government. In his early teens, he was told his mother had died, but that was a blatant, dreadful lie. He spent the rest of his life trying to find out what had happened to her, only to learn in later years that she had not died until 1962. Frank's grief was overwhelming. This wrench from his mother haunted him until his death in 2017, and his writing about this sense of loss will move many people to tears. An injury prevented Frank from coming to Canberra to hear Kevin Rudd's apology to the stolen generations 13 years ago. But he said he was able to witness it from his home in Alice Springs. In his memoir, which I have been proud to promote, he writes, I thought this man is genuine. He had guts to come out and say this wonderful thing. I was able to be here in Canberra when Prime Minister Rudd made the apology. I sat in the other place with Mrs Vincenti, whom I had met during the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody inquiry in Western Australia. 
Mrs. Vincetti had been taken as a young girl to the notorious Rowlands Mission near Bunbury in Western Australia. Tragically, her son had been shot at Canningvale Prison while he was in custody. The apology was the first time we had heard of the idea of closing the gap in life expectancy and measures to bring equality between First Australian Nations and the wider population. This was also a time when we were told that a new chapter in our relationship was to be written, starting with a blank page. But only, the only new ink on this blank page in these last 13 years has been the pleas of the First Nations peoples in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Today we heard the Prime Minister and Minister White uh, make, uh, say that there's a new deal that involves buy-in from the Commonwealth, the states and the territories and from the peak Aboriginal organisations, a COAG agreement that has not uh, formulated implementation plans yet, so we'll be waiting until August until we learn if anything in fact is going to be done and is going to improve the situation. What we do know, and there's empirical evidence to back this up, is just how damaging were those policies of forcibly removing and damaging those thousands of stolen generation peoples, they continue to suffer to this day. A study by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has found they have experienced a range of adverse health, cultural and socio-economic uh, outcomes at a rate higher, higher than Indigenous populations that were not removed. For example, members of the stolen generations are more than three times likely to be incarcerated than other Indigenous peoples. And the disadvantage and trauma uh, doesn't end with the stolen generations themselves. Their families too have poor health and poor social outcomes. The same Institute of Health and Welfare report, for example, found that their descendants are one and a half times as likely to have been arrested in the past five years than those, again, of First Nations of peoples who, whose families were not removed. No wonder that Mrs Vincenti's son was in jail when he was killed. He was almost fated to have been incarcerated. By the way, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the delivery of the report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. And Indigenous people are still being locked up at scandalous rates and Aboriginal children are being removed from their families in shocking numbers. Twenty-four years after the Bringing Them Home report, First Nation children are nearly ten times more likely to be living in out-of-home care in Australia, and more than 20,000 First Nation children are in out-of-home care. That's about 37 per cent of the total number of children in out-of-home care. Yet First Nations children only represent 6 per cent of the children population in Australia. As shocking as these figures are, they are getting worse. It is urgently incumbent upon all of us to make the services available to help families, not just to remove kids. I acknowledge that the new Closing the Gap targets recognises cries in the criminal justice and child protection areas, but those targets will continue to be unachievable without adequate investment of all governments, including the Commonwealth. I am gripped by a real sense of despair on occasions like this. We wait and we wait and we wait and nothing gets done. We get promises and promises and promises. Nothing gets done. What will it take for this country to confront the awful realities of its history and fix these continuing fundamental wrongs? Well, let me tell you what a good start might be, apart from setting some new targets. To the other side, I say, open your hearts and embrace in full the plea, the plea of the, of the Uluru Statement of the Heart for voice, treaty and for truth. We can only be enriched and not diminished if we do. This is the gap that has to be diminished. Thank you, Mr President. I was going to go to Senator Thorpe next, Senator Hanson. Senator Thorpe, remotely.
We haven't got sound, Senator Thorpe. I'll just ask you to recommence and try again, Senator Thorpe. No, we don't have sound yet. But can I give it one minute? If we, are you not, I don't want to say not on mute, Senator Thorpe, but everything's right at your end up until now. I'll give it one more shot. It doesn't seem to be working. Senator Thorpe, I'll get the technicians to come to you. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. We honour the Indigenous peoples of this, of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations, this blemished chapter in our nation's history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these, our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters. For the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. Mr President, this is how Kevin Rudd began the national apology to the stolen generations. It was a day of national catharsis a day of national healing and, most of all, a day of national hope. In the House of Representatives, on the lawns outside and across the country, we Australians embraced in a way we had never been before. Because we embrace one another without armour, in honesty, in truth, the conditions of respect. It was the starting point, a starting point for an equal stake. Yet too often, when parliamentarians have recognised the anniversary of the national apology to the stolen generations, there have been attempts to comfort our conscience and say, well, we have a long way to go, but look how far we've come. We need no more of that. We diminish the apology, this watershed moment of truth-telling, if we conceal failure and neglect and self-gratifying fictions that we are moving forward. In fact, it's hard to see how we are moving much at all. So this year's anniversary of the National Apology, we look at how far we have not come, and we reproach this government that appears perfectly at peace with its own inertia on reconciliation and on closing the gap with First Australians. This past Saturday was the 13th anniversary of the Apology. But for years now, work on closing the gap, the voice to parliament and Makarata have been, has been stalled. In the last year's Closing the Gap report, five of the seven targets weren't on track. Child mortality, literacy and numeracy, school attendance, employment and life expectancy. And last year's Family Matters report, more than a decade since the apology, showed the alarming rates at which Indigenous children are being removed from their families now. 37.3% of the total population of all children removed. The Morrison government promised a referendum for constitutional recognition. They promised it, but they won't commit. They won't commit to a timeline. They won't commit to doing the work to make the referendum a success. Now, I reiterate again the offer by Mr Albanese and Ms Burney, who is here today, the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, that Labor wants to work constructively, uh, and by Pat Dodson, that Labor wants to work constructively to in, in achieve a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament. We don't care who gets the credit, but we do want to get it done. And there is time to get it done now. All of us in this place should be determined to see all three elements of the statement the constitutionally enshrined voice and treaty-making and truth-telling overseen by a Makarata Commission. Senator Dodson, the father of reconciliation, has put a motion on the notice paper to establish a joint select committee on Makarata. I know he's seeking agreement with Minister Wyatt, and I say to the government, express your support. I say to government senators, express your support in the party room. You know, it's not so much to ask. It costs you so little. 
And the Uluru Statement as a whole is not much to ask, frankly. In fact, we should be humbled and gracious that a people who have had everything taken from them are willing to meet us on these terms, terms that cost us nothing, and ask us only to demonstrate some humility and some grace ourselves. It is time for those opposite to demonstrate some humility and some grace. The apology was recommended in the Bringing Them Home report that Senator Dodson has spoken about. The then Prime Minister, John Howard, resisted it for the following 10 years. Let's remember the ridiculing of those who acknowledge the facts of our past as having a black armband view, the opposition to the apology, all this despite the community support that is best exemplified and remembered in those reconciliation walks in the year 2000. Nelson Mandela visited Australia that year. He said the quarter of a million people strong Sydney Harbour Bridge walk showed a country wanting to heal itself and deal with the hurt of the past. He went on to say leaving wounds unattended leads, them to, fester, leads to them festering and eventually causes greater injury to the body of society. Mr Mandela well understood what we call Makarata from the South, South African experience. And then of course in 2008, in one of his earliest acts as Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd moved the national apology. And the Nelson opposition went along with it. Well, after eight years in government, it's time they showed they meant it. Unlike John Howard, today's Liberals don't huff and puff and dig their heels in. Instead, they just say they care. They talk about how important it is to get it right, but they don't deliver. The current Prime Minister uses similar but more subtle arguments than his pre Liberal predecessor about not getting stuck in the past. Well, it is irrelevant that the past can't be changed because it lives on. We receive the past as material and emotional inheritance, whether it be abundance or deprivation. We receive it as a system that continues to meet out disadvantage and advantage by the same formula it always has unless we take steps to change it. You see, this is how systemic racism works. And we do talk about that now as much as we talk about individual acts of racial prejudice, and that, that is a positive development, because it helps us understand that racism is not just seen in explicit acts of abuse or violence. It is also manifest in culture, law and policy. If you don't believe me, have a look around and ask whether this place and many other centres of power in Australia look like today's Australia. You know, it, is, it is a great thing for our Labor caucus to have Pat Dodson, Linda Burney and Mel and Deary McCarthy in it. It deeply enriches us and we welcome those other uh, First Nations uh, members of parliament and senators, Mr Wyatt, Senator Thorpe, Senator Lambie. But alongside representation, the rest of us also need to act. And in this place, in the parliament of Australia, we actually have the means to move the needle. We have the means to help the nation heal. We have the means to tackle systemic intergenerational indigenous disadvantage. So if we don't have the will, what does it say about us? So if you want to sit on the government benches, but you're not going to insist that your cabinet and prime minister do better, then what does it say about you? You see, the national apology was the start. But a government that wants to claim legitimacy in the sweep of this country's history must make sure it is not the end. If you want Australia to succeed as a nation and as a family, we must all have the equal stake in it that Prime Minister Rudd called for, that our Indigenous people have called for. So I again extend Labor's offer to work together to close the gap, to achieve constitutional recognition for voice, treaty and truth. Yeah. Well, I will come to you next, Senator Hanson. If Senator Thorpe, who I gave the call to before, if I, it wasn't her fault, she could not contribute. Senator Thorpe, are you online? If 
Can you hear me? Thank you. And I will come to you next, Senator Hanson. I appreciate your understanding. Senator Thorpe. I'll just hang up on 2020. Uh, <clears throat> I rise to contribute. Thank you, President. I rise to contribute to the anniversary of the apology to stolen generation uh, mob and members out there uh, listening today. Uh, my mother was also co-commissioner with Sir Ronald Wilson at that time uh, and still is affected by the hundreds and hundreds of stories that she sat through at that time of that inquiry. Uh, so the impacts continue and the stealing of children continues today in 2021. Uh, may I remind everybody that a lot has been said about systemic racism in the lead up to and after January 26, particularly in my home state of Victoria. And uh, Senator Wong touched on this briefly in the, the, the fact that this is a system of colonisation. This is a system, systematic racism that continues in our society today. We heard Senator Dodson talk about 20, over 20,000 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care today in 2021. Saying sorry means you don't do it again. Yet the numbers increase and the destruction and desecration of our families and our communities and those parents of those children, that continues in 2021. But few people understand what systemic racism is. It was systemic racism and white supremacy that made the colonisers steal our children, ripping them as babies from their mothers. A.O. Neville, the white supremacist that was one of the architects of the White Australia policy was very clear that the point of this evil policy was to end our people, eradicate First People from these lands and our culture with them. And he said, and I quote, are we going to have one million blacks in the Commonwealth or are we going to merge them into our white community and eventually forget there were any Aborigines in Australia, end quote. Systemic racism or institutional racism is the false idea that white superiority, the idea that white is right, is captured in the everyday thinking of people and how our society operates. Australia is a place that is racist to its very foundations. But funnily enough, there are no racists at all to be found in this country. The same people that re recoil at being called racists are the same ones to not care enough, or at least are happy to accept that our people die almost 10 years before anyone else. And that's okay, because that's just how things are, right? Racism in this country operates and bears down across all of society and is deeply embedded in our laws. And everyone just seems to act as this is fine and normal. That's what systemic racism is. It's the racism that is built into the systems we work and live in. This type of racism is so insidious because it's designed to be invisible. Racism is baked into the system from the white Australia policy, the race powers in the constitution, the fact that our people could not all vote in the country until 1965, despite having bled and died for you in both world wars. Systemic racism is evident in the fact that we were constitutionally barred from being officially counted in the census until 67. This parliament was happy for us to not even count on our own country. That's systemic racism. It's the rusted on racism that is inescapable. 
We have been living with it since the colonisers came to build their prison on our lands and waters. They raped our women and children, they poisoned our water holes and forced us to eat their toxic food. The colonisers chained us, beat us, imprisoned us and tried to eradicate us from our own country for their own profits. They also stole our children. They took our babies. And I just got a message this morning about another baby that's been taken away at the hospital bed before its mother could even uh, begin breastfeeding. Then these colonisers, these foreigners, told us that they were doing this for our own good. And they still do. The vile, racist A.O. Neville said that, and I quote, they have to be protected against themselves, whether they like it or not. They cannot remain as they are. <clears throat> the sore spot requires the application of the surgeon's knife for the good of the patient and probably against the patient's will. What we actually needed protection, was, protection from was colonisation. The colonising governments of this country stole our children. Let's sit with that for a moment. The governments of this country stole our children as an act of genocide. 10% of our children who were born before the 70s were stolen by the governments of this country. Those children were enslaved, raped, abused, set to work and kept separate from their families, their cultures and their country. So many of them are still looking for their families. So many more died not knowing who they came from or where their ancestral homes are. The government of this country ratified the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Article 2 of that convention states that genocide, and I quote, means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such, a killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And we know what um, big mining Gina Reinhardt's father had said about that, that uh, we needed to be sterile and we just need to poison the waterways to make us all sterile forcibly transferring children to, of the group to another group, end quote. They are the definition of genocide. If the governments of this country did to other people in other countries what they did to us, they would be rightly condemned as war criminals. But when our people are under fire from the government of this country, then that's accepted as just, this is how things are here. And that is the systemic racism that is killing us. The survivors of the stolen gen have been pushed to experience the worst outcomes of almost anyone in this country. And we heard Senator Dodson uh, talk about those statistics, not to mention the trauma and ill health people have to live with every single day. As a black woman, there is one emotion I'm not allowed to feel or show in public, and that's anger, or else I'm an angry black woman an uppity black who should just shut her mouth and stay happy with the rations I get. I'm not allowed to be angry despite having plenty of reasons to be. Our people have been pushed to experience the worst social health, education and employment outcomes than anyone else in this country. Our sacred places have been destroyed both both sides of that chamber and we've been our sites have been poisoned and our totems have been killed and continue to be killed today. Our people are the most imprisoned people on earth. Having a constitutionally enshrined voice won't fix that. We have a war on our hands between white Australia and black Australia, and the only thing that will rectify that is a peace treaty to bring peace and to give us seats in parliament, not a voice to parliament. So my heart, my soul, and my condolences to all those who've been affected by the genocidal act 
of stealing our children from our families, our communities and our country. And we will continue to rebuild as this nation's first people. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. This is the National Apology Remembrance. In 2008, the Stolen Generations received a national apology for the wrongs done to them by previous governments. As a nation, we learned a lot when the Bringing Them Home report was released in 1997, and we have continued to learn in the years since. That report revealed the tragedies of many of those children who were often terribly abused, neglected and unloved. The apology affirmed our nation's agreement that we should never accept or condone the removal of children from their families based on race. But today, as I stand in this place, I am deeply saddened by the knowledge that we have much more to be sorry for around our treatment of Indigenous Australians. Unlike many of the most vocal urban Aboriginal activists, I have visited remote Aboriginal communities throughout Queensland, the Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia. I have seen for myself how governments turn a blind eye to at-risk Aboriginal children. I have sat with elders and learned, learned firsthand what they need and what they want to rid their communities of the evils of violence, abuse, alcohol and drugs. And I've seen how children are repeatedly returned to parents who persistently abuse or neglect them, parents who demonstrate a complete inability to deliver the care and attention those children so desperately need. We're talking about abuse and neglect that would make your toes curl. From rampant alcohol and drug abuse, into family and domestic violence, some of the worst you will ever see, the starvation and malnutrition of children, the denial of education because too many Aboriginal parents refuse to send their children to school, and worst of all, prostitution and pedophilia involving reportedly children as young as two. And all this in 21st century Australia, in one of the most economic and socially advanced countries on the planet. And why do governments of today refuse to remove at-risk children from these households? Why are they afraid to treat at-risk Indigenous children the same way they treat non-Indigenous children every day of the week to protect children in any city or town in Australia? Why do they shame us all as a nation by not reaching out effectively and saving the lives and futures of these children and their communities. Like many Australians, I believe both sides of politics are all too afraid of being labelled as creators of a second stolen generation, as false as that accu accusation would be. They lack the courage and will to act in the face of the cancel culture on behalf of these children and the families who desperately cry out for rapid and empowering solutions. So my apology is to today's Indigenous victims, the ones who live with and suffer from the horrors of child molesters, the ones who today, are, we get, as we gather here, are breaking into people's homes to steal food from fridges. Today I'm saying sorry to all the Aboriginal children who should be spending their first few weeks in prep or primary school, but their parents simply don't care enough to get them there. I'm sorry for the children of parents who have told me they feel shamed by their own lack of education and tragically can't support a world where their kids will learn more than them. I'm sorry for the sit-down money. We're paying a growing number of Aboriginal parents who have no inspiration to improve their own lives, let alone their children's, through meaningful employment. I'm also sorry for those Indigenous kids who have never been tucked into bed by loving parents, but are instead ignored by those who are too busy drinking to worry where their kids are late at night. Of course, self-styled Aboriginal elites, like Senator Thorpe, 
would prefer we continue working, as she does, to create permanent victims out of First Nations people. Sorry, I didn't. Senator, Sorry, Senator Waters is on your feet. Senator Hanson, I didn't catch what you said there. Um, I, I'm, I am going to ask. I'll check the hand safe otherwise. Um, I, I just, I, I was no, no, sorry, Senator Waters. I'm, I was, I've taken your point. I'm addressing it with Senator Hanson. I can't remember, couldn't hear exactly what you said, Senator Hanson. I'm going to ask you to reflect on the words you used. If you think they were a reflection upon another senator, rather than criticism of a senator's political activity, I'll ask you to withdraw. I will check the hand side afterwards, if otherwise. I won't be withdrawn. Okay, well, I'll check the hand side. Report. If there's an issue, I'll have to come back to the chamber because I didn't hear the term used, and I won't ask for it to be. Thank repeated you. at this point, in case it is. Senator Hanson, please continue. Senator Thorpe seems to have made it her life's work, at least at present, to enjoy the substantial salary of her position while she works to ensure Indigenous communities remain trapped Senator, by the permanent Senator, evils Senator of Waters, victimhood. Um, I'm going to. This is a. I. I'm listening very carefully. Um, there is a tension between the rules guaranteeing almost absolute free speech in this chamber, the rules on negative reflections on other senators. I'm going to take some advice on the words that have been used here, and I will come back to the chamber. I will also say that there are also standards that don't have to be reflected in rules, as I've often said, that can actually ensure the good nature of debate in this chamber. Um, so, Senator Hanson, I can't, I'm not going to rule that was un, uh, an unparliamentary reflection. I will take advice because I think that was not absolutely clear with my understanding of the standing orders, but I will check the words very carefully. If it assigns a motive or imputes a motive, I will deem it unparliamentary. If it is a criticism of action, then I'm afraid I don't think as a general rule that can be deemed unparliamentary, but I will very carefully review the words. And Senator Hanson, I'm going to ask you to also, from this point forward, consider the rules on reflecting on other senators um, in the remainder of your speech, because we do have stricter rules on reflection on members of senators and members of the House than we do on general comment. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Because without victims, the senator and her green truth-denying colleagues would have no relevance in this place. But I believe with all my heart that we can help create champions out of our Indigenous children, champions who go on to become contributing members of their communities and the broader working Australian society, champions who are proud to be Australian, champions who also insist on improving the health, education and prospects of future generations champions who do not see themselves as victims. But most politicians in this place will only ever run decoy to, real, to the real issues plaguing modern First Nation Australians. We must remain colour blind to ensure the safety and upbringing of all our children, no matter their skin colour or culture. We must show courage and determination to provide the opportunities and pathways that will protect and empower all young Australians. And we must call out the cowardice and the manipulation of the truth-denying elites who seek to keep any group of Australians trapped in permanent victimhood. Yeah. We should behave as the advanced First World Nation we are. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we uh, meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, can I specifically acknowledge uh, Minister White, Senator Dodson, Mrs Burney, Senator McCarthy, Senator Lambie and Senator Thorpe, and primary respects to them and all of Australia's Indigenous uh, Australians on this very important anniversary. Thirteen years ago, the Australian government delivered a national apology to the stolen generation. The then Prime Minister, Prime Minister Rudd, acknowledged and reflected on this blemished chapter of Australia's history. Thirteen years on, we must not forget that because it is important today as it was then and as it always has been. Today is an opportunity as governments to reflect on our national strategies to improve the outcomes for Indigenous Australians through improved policy implementation informed by the voices of Indigenous Australians. 
It's an opportunity as a community and as community representatives to work hand in hand with local champions to promote the world's longest living culture. Painfully, and most importantly, it's a moment to acknowledge the tremendous loss and suffering of First Nations peoples and the, what they have experienced. As the Prime Minister said today, actions of brute force were carried out under claims of good intentions, but in truth betrayed the ignorance of arrogance, knowing better than our Indigenous peoples. Following the national apology came an effort to overcome inequality and shape an Australia where we close the gap between the life expectancy, educational achievements and economic opportunities of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. That challenge continues today. The Prime Minister has made it clear that closing the gap is a whole-of-government priority, and so it should be. We cannot look at these issues with a singular focus or preconceived notions that fail to connect with the realities on the ground. Major changes to systems, to policy and to practice will only be secured when Indigenous leaders and their communities are able to participate and influence over the decisions that affect their lives. This is central to some of the programs and initiatives that exist under my social services portfolio. For the first time, the Closing the Gap Agreement includes targets to reduce the rate of overrepresentation of Indigenous children in out-of-home care. Our goal is to make sure that we reduce that rate, uh, to, to by, rate by 45 per cent by 2031. Right now, there are approximately 20,000 Indigenous children in out-of-home care. By any measure, that is a very distressing figure, and we must address it. So too is the tragic rate of domestic violence in our remote communities. Evidence indicates that Indigenous women and children experience disproportionately high rates of domestic violence. Everybody has the right to be safe in their communities, and that's why it is so essential that we are able to provide specialised family violence services to deliver culturally and age-appropriate family and domestic violence services to children and young people as well as women who are uh, uh, victims of domestic violence. In order to make a long-term difference in the rates of violence against women, we also must change attitudes to violence. And that's why it is very important that we invest in initiatives that work with our First Australians to make sure that, community, working with community elders, that we can promote healthy and respectful relationships. Equally important is, uh, is to affect change um, in relation to the level of educational attainment. The government is committed to supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students to access the best education possible as we continue to work together to close the gap in education. Under the social services portfolio, we continue to fund support to Indigenous children starting their schooling with cognitive development and skills comparable to their peers, improving their chances of completing their education. And so I say I can look forward to continuing to work with all Indigenous leaders and peak organisations in the pursuit of de developing outcome-focused policies that make a real difference to Indigenous people in Australia. These challenges remain. They are big and they are small, but we must continue to work side by side to overcome them. Thank you, Minister. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. The National Apology in 2008 was very much overdue. It was delivered years after every other state and territory issued their apologies. When it was finally delivered in this place, it was an important acknowledgement of the suffering and devastation wrought by past government policy. A policy of forcibly removal and assimilation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander <laughs> children. The national apology was important for healing. But the horrible legacy of those callous policies continues to this day. The harm of being ripped away from family, land and culture passes through generations. An apology was important, but it was only a beginning and not an end. On many fronts, we are still in the process of making amends. We are yet to close the gap on several health and social determinants. And until that is done, the apology remains a symbolic act of unfinished business. There are so many adverse health and welfare ills that disproportionately afflict Indigenous people. For instance, rheumatic heart disease. 
In estimates last year, I asked what is being done nationally about this serious disease. Rheumatic fever and heart disease are rare in Australia unless you're indigenous. Young children living in remote areas are a particular risk. It is absolutely a preventable condition. It is also a condition brought on by poverty, by crowded living conditions and limited medical care. It seems incredible to me that we are battling what is essentially a third world condition in a first world nation. While today we commemorate the national apology, we can't simply mark the occasion in our collective calendars and then move on to business as usual. There are things that we can all do, things that we must do, starting with speaking up against casual racism when we see it and holding those in power to account. I'm confident we will eventually close the gap in attitudes, in services and prospects. I am hopeful that in my lifetime all Indigenous people around Australia will be able to enjoy the same opportunities and life outcomes that many other Australians take for granted. But progress remains way too slow. Good intentions and the symbolism of the national apology are important, but what matters more is the action we take in response. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Seward. I rise to make a short contribution on, on this occasion of marking the, the um, anniversary of the national apology. Far too many First Nations peoples are attending funerals in this country. I attend so many meetings where somebody's giving an apology because they have to be at a funeral. The apology brought such hope, and it was very, very important, but unless we back it up, where are we heading in this country in closing the gap? While so many First Nations peoples are attending funerals for loved ones and friends who have passed away all too soon, while far too many children are still going into care, and in my home state of Western Australia, our appalling record shows the failures in our system. During January, a First Nations mother in a regional town in Western Australia made a very from the heart emotional video about the situation affecting her son. It had to do with the interaction with the justice system, the discriminatory nature of policing, the failures of the justice system the failures to be able to get services for not only her son but for the family, the failure after years of trying of getting support for the family to support her son. This for me was unfortunately a perfect example of what I hear time and time again that the services aren't there, that we haven't backed up the apology with the commitment to the sorts of services and commitment that we need. Why is it that far too many First Nations young people are ending up in care and ending up interaction, interacting with the justice system? And I've got a bit of a list from my home state of Western Australia that talks about just some of the issues that First Nations mothers have raised in conversations when we're trying to look at how to move forward. They point out the fact that Western Australia performs incredibly poorly when it comes to appropriate First Nations child protection services and that other jurisdictions are ahead of us, and particularly overseas. 
that the current structure does not support families trying to support uh, their loved ones, that it does not support reunification from families. And this is actually backed up by the Senate inquiry uh, from a number of years ago into um, out-of-home care, where it was clearly pointed out that the reunification with families is uh, not funded or given a proper attention. That the department does not respond adequately when concerns are raised about the sexualised behaviour of children in care. That it's time for change for legislation for a more therapeutic and restorative justice approach. That no fun not adequate funding is available in Western Australia, including for the Family Matters campaign, and therefore ab advocacy is hampered by not having a clear community voice that politicians can listen to. The family and domestic violence services are not adequately funded, and that this is a national issue, not just a Western Australian issue. The competitive tendering creates dis distrust and undermines collaboration. That the Stronger Families project, which was a positive project, has been abolished. That there are no Aboriginal community services and women's peaks. That the involvement of Aboriginal people in policy making must include lived experience with a high percentage of children in care um, also having a parent or grandparent with stolen, um, from the stolen generations, that this is not adequately given attention to. That there needs to be amendments to the Children and Community Services Act that needs, and we need a human rights approach and human rights framing and co-design with First Nations communities. That the issues around the therapeutic court need to be extended and resourced properly and trialled more in regional areas, and that there needs to be support for children and their parents with complex needs when they're interacting in that situation. And we need to ensure we're supporting kinship care and family care properly. They also talked about the issues caused by intergenerational trauma, the issues around the need for provision of more services and recognition of intergenerational trauma. The need, they talk about the needs for a justice system that meets the needs of First Nations peoples. These are the sorts of things that we still need to address. And we're talking about the anniversary of the apology 13 years later, surely. I shouldn't have to stand in this place and be raising these issues again. First Nations people should not have to be continuing to raise these issues. It's absolutely essential that these issues are addressed. The issues that I've just articulated are issues in my home state of Western Australia, but they occur all over this country. This system is still discriminatory. It is a racist system, and we need to call it for what it is, discriminatory and racist. Our systems are still, our services are still discriminatory. They do not meet the needs of Aboriginal people. So next year, when we're standing in this chamber, talking about the anniversary of the apology. Let's be, more, be able to be more positive that these issues are starting to be addressed. Because if not, in 10 years' time we'll be here again saying the same things. I don't want to see my replacement standing in this chamber having to say the same things in 10 years' time. Senator, what? Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to make a small contribution uh, in this debate as well, uh, because this is a very significant uh, day, recording the 13th anniversary of the apology to the stolen generation. Uh, unlike Senator Dodson, Senator Wong and a number of others, I wasn't in the parliament on the day of the apology being delivered, but I certainly was watching at home, like millions of other Australians. And it didn't, you didn't need to be here to recognise the importance of the apology, the importance of that day, to watch the reaction of 
First Nations people to finally having uh, the truth of the injustice perpetrated upon them recognised by a Prime Minister of this country. Uh, and as other speakers have said, it was a day of healing for our country. It was an important day, and it was really the start of more work that remains ongoing uh, to reach true justice uh, for our First Nations people. Uh, it was also the day that the Closing the Gap statement was launched by then uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. And that was an important act in its own right, to actually commit the Australian government and all of us to targets uh, to once and for all close the unacceptable gap uh, that Indigenous Australians experience on, in so many aspects of their lives. And I noted from the speech given today by the Labor leader, Mr Albanese, that we talk about closing the gap, but that is really a polite way of describing what is really a chasm between the experience of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Uh, just in preparing these remarks, I asked my office to get some statistics uh, on the state of that gap, or more correctly, more correctly that chasm, in my own home state of Queensland. Uh, and some of the most recent figures uh, are that the unemployment rate for First Nations people in my state of Queensland was 20.2 per cent in 2018-19, three times higher that of non-Indigenous Queenslanders. In 2018-19, 50.8 per cent of 15 to 64-year-old 60, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders were employed, compared with 74.1 per cent of non-Indigenous Queenslanders. There remains just a dreadful gap uh, in the life expectancy of our First Peoples compared to the rest of us. Uh, for males, nationally, it remains 7.8 years and 6.8 years for females. And I could go on with statistics about school attendance, about qualifications, about incarceration, uh, and most particularly, as has already been discussed by Senator Dodson and other speakers, the unacceptable level of the removal of First Nations children into state care that continues to go on to this day. And I mean, it's not ironic. I, I, I can't really think of the term to describe us delivering speeches today on the stolen generation when we still have First Nations children being removed from their families at several times the rate uh, of other Australians. Um, and undoubtedly, there are many, many instances where the removal of a child is the correct response to a particular situation. But if we continue to have Indigenous children being removed at several times the rate of non-Indigenous children, we have a problem. There is a deeper problem uh, that needs to be addressed. And it's not just a problem with Indigenous people. It is a problem for all of us. And it is a problem that all of us have a responsibility in trying to fix in cooperation with our First Peoples. Um, one of the things that really brought home to me the level of disadvantage that our First Peoples continue to experience was, a, was a, a trip that I had to Arakoon in Cape York last year. And it really brought home uh, the stark reality of the conditions in which our First Peoples continue to live in, uh, in our country. And like so many of the rest of us, I've read the statistics, I've read the figures on uh, overcrowding in, uh, in housing in Indigenous communities. But possibly to my shame, it wasn't until I actually went to Arakoon and met with families and everywhere I went was hearing about families who were having houses with families of up to 30, even in some cases 40, living in two and three bedroom homes just after we had emerged from the worst of the COVID crisis. So at the very time when all of us have been out there uh, telling people across the country how important it is and was 
to maintain social distancing to preserve our health, at the very same time we were leaving and continue to leave Indigenous families in communities all across our country living in conditions where there is no choice but to have severe overcrowding. And it's worth remembering that we're talking about people who are highly vulnerable because of their very poor health condition. So how is it that at a time when Australia is going through its worst health crisis that we have seen in decades, when we have millions of dollars being spent on advertising campaigns telling people about the importance of social distancing and sanitation, that we at the very same time continue to leave families in communities right across this country in conditions which are third world and which do expose them to greater risk because of the level of overcrowding. And that is despite the fact that we have had commitments from this government to spend millions of dollars to fix Indigenous housing. Well, I can tell you, having been into these communities, that money is not hitting the ground, that housing is not being built, and that is therefore leaving people in overcrowded conditions that, that are a danger to their health, let alone all of the other social harms that arise from that level of overcrowding. Now, unfortunately, that level of neglect uh, and inaction that we see still from this government, just as we saw it 13 years ago when members of this government, who are still in this parliament today, wouldn't even be in the chamber when the apology was being given, that same attitude, unfortunately, is still reflected too often in language that we hear from members of this government, including the Prime Minister. Uh, it is often said by members of this government that addressing the legitimate concerns of our First Peoples creates division within the community. How many times have we heard that when ideas are being put up about how we can actually achieve reconciliation? No, 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 we can't do that because that will divide us. That will create division. And We even saw it this year around Australia Day when the Prime Minister chose to equalise the experience of First Nations people who have gone through literally genocide with others in our country, talking about the First Fleet and the arrival of the First Fleet and not being a flash day for everyone on the First Fleet either. Of course it wasn't a flash day for people in the First Fleet, but to equalise the experience of anyone with a culture who has experienced genocide I think is more than tasteless. It shows a complete lack of understanding of the, ne the ongoing needs and uh, the legitimate desires of our First People. And unfortunately, we continue to see that attitude displayed in the government's policy responses as well. It's not just a matter of the language that is chosen. Uh, we see it with the government rejecting the Uluru Statement from the Heart, rejecting calls for a First Nations voice to this parliament based on a blatant lie that that amounts to a third chamber of the parliament. Uh, it is deeply unfortunate that 13 years on from an apology to, our first, uh, to the stolen generation that we continue to see mistruths being perpetrated by members of this government uh, to discount and avoid delivering on the legitimate aspirations of our First Peoples. Now, we all have a responsibility to listen to Senator Dodson to listen to our other First Nations members of this parliament, to listen to all First Nations people across this country who have been waiting so long to be, to be properly listened to and to have their aspirations uh, achieved. Uh, but I, for one, and I know that everyone on this side of the chamber uh, supports those aspirations, and that's why we so passionately support enshrining a First Nations sure. voice in the Australian Constitution. Senator Brake. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also wanted to start with an acknowledgement of all the Indigenous uh, members and senators in this place uh, that make a terrific contribution Sorry, to say. this parliament. Uh, and I guess the, the thing that comes to my mind is uh, Australia has been a great country uh, and during this year we have seen that we have performed better than most other places on earth. 
but this has not been a good country for Indigenous people. Uh, and of course, this goes back. Uh, you know, the apology was a, a terrific thing, a great gesture. It took too long to be given, uh, but it was uh, part of a rebalancing uh, of our history. Uh, and you go back to the 60s and look at uh, what Stanner said about the Great Australian Silence. And I still think a lot of that is around today, that there is a certain blindness or deafness about uh, some of the, um, the, uh, the, frankly, the misery that exists within this society. Uh, and it is one of the most important issues for us to be thinking about as a parliament. Uh, the issues are complex. Uh, if we had all the solutions, we would have solved the problem some time ago. But it does require people to think about the issues. And uh, I have to say that um, my sense is that um, too few Australians know Indigenous people. Uh, and I think there is a problem of proximity. There's not, not, a, not a lack of care, but there is a lack of proximity. Uh, that has been my observation. Uh, in New South Wales, there are around 300,000 Indigenous people. Uh, I've tried to travel around the state, um, out to Brewarrina, Burke, uh, Kempsey, Nowra. I talk to the people in Redfern quite a lot. Uh, it is a, uh, the issues are, are complex, but the, the closing the gap uh, refresh this year, I think, is a genuine attempt to try and be, uh, to try and, and, and formulate uh, uh, listening uh, into a policy framework rather than, than doing without consultation. And uh, that is, that is uh, let's hope, a significant improvement. Uh, but there is a need for us to, to do more beyond refreshing the Closing the Gap targets. Uh, I mean, the Closing the Gap targets, I think, are, are terribly important because it does speak to this, this disparity. And over the last year, yes, there's been a pandemic, but there's also been uh, significant protests in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement, which uh, people have said to me in Australia, well, that's, that's an important movement that has nothing to do with us here. But if you look at the, if you look at the data, uh, and you look at the comparison uh, on incarceration and you look at the comparison on uh, lifespan, I mean, the issues are more acute in Australia than they are in the United States. Uh, and so the closing the gap targets, uh, closing the gap 2.0, you might, may want to call it, I, I think is, is heavily focused on these bread and butter issues. It is focused on education. It is focused on employment. It is focused on reducing incarceration. And I think that is that is good, and there is much there is much hope uh, that this that, that this closing the gap 2.0 will, will work. Uh, it has to work, and it is very important that the government uh, put the resources into it to make sure that it does work, because that is uh, that is a very important national issue for us to spend our time on. Uh, of course, the other issue that's been spoken about today, uh, and I think there were some very good contributions in the House as well as in the Senate, is around this question of a, of a voice to parliament, uh, which was in the Uluru Statement, but of course uh, was a policy idea that was around before the Uluru Statement was released in 2017. And this is the idea that uh, you would consult Indigenous people on laws and policies which impact them. Now, indigenous people are the only people in Australia that have a whole slew of laws especially made for them. There is no other group in Australian society, no other, no other group which has so many laws on our statute books here. Uh, native title, land rights, heritage protection, uh, indigenous corporations, the list goes on and on. And so the idea that you would have a, a system of consulting people on these special laws I think is a very is a very good idea, and this is something that we are progressing. Uh, this is something that Senator Dodson and uh, Mr. Julian Lisa uh, produced a detailed report in the last Parliament, and we are now following that recommendation to deliver a voice through co-design. And in the last few weeks, the the report from Marsha Langton and Tom Calmer was released for consultation. So that is an important, that, that is an important process of this government. But 
I just wanted to say that I thought that uh, Mr Rudd, I think, did a very good thing for the country. I think this is a, an important thing for us to, to maintain. Uh, I'm very, very mindful uh, that this Closing the Gap 2.0 must work. It is a serious re refashioning of that agenda and it's very important that the resources and the effort is put into that. And beyond that agenda, uh, I think this voice to parliament is something that we should do. It's a good idea, it's a fair idea, uh, and I am personally committed to it. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. So I rise today to talk about Minnie Daly, um, who is on my granddaughter Charlie's side. Uh, Charlie is a direct descendant of Minnie Daly. Minnie Daly um, was born on Sturt Creek Station in the Kimberley. And if you look at the history of Sturt Street, Street, Street Creek Station, you will see that it was part of what's described as the killing times. There were massacres there. We've not got to the bottom of that yet, but certainly that was uh, part of what Minnie's family experienced. At some point in her young life, Minnie Daly was stolen from Sturt Creek Station, taken from her family, from her mother, along with her brother Owen and her sister Peggy. And Minnie spent the rest of her time at the Swan Native and Half Caste Mission in Middle Swan, and she stayed there until uh, she reached uh, the age of 18. So today I was speaking with Nola Gregory. Uh, one of Charlie's grannies, and Nola told me um, that Minnie died in a pauper's grave in Karakata. Now that's shameful. It's absolutely shameful because what we know is that the records of First Nations people in Western Australia under Native Protector Neville are immaculate. So I'm sure it was written in the record books exactly who. Minnie Daly was. But nevertheless, she was buried in a pauper's grave and the family weren't notified. Last year, the family took Minnie and gave her a proper burial in their adopted home of Geraldton. But Nola, despite being fourth generation some 60 years later, tells me that that pain is still real. And it is real and it's passed on and it's real pain for Charlie. When um, Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister, made the apology, I stood on the, la uh, on the lawns outside and I knew that there were women here from Geraldton and Morrowa. Uh, Nola had told me to look out for them and they were wearing T-shirts. One of the things about Nola Gregory is she's an incredibly clever woman. And she writes the most amazing poetry, some of which is, uh, has been published and other poems are about to be published. And uh, her poems are always incredibly meaningful. And so Nola wrote a poem for the apology and those women wore it on their T-shirts, so it was pretty easy for me to track them down and introduce myself. But I asked Nola today if I had permission to read her stolen uh, generation, her recognition of Sorry Day into the parliament, and Nola uh, gave me that permission, so I am going to do that today. This is a poem that Nola Gregory wrote on the 5th of February 2008. In silence you have suffered, your pain locked deep inside. You fought so long for this, and still you kept your pride. The tears of all the mothers for the children they did cry. Their broken hearts are memory, etched in the children's eyes. Born of a strong, proud people, never would you forget the anguish and the burdens. Now your life has been all set. But the yearning was still a part of you. You just didn't feel right. Something here was missing. You knew you had to fight. And fight you did throughout the years, to parliaments, pollies and all. How could you make them listen? Would they heed your heartfelt calls? All you wanted was an apology, not thinking it would take so long. And sorry was just one little word, was asking for this so wrong. 
A flood of overwhelming emotions will be felt on this Memorial Day, and those who have gone before us in spirit will lead the way. The stolen generations will stand with hands on hearts. Today the tears flow freely, and this just only the start. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too want to add my remarks to this uh, debate today in relation to closing the gap on the anniversary of the apology to Australia's stolen generations. And it was a real privilege to be part of the Rudd government at the time that this apology was made. But today I want to turn to things more practical that very much stand in the way of making progress on that promise of, uh, uh, that we made back in 2008. I really want to turn to some of the practical issues that affect First Nations communities, particularly in remote places in Western Australia, and some of the reasons why we simply will not make progress under the Closing the Gap targets if we continue with the lack of commitment and leadership from a Commonwealth government that doesn't want to fund things like municipal services and remote housing. I had the great privilege of visiting remote communities um, just last week. and I was out in the Kimberley. Uh, we've got a state election coming up. The state election does federal enrolments uh, for the, state, uh, 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 the Federal Election Commission does enrolments for the state election. And it is of great consequence and appalling to me, to my mind, that the federal division of Durack is the lowest enrolled um, constituency in the country, which in large part comes down to a lack of servicing for remote Indigenous communities and a lack of commitment to ensuring that all Australians in particular first Australians and the special effort required to enrol and enable participation for people in particular who live in remote places on their own country and for whom English won't just be their second language, it will be their fourth or fifth language with their other languages all being the local indigenous languages and creole that they first and foremost speak. You could see uh, in the communities that I visited, and I, and I want to pay special attention to um, Balgo in the instance of housing, you could see what a difference improvements to the quality of housing had made to the lives of many there. And yet the problem of overcrowding and uh, the deteriorating housing stock for housing that hadn't been upgraded, upgraded is an extreme and continuing issue. In addition, we also see out at Balgo a need for improved water supplies and water security. They desperately need access to uh, renal services in Balgo. I spoke to one elder who was terrified and afraid of the prospect of needing to leave her community, needing to leave the young people there without uh, the cultural leadership that elders like her were currently handing on to young people, because she could see countless examples before her of the elders that have had to leave those communities in order to be able to access renal services. So they've set out to raise some $2 million so that um, Purple House will be able to play a role in, in their community in providing those services. 
but it really does set down to us the challenge that we must make, meet in the delivery of government services. When you see uh, housing, an issue as important as housing, and yet this Commonwealth government has stepped away from an ongoing commitment to remote community housing. They've stepped away for funding critical municipal services, including things like water. Uh, it is very difficult to see how the government's rhetoric in relation to closing the gap can be anything more than that. I visited the community of Mullen and it was delightful to see uh, the terrific work being done by remote um, Indigenous protected area rangers there. They've just rediscovered the night parrot and they're really excited about their traditional custodianship of their lands. A terrific program uh, is Indigenous Rangers that is indeed funded by the Commonwealth Government and yet critical to the sustainability of those programs are the people that are able to work in those programs being able to live in a sustainable community that is properly serviced with clean water and adequate housing and adequate community facilities. And yet, uh, for example, in the community of Balgo, I saw that the um, uh, older women were staying uh, in an aged care context in the women's housing facility that the renal and aged care facility that had been previously been built and set up for future services was not being used at all, and that both in the community of Columbaroo and Balgo, the request for men's shed funding from the Commonwealth Government had been uh, refused and rejected. So today, in making these remarks, I really want to underscore and underline the importance of the participation of First Nations communities in the decisions that affect them. And I really want to commend uh, Senator Dodson uh, and Senator Malandiri for the work that they have done in this regard. In particular, Senator Dodson's ongoing commitment uh, particularly in his role uh, as the Shadow Minister at the time, in ensuring direct representation, uh, in fighting for direct representation for First Nations communities so that they can have oversight and participation in the decisions that affect them. We are yet to see um, the next iteration of the government's voice uh, to government. I look forward to being updated about that. But I have to say the government said that that voice is a voice to government. It's not a voice to parliament. Well, the government cannot stop agencies and people that this parliament calls from giving evidence, lest they want to interfere with the independence of that voice. So on this anniversary, I very much look forward to continuing to work with First Nations communities and ensuring uh, that we continue the fight to have their, uh, the, the gap that is uh, very evident in people's life outcomes in our nation uh, closed and addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. I believe we're going to Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I'd just like to make some very, very brief remarks. It hadn't been my intention to speak on this, but having listened to, I think, you know, the very, very careful and considered contributions of senators, I thought I would make my own. And I'd like to just point to why I think there's opportunity for hope and why a recent event 
should be seen through the lens of greater Australian consciousness around Indigenous matters. And I point to the outrage in regards to the destruction of Jugan Gorge, an outrageous event. But as I have reflected, I think it was the outrage of non-Indigenous Australians that really catapulted that gross event into the public consciousness. And the outrage that many, many Australians felt, not just Indigenous Australians, about that particular event, for me, demonstrates actually that things are changing and things are moving in a more positive direction. When I travel around Western Australia, much of my activity is focused uh, on supporting what I call new Australians and supporting and travelling around rural and regional communities. And what strikes me about new Australians or multicultural communities when they go about celebrating their heritage in our country is the fact that they always begin their events with an acknowledgement to country. When I think about what the future of our country looks like, where new Australians, or those that have come from multicultural communities of longer standing, when they are incorporating into their own events, into their own appreciation of their heritage and appreciation of uh, Indigenous heritage, then I think that can only bode well for the future. And I would add this, that when I travel around to some of the communities that Senator Pratt mentioned, Belgo, for example, or or Roeburn, where I was this week, I actually see there is disappointment, there is concern, but I actually see, and, and I continue to see, an energy, a passion for local communities to find local solutions that work for them. And one in particular that struck me is a night patrol in Halls Creek very, very successful night patrol, which looks after and cares for young children who might be out on the streets late at night. What strikes me about that, on the positive side of the ledger, is the fact that it's a local solution driven by local people. What does frustrate me is how difficult it is to find even the modest amount of public money to support a local initiative like that. And I think this is where the frustration and the concern comes from many Australians. Why is it that sometimes the simplest things that local people have identified as fixing their local issues are the things that are the hardest to get attention to, the hardest to get some public funding for? I think in the Australian community that there's a great sense of disappointment that we have not progressed further towards improving Indigenous disadvantage. But I'm someone who believes that if there's more granularity empowering local communities to take responsible for finding local solutions, I'm someone who believes that if we put more responsibility on local and state governments, I think we'll get better local outcomes. And I'm someone who believes that rather than restricting ideas to just two or three, we should actually be more accustomed, better comfortable with the idea of identifying a broader suite of initiatives, a broader suite of things that together can work to correct and to reverse some of the outrageous disadvantage that we see in our country. So I'm someone that sees clearly the disadvantaged. I'm someone who wants to see more and better action and better outcomes, but I'm also someone, and I encourage others also, to just look around and I think you will find positive signs of an improving consciousness amongst Australians and particularly non-Indigenous -Australian, non Australians, their desire, 
their concern to want to see better outcomes. So I thought I'd just make those observations. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator, McCarthy, uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam uh, Deputy President. Well, this Saturday marked 13 years since Prime Minister Kevin Rudd apologised to Australia's stolen generations. First Nations people waited a long time for that apology, an event which recognised the hurt and pain inflicted on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as a result of government policies and practices which remove children from their families, their country and their culture. This chamber ought to be painfully familiar with the numbers which describe Indigenous disadvantage. As my colleague Senator Dodson pointed out in his remarks earlier, the shocking truth is that, horrifying and unjust as these numbers are, the indicators are worse again for stolen generations their children, their grandchildren and their siblings. A 2019 report from the Healing Foundation sets this out. When compared to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, stolen generations are 50 per cent more likely to be charged by police, 15 per cent more likely to consume alcohol at risky levels and 30 per cent less likely to report being in good health. Of course, the trauma of forced removal and family breakup has enduring consequences for First Nations families, and they are wide-ranging, and they are impacting men and women and children. The mechanisms by which this trauma is transmitted may be complex, but the indicators are straightforward. Three in five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have experienced physical or sexual violence by a male intimate partner. And First Nations women are 32 uh, times more likely to be hospitalised due to a family violence assault and 10 times more likely to die from a violent assault than other women. Last week I spent a couple of days in Bundjalung country in the Northern Rivers talking with workers who support First Nations families. And I spoke to workers in legal centres, in refuges, in housing organisations and in family service organisations. I thank the workers at Bulgama Binyam, Jarjan Preschool, the Northern Rivers Women's Domestic Violence Court Advocacy Service, at Rekindling the Spirit and at Jali, because all of them took time with me to explain their perspective on what it meant for them as First Nations people to work into their community to drive, problem, to drive solutions to the problems that they perceive and to leverage their knowledge of country and culture and family to bring local solutions mm. to local problems. These people were inspiring. And I <laughs> also moving. Uh, some of the stories are very hard to hear. But these people are moving forward, doing everything they can in their communities to lead in their communities, to take on difficult issues. But their optimism, and they are optimists, was tempered by a kind of despair too, because the resources available to these people, the resources available in these communities, these communities blighted by missions and racism and removal and cruelty, the resources for those communities are so limited. Women's Safety in New South Wales found that frontline Aboriginal domestic and family violence specialists, specialist services have reported a significant increase in client numbers since the beginning of COVID-19, including an increase in the complexity of cases before them. Workers in the Northern Rivers told me that what they urgently need is long-term affordable accommodation. But none of the government's Safe Places grants went to the Northern Rivers, despite there being many applicants. And the actual story is that this is forcing women to either stay living with perpetrators or face down homelessness for themselves and their children. These workers are saying so clearly they want to lead. They want to lead in their own communities to heal families, to heal communities, to respond to violence. And they want to be given the power and the resources from government to develop their own solutions. They want to do it their way. One of the first acts of the Morrison government after the 2019 election, after being re-elected, was to cut the funding for the National Family Violence Protection Legal Services Forum. 
It is the only peak body specifically tasked with representing services working to prevent and respond to domestic and family violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It plays an essential role in ensuring that the voices and views of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and children are heard in our national conversation. And the Morrison government should give this forum the sustainable funding that it needs to continue this important work. We cannot continue to ignore the compounding effect that racism and gender inequality have in exacerbating levels of violence, and ending violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women must be a national priority. Every single Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman, man and child deserves to live a life free of violence and fear and thrive secure in their culture and identity. We all have a role to play in closing the gap. But what that really means is listening to, supporting and empowering First Nations communities. In services, that means empowering First Nations to lead in the design and the delivery of the services into their own communities. And it will require us to do things differently, to understand that power might need to be devolved to others, that decisions might be taken elsewhere. It also means listening to First Nations people when they give us some very specific guidance, a very specific invitation about how they want to enact this vision, this vision for their own leadership. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart represents one of the most important of such invitations in a very long time. Labor is committed to implementing the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. We are committed to a constitutionally enshrined voice and a Makarata Commission to oversee agreement and treaty making and a national process of truth telling. First Nations people have told us of the torment of their powerlessness. It is time for us to truly respond. And Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So we'll now move on to the um, placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No. Nope. Oh, Senators, uh, Senator Seward. Leave for a motion for leave, leave of absence. For. Oh, is leave granted? Yes. Um, I, I move that leave of absence be granted for Senator Thorpe um, for the 15th of February for personal reasons. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection. I move Senator. that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for the for personal reasons, Senators Abetz and MacDonald for today and Senator Henderson from the 15th to the 18th of February. Thank you. So the question is that uh, the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? It being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator McCarthy for the 15th to the 18th of February 2021 for personal reasons. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. I don't have a dip, Madam Deputy President, but I understand, according to the read, that Senator Dodson's general business notice number 943 is. Oh, I, we're just going to oh, call the clerk. And, yeah. Um, okay. So no further motions to postpone or rearrange. Um, I'll call the clerk. Postponement notification has been lodged as follows: General Business Notice of Motion 943, standing in the name of Senator Dodson, for today to the 15th of March. So I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and we'll start with general business notice of motion number 978, standing in the name of Senator Dunham and others. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I ask that General Business notice of motion number 978 relating to the Tasmanian Regional Forest Agreement uh, be taken as formal. And in doing so, if I could ask that uh, Senators Ciccone, Urquhart, Billick, Brown, Polly, and Lambie uh, have their names added to the motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dunham. I move the motion standing in my name and the names of Senators Abetz, Askew, Chandler, Colbert, Mackenzie. Chaconi, Urquhart, Billick, Brown, Polly, and Lambie. Uh, Senator Rice? I should leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Rice. Thank you. This motion is delusional. The court clarified what we Greens have known for decades that the law is broken. The court found that regional forest agreements do not have to protect critically endangered wildlife. And the Greens commend the Bob Brown Foundation and the protesters who are putting their bodies on the line to protect our forests and our wildlife. So rather than crowing about a judgment which showed just how broken our laws are, the government should be implementing Professor Graham Samuel's recommendation to immediately reform regional forest agreements. Mm -hmm. Samuels was very clear. His review said environmental considerations under the RFA Act are weaker than those imposed elsewhere and do not align with the assessment of significant impacts on matters of national environmental significance required by the EPBC Act, that Commonwealth oversight of environmental protections is insufficient and that the national environmental standards should be immediately applied and RFAs should be subject to robust Commonwealth oh, oversight. Senator Rice, your here, time has expired. Here. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Thank Roberts. you. One Nation will be supporting this motion. Regional forestry agreements are a federal initiative dating back to 2007. They're designed to provide a high level of protection to old growth and native forests and to endangered fauna and flora. The Tasmanian agreement has been working well with excellent environmental protections and sufficient latitude for loggers to produce beautiful, natural, renewable Tasmanian and Australian timber. The Greens object while sitting in their timber-framed homes on timber floorboards at timber desks and with their computers powered perversely by timber biofuel. The Greens are sitting right now at timber desks on timber chairs made from Tasmanian myrtle. The Greens' idea of forestry protection is to chop trees down and burn them for power. Tasmania wants to mill those trees into beautiful and useful things instead. The Greens do not understand useful things. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 978 standing in the name of Senator Dunningham and others be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. We we'll now move to division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order, lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 978, standing in the name of Senator Dunningham and others, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawett as teller for the noes. Order. There being 25 ayes and 8 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I advise senators there may be further divisions. I'll now go to general business. Notice of motion number 983, standing in the name of Senator Rice and others. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion no, number 983. Actually, no, that's I. That's, yes. Are you seeking to. Um, is there a typo? Beg your pardon, let me just check. So I will start again. Uh, so I now intend to move to general business notice of motion. Number 983, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Beg your pardon, there was a typo that I didn't pick up. Senator Hanson Young. 
Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 983 be taken as formal. And just to uh, make it clear, this motion is being sponsored by Senator Wish Wilson and Senator McKim, Senators Green Senators from Tasmania, and Senator Rice. So, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. The motion. So the. Um, so the question is that Gen Senator Gallagher? Oh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, Labor will not be supporting this motion um, for a couple of reasons. One of them is that uh, we think motions like this, where there is um, uh, a, a range of opinions in this chamber, should be allowed to be uh, should be allowed to be brought in a part of the program that allows for substantive debate. The Greens do this week in, week out, where they bring forward Order. motions where Order. you seek a yes or no answer on a matter which is worthy of substantive debate. Order. You live in your own little perfect world, but the real world, where the rest of us operate, there is a legitimate uh, reason where substantive debate on these matters should be allowed. You do this every time. I look forward to the Greens political party bringing forward a motion where you work with other members in this place to hold these environmental vandals That's to right. account oh. instead of trying to hold wedge Order. motions on us. Thank you. Order. 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 Senator Grip. Uh, Senator Patrick, big pardon. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, uh, Deputy Senator President. President. Um, I ask that uh, the motion be split. I intend to vote differently on A and B. Thank you. So, uh, as you, uh, Senator Patrick indicated, we'll deal with. Um, he wishes the motion to be split, so we'll deal with A first. So the question is that general business notice of motion number nine eight three, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young and others, part A, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. So the question is uh, general business notice of motion number 983 standing in the order standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young and others part A be agreed to the ayes shall move to the right of the chair the noes to the left I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes
Order. There being nine ayes and 32 no noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move uh, Senator Roberts. I'd recommitted, please. I made a mistake. Oh. Um, may I suggest, Senator Roberts, rather than recount, you seek leave to make a short statement, indicating yes, your certainly. vote? Yes, certainly. I seek leave to make a short statement that I— Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. I want it noted that uh, I vote in opposition to, to this uh, section A. To the edge of the environment. Thank you, Senator I'm Roberts. Order. We'll now move to general business notice of motion yep, 983, part B. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 983 part B be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 10 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now move to general business notice of motion number 984, standing in the name of Senator Rice. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 984 relating to Australians stranded overseas before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is that general business notice of motion number nine. 
I'll, I'll do it again because there was some uh, misunderstanding. So leave is granted to amend the motion. Uh, Senator Rice. I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunian. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Over 460,000 Australians have returned to Australia since the government recommended that people reconsider the need to travel abroad on the 13th of March last year, including over 91,000 since 18th of September. Uh, throughout the pandemic, the Australian government has helped over 40,500 Australians return, including over 14,000 people on 104 government-facilitated flights. On the 16th of January, uh, the government announced an additional 20 facilitated commercial flights. This includes five government-facilitated Qantas flights that have arrived in Darwin and Canberra from London, Chennai and Delhi in recent weeks. A further four um, facilitated flights will land in Darwin over the next few weeks from London and Frankfurt, with passengers quarantining at the Centre for National Resilience at Howard Springs. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 984 uh, standing in the name of Senator Rice as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 984 as amended, standing in the name of Senator Rice, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Being uh, 28 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 981, standing in the name of Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 981 about the job seeker payment be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government has extended uh, payment of the coronavirus supplement for a further three months from 1 January 2021 at a cost of $3.2 billion to provide additional temporary support to Australians impacted by the pandemic. The extension of the coronavirus supplement and a range of enhanced eligibility criteria within the social services system complements the $251 billion in direct economic support already committed to by the government and the government's priorities to get Australians back to work. So the question, uh, Senator Roberts. What statement? Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Roberts. Thank you. One Nation will be supporting this motion. It is true that the job seeker COVID supplement was set so high that it provided a disincentive to work. Once the rate reverts next month, job seeker will be too low for unemployed to live on. This will make finding a job harder, not easier. $282 a week is not work incentive, it's punishment. If increasing job seeker temporarily by a ridiculous amount, $550 a week, was good economic policy to assist the re recovery, a much smaller permanent increase must also be good policy. The Morrison government's opposition to an increase in job seeker and pensions makes no sense. It's an embarrassment to conservatives and I urge the government to reconsider. While this motion does not put a figure on the desired increase, one Nation supports a $75 a week increase in job seeker and pensions effective immediately. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 981, standing in the name of Senator Seward, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 980, standing in the name of Senator Griff. That's good. That's good. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. <laughs> And, his as well. and my friends. Um, All your friends. I ask that uh, general business notice of motion number 980 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Thank Griffin. <laughs> I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 980, standing in the name of Senator Griff, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We're now moving to the matter of urgency.
If senators aren't staying for the next part of the debate, please leave the chamber. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 25 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, dear Mr. President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice to, to, that today I propose to move, in quotes, that in the opinion of the Senate, the following matter is of urgency. The urgent need for the Morrison government to announce science-based 2030 targets to protect Australian exporters from overseas carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Is the proposal supported? Uh, I understand Thank you, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Um, thank you. Senator Waters, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I, I move that motion that you just uh, read in. In the last few weeks and months, everything about the global fight on the climate emergency has changed. 2030 targets, net zero commitments, coal and gas exports, and now carbon tariffs. Uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced last week that he wants to use June's G7 meeting to forge an alliance on carbon border adjustment mechanisms. And while this government is trying to secure a free trade agreement with the European Union, the EU ambassador has urged us to embrace, quote, more ambitious and emboldened, end quote, climate policies. Japan, a country that accepts 40 per cent of Australia's LNG exports and over a third of our thermal coal expo exports, is set to make a decision by July on its own carbon border adjustment mechanism. And in the platform that he took to the 2020 election, President Biden said that his administration will, and I quote, impose carbon adjustment fees or quotas on carbon intensive goods from countries that are failing to meet their climate and environmental obligations, and will also condition future trade agreements on partners' commitments to meet their enhanced Paris climate targets, end quote. We already know that this government has turned Australia into a global pariah when it comes to climate action, and that we face the scorn of the international community when it comes uh, to doing our fair share to reduce emissions. Uh, Prime Minister Morrison was refused an invite to the UN Climate Ambition Summit late last year. The former Prime Minister of Tuvalu has said that the Prime Minister's actions at the 2019 Pacific Islands Forum communicated the view that Pacific leaders should, quote, take the money, then shut up about climate change." End quote. This government has spent the last two meetings of the Paris Agreement begging the rest of the world to let Australia cheat on our emissions accounting by using Kyoto-era carryover credits, something that no other country is intending to use. But now it looks like Australia's exporters will have to wear the consequences of this government's go-slow approach as well, and we don't know how far the consequences could go. Maybe there will be tariffs based on the carbon intensity of our goods. And all of the exporters who rely on our dirty coal-based electricity that this government refuses to transition off will get whacked with a big fee. Maybe the tariffs will be general and impact all exporters, which could see even low-carbon exporters hit with tariffs due to this government's inaction. We don't know yet, and given the nature of these global trade agreements, there is every chance that we won't have much of a say. What's so sad about this is that it doesn't need to be this way. We had a price on carbon and it worked. We brought down energy emissions by 12 million tonnes in just the two years before it was repealed, the only time prior to COVID that that's happened in this country. We are blessed with the resources of the sun and the wind. We have the engineering and technical know-how to rapidly transform our economy. But politics, the politics of the big parties and the big coal and gas corporations who pay for their campaigns, continues to get in the way. We have two options available to us. We can continue to double down on our fossil fuel obsession while the rest of the world leaves Australia behind, or 
We can do our fair share to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, adopt science-based 2030 targets and make a proper plan to meet them. There is no other option. You hear from the government that somehow we can close our eyes and wish it all away. Minister Taylor has said that he's dead against carbon tariffs. Well, I'm sorry, Minister, but that's not how it works. You can be dead against them all you like, but if we want to be part of the global community, we can't just unilaterally decide to shirk our responsibility on emissions. That's the choice. A jobs-rich transformation to a low-carbon economy or a poorer, hotter, more dangerous and more insular Australia. This government faces a series of very serious threats over the coming months. President Biden's April climate summit, the G7 meeting in June, the 2021 Pacific Islands Forum, and finally COP26 in Glasgow in November. And while talk of preferably by 2050 might be a balm for those who want to delay action, it is what we do and what we say over the next decade that counts. It is science-based 2030 targets and the next decade that will be debated at the Biden summit and at the G7 and at COP26. The decisions that this government makes over the coming months will set the course not only for the future of the fight on climate change, but the future of Australia's role in the world. The eyes of the world are on us, and if this government fails again, there will be consequences. Senator Can Sorry, Canavan. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, um, look, I think it's, uh, it's great that the Greens have uh, moved this, uh, this motion this evening in the Senate uh, because it once again highlights uh, the, uh, the difficulty that the Greens political party seem to have in conceiving of the concept of democracy. Uh, it's, I thought, a pretty simple system we have here. Uh, a tough system, but a simple one where we have these things called elections in our country every three years for the federal parliament, and there's certain policies put forward by different political parties at those elections. The Australian people choose uh, uh, which of those uh, parties or groups they'd like to rule them, and those policies then are generally, hopefully, implemented. The promises are kept, hopefully, and, and, uh, and passed through uh, this place. But, of course, the Greens don't like what the Australian people have said over the past decade, so now they're hoping, wishing, praying. Uh, trying to get through this place, that we encourage other nations to rule us. <laughs> we encourage other countries uh, to tell us what we should do here in this country and how we should govern ourselves. The Greens want to effectively disenfranchise the Australian people and say, your views are simple, your views uh, are not sophisticated enough, your views don't accord with a globalist agenda that other countries have adopted, so they should be imposed on you regardless of what you vote for or who you support. That is the position of this motion. Because the position of this motion says that we should, we should uh, adopt, and, and Senator Waters just outlined there, adopt carbon taxes, carbon prices very soon, because so we can avoid other countries trying to force us to do something through carbon adjustment border mechanisms or otherwise just tariffs and taxes on us. So, because the Greens haven't been able to convince the Australian people to impose a tax on themselves, they want uh, wishing and hoping other countries impose a tax on this country. I mean, how un-Australian can you get? Uh, whatever your views are on what we should do on climate change, how could you credibly sit there and be wishing and praying other countries to tax Australia? That is what this motion calls for. Anyone who supports it, the Labor Party gets them to support it. They are supporting other countries taxing this country, taxing our jobs, taking away our income and making us poorer as a nation uh, because of it. And let's just go through the record here. Let's just spell out the track record of the last decade in terms of putting forward policies of this na nature, uh, putting forward carbon taxes and carbon prices or whatever you want to call it. There's been lots of names that I'll go through. Let's go through and see what the Australian people decided. Because this did start about a decade ago uh, when then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd adopted a carbon pollution reduction scheme, a CPRS at the time. Uh, and he, he did have it for a while, then it became a bit tough for him. It was the greatest moral challenge of our time, and then it wasn't. But we went to the election in 2010 and the Labor Party they effectively lost, or it was a draw really, and then they had to get the support of some country independents to govern. The Australian people weren't too happy with the CPRS, who Rudd had sort of had got rid of it beforehand. And, and Julia Gillard, Miss Gillard, then stood at that election saying there'll be no carbon tax under a government I leave. The Australian people voted for parties. Neither party had a carbon tax in their policy. 
In fact, the, then the, what, the, the, the leader of the political party that became the Prime Minister explicitly said she would not impose a carbon tax. Anyway, that promise was broken, and uh, the Labor government at the time went against the will of the Australian people, imposed that tax, and it played a big part in the fact they got smashed in the 2013 election and lost on a policy of a carbon tax. Another loss for a carbon tax. In 2016, uh, Mr Mark Butler, uh, on may rest now, he's no longer the shadow climate minister, but Mr Mark Butler took forward an emissions intensity scheme to the 2016 election. Another loss. Labor Party. That was defeated at the 2016 election. The Australian people rejected that too. And then a couple of years ago, in 2019, uh, Mr. Bill Shorten took forward a policy of a 45% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. It was a bit unclear whether it would be through a carbon price, carbon tax, but it was a significantly larger emission reduction that the coalition policy had committed to at Paris. Again, again, rejected by the Australian people. So we're 0 from 4 here. We're 0 from 4. Uh, for a carbon tax or a carbon price over the last decade, yet still we hear the Greens and I don't know, maybe Labor here this afternoon, wishing, hoping and praying that a carbon tax will be imposed on Australian, the Australian people by hook or by crook or however means they can necessary. Now, we should, we should, instead of cheering on other countries, imposing taxes on our own jobs, our own income, our own wealth, our own people, uh, we should be standing up for what we are doing right in this country and the hypocrisy of other nations that would seek to do these things. I think the chances of these border adjustments are very remote, very remote, for the very simple reason that if other countries adopt them, they'd have to apply them to themselves. They'd have to, to be anywhere consistent, they'd have to apply them to themselves. Uh, uh, in, in Europe, where a lot of these calls are coming from, in Europe, 21 of the 27 countries in Europe are not on track to meet their Paris commitment. So what are they going to do? Are they going to impose it on? Are they going to reintroduce tariffs within Europe? Are they going to get rid of the EU if they're applying this policy and it's being applied to, to parties or members who are not meeting their climate change goals? Well, there should be the reimposition of tariffs between and among European countries for those countries that are laggards that are not meeting their targets. In fact, just last week, a French court ruled. A French court ruled that the French government uh, is not meeting its Paris commitments right now. So are they going to apply these taxes to themselves? I don't think they will. I don't think they will. They seem like empty threats. And then you go back to the Kyoto Agreement, which came due last year. The Kyoto Agreement commitments were made in 1997, I believe. I might be getting that date wrong, sometime in the late 1990s. The Kyoto Agreement was finalised. Uh, countries made various commitments to cut their emissions by 2020. A lot of countries didn't meet that target. We did. Australia met our, our commitments and our targets. But Canada didn't meet their targets. New Zealand didn't meet their targets. They're going to impose car carbon adjustment border mechanisms on themselves? How are they going to tax their own products? I don't know how they're going to tariff your own products. Uh, internal tariff would be an interesting thing to impose, but that would be the rationale under this, this scheme. We should be fighting against this hypocrisy and pointing out that that kind of behaviour could not be tolerated at all at any international level. And we should also, if we believe, if we believe in the international rules trading system and believe in free trade, which has come under a lot of pressure in the last 20 years for reasons well outside this debate, uh, if we want to continue to support that, where does this all go? What happens when a country turns around and says, well, we're going to do this if you, if you keep culling your kangaroo herd? We're going to impose a carbon adjustment border mechanism on you. How much more national sovereignty will be, uh, will be impinged based on other countries in threatening or imposing tariffs on another nation? This strikes the heart of the Westphalian uh, uh, national system, that other countries should not be able to dictate the policies of another nation. And, and, and for that reason, I cannot see this particular proposal getting anywhere past first base. It hasn't yet. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of threats, a lot of smoke and mirrors, but really it would completely destroy the, the system of uh, nation state governance and, and cordial relations between ourselves if it was to come into place. Because it goes beyond, well, just climate change if this were to happen. And then finally, I did want to <coughs> um, focus a little bit on the inherent absurdity on a lot of these. Uh, particular proposals uh, to save the planet through global action right now in the current environment. Because I imagine that if these mechanisms were to come into place, uh, you know, if carbon tariffs were to be put into place, they would not just be applied to Australia, they'd have to be applied to other countries too. And I wonder how they're going to be enforced and checked. I wonder how other nations will determine whether a particular country is breaching its commitments and therefore deserves to have a carbon tariff imposed uh, on them. Uh, 
uh, particularly in the context of what we've seen in the past week. In the past week, we've seen international observers from the World Health Organization travel to China, spend months in China, trying to uncover the origins of the coronavirus. They came back empty-handed. They came back empty-handed. Indeed, it's been revealed this week that there are hundreds of samples, blood samples, that China is not sharing uh, with these inspectors, uh, and they have not been able to come to any really worthwhile conclusions about the origins of the coronavirus. Now, apparently, those, of, uh, those in this chamber who are taking this threat of carbon tariffs seriously, apparently, where those health inspectors failed, climate inspectors from, say, the IPCC in the future will have no problems. Uh, enforcing and disciplining countries like China and finding out whether they really are meeting their net zero targets. Does anyone believe this absurdity? Does anyone believe that China is going to allow climate inspectors into its country and determine how many coal-fired power stations it's got going, how much emissions it is producing? No way, no way hell would freeze over before that would happen. So this whole motion is built on a mountain of absurdity. And Senator Waters, at the end of her contribution, mentioned that there are only two options. We either cut our emissions or become subject to all of these tariffs. Well, I would posit a third, a third option where we maybe, maybe just listen to the Australian people. That's, that's another option. Another option is we actually, a radical option, Senator Brockman, a radical option would be that we listen to the Australian people, we let democracy decide what we do in this country, and we make it very clear to other nations that we will not have any truck with other countries that want to impinge on our democratic rights our sovereign and independent rights as a nation decide the policies that are, in, that are imposed on the Australian people. We respect other countries' rights in that regard, and we expect the, expect the same in return. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Call the Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get up and speak on these motions um, drafted by the Greens, but seemingly sometimes I wonder whether um, Senator Canavan drafts them himself and sends them over to the Greens so he can have the opportunity to speak um, uh, about his favourite subject, um, and that is um, all the things the Greens are doing wrong, um, but not actually what the government is doing right. While I don't agree with every aspect of this motion, um, there are parts that I agree with and that we need to discuss in this place. I do agree that policy should be science-based. And that is a real problem for this government. We know that we've uh, recently uh, been dealing with the pandemic and we've had alternative facts from members of this government, um, alternative facts about cures and about processes, about the coronavirus itself, about vaccines. This is a government unable to deal with the members in its caucus, in its government, that can't accept science that rally against science, that see science as something that should be debated. We saw the Deputy Prime Minister in an interview say that uh, sometimes uh, facts are up for debate. But science shouldn't be up for debate when it is so crucial and so important when it comes to public health. And we know that there are members of the government that rally against the science of climate change. And they rally against the science that is about protecting the public health. Climate change is a risk to public health. And this government has members sitting on the other benches over there that uh, sit in, I've sat in committees myself where scientists have been attacked have been derailed, questioned about the science that they are presenting. Uh, and it's extraordinary to witness this sort of behaviour from a government that um, uh, you know, should be uh, applying the best possible science to its policy making. But we know that that doesn't happen. And that's why this government has really struggled, really struggled to make any headway when it comes to climate action, when it comes to dealing with carbon emissions. And it's why we are at a real risk of not getting our health response to this pandemic correct. I do agree with the other part of this uh, motion that this is an urgent matter. And it's urgent because there's not enough certainty for businesses and for workers out there. And it's not, uh, there's not enough urgency about what the plan is around targets. 
and around carbon emissions and around our energy market. Because we know that there are businesses out there that are looking to the government for guidance. They want to make decisions about the future. These businesses aren't making 12-month plans, they're making 10-year plans. And they need to know from this government what are the parameters that they are working with. But unfortunately, we know with the LNP what happens is someone comes up with an idea, then the nationals come over to the joint party room and say, that's not going to happen, we don't want to do that, and everyone gives up and walks away. I do agree with the implicit, uh, the inference in this motion that it would be much better for workers, for jobs, for our trading uh, exporters if members of this government, particularly the nationals, are kept as far away from energy and manufacturing policy as possible. Because all they have managed to do is hold back our regions and our industries. We know in parts of regional Queensland, the parts of our country that members opposite talk about all the time in terms of protecting jobs and, and standing up for the regions, that these are parts of our country that can have a jobs boom when it comes to renewable energy and getting our energy mix right. We have in far north Queensland a real problem when it comes to jobs right now. I've spent a lot of time in this chamber arguing that this government should step in and support tourism operators and they're not doing a job about they're not doing what they should be doing when it comes to supporting tourism operators. But what they also haven't done is, over the last seven years, given a town like Cairns a plan about diversifying the economy. They haven't been able to say where other jobs might be able to come from, because we know there might be another pilot strike, there might be another COVID-19. But for seven years, there has been no diversification of jobs. When it comes to renewable energy, we can create jobs in far north Queensland. We have wind. We have solar and we can create thousands and thousands of jobs if we get the settings right. We've got a fantastic wind farm in far north Queensland. It's called the Mount Emerald Wind Farm and I've visited it recently. Uh, and it's got um, 53 wind turbines. Every single one of those wind turbines was manufactured overseas. And I look at these huge constructions and the workers that uh, take so much pride in maintaining that facility, but I, I, it's a real mi miss and it's a real missed opportunity that we haven't been able to manufacture those wind turbines right here in Australia. So when we're talking about targets and we're talking about plans, we're talking about the government walking away from net zero emissions at 2050, this is what we're talking about on this side of the chamber. It's the jobs that are going missing. It's the businesses that don't have certainty. It's the businesses that are crying out for cheaper energy prices so they can manufacture things like wind turbines, so we can build trains in regional Queensland, so we can build and maintain ships in regional Queensland, but they can't do it if they don't know what the energy setting policies will be over the next 5, 10, 15 years. We ask these businesses, these fantastic family and local businesses, to make long-term investments in our regions. But without knowing what the policy settings will be, they're unable to do that. And the Morrison government has repeatedly refused to commit to a target of net zero emissions by 2050, declaring that the government's plan is to achieve net zero emissions in the second half of the century. And you really have to wonder why they're unable to commit to this target alone. Well, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, and members of the National Party have made it clear that the reason that they don't want to commit to a 2050 target is that they won't be in Parliament in 2050. It's that sort of short-sightedness that really irks members of the public in regional Queensland. It's that sort of short-sightedness that has led to uh, a situation where we don't have diversification of our economy in regional Queensland. Renewable jobs could boom 
by 44,000 jobs by 2025. But only with the right policy support energy, in renewable energy could employ as many as 40,000 Australian workers, an almost doubling of the 25,000 workers that work in the sector right now. But only with the right policy settings, only with the commitment from this government and only with the establishment of a robust and secure workforce. In far north Queensland, we know that when it comes to science and saving jobs, taking action on climate change, there's no better example of what's at risk than the impact on the Great Barrier Reef. And right now, we are uh, um, trying to support businesses that are have their hearts breaking at the moment. Like I, in the last couple of days, last week or so, I've spoken to tourism operators that are really, really struggling. And they are really struggling because this government has shown complete lack of concern over their businesses. Grown men are crying, They're, their hearts are breaking because they just uh, know that their um, businesses are at real risk if this government isn't able to support them. But the risk going forward through the pandemic is that we don't get our climate action settings right and the impacts on the Great Barrier Reef are irreversible. Because without flights coming into Cairns right now from the international visitors, our tourism businesses are struggling. But if there's no reef to visit, then those planes will stop forever. They will stop forever. And we need to back in these businesses and these local jobs. And the only way to do that is with giving some certainty around targets. Thank you, Senator Green. I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I welcome the opportunity to talk about energy security and energy affordability. The European Union has threatened to impose a tariff on our exports to punish Australians for not having destroyed as much of our economy as the Europeans have destroyed of theirs with ruinous renewable energy. At the same time the, UN, the EU, EU is in the grip of record cold, solar panels over there are covered in snow and windmills are frozen solid. Germany, the home of the Greens, has just opened a new heli coal plant, Datteln 4, which has 1,100 megawatts of reliable baseload coal power which is proving the difference between keeping the lights on and sitting in the cold and the dark. Heating and cooling are not optional to the elderly and the infirm. They are essential. Energy security and energy affordability. The welfare of Australians must be our foremost consideration in energy policy. Yet in Australia, the Greens insist on pursuing a strategy that will cr create a hostile energy environment. The old parties, Liberal, Labor and the Nationals have joined in. In Western Australia, the Liberal Nationals have announced a plan to close their coal power plants by 2025, four years' time. The New South Wales Liberal Nationals are closing Liddell coal power plant in 2023. ALP policy. Well, you know, they want to shut down half of our coal-fired power by 2030. At least I think that's right. The ALP policy changes depending on, on who's telling the story and where they're telling the story. Every major party has the same policy, to close our baseload power plants without first building replacements. One Nation is the only party with an energy plan that will provide for Australia's energy security now and in the future. We will build a 2,000 megawatt hydro plant near Townsville and micro hydro across the grid. One Nation will build high efficiency, low emission heli coal plants in the Hunter and at Collinsville in Queensland. One Nation's plan will bring back manufacturing and jobs, deliver employment security and higher wages, in short, a better standard of living for all Australians. I'll say it again. One Nation is the only party of energy security and energy affordability. I want to mention a phrase that used in the Greens' notice, motion, science-based 2030 energy policy. Senator Ian Macdonald in 2016 in December said that the science has never been debated in this parliament, never. 
until Senator Roberts raised it. And I can still say it's never been debated, because no one will debate it. It's been 515 days now since I, last challenged, since I first challenged in the Senate the Greens leader, Larissa Waters, Senator Waters and Senator Di Natale at the time, to a debate on the empirical scientific evidence for their claim and on the corruption of climate science. Not once have they provided that evidence. Not once have they accepted a debate. It's ten years, over ten years now, nearly ten and a half years, since I first challenged Senator Waters at a debate at the powerhouse in New Farm on Thursday, the 7th of October 2010. And Senator Canavan talks about nationals' policy. They went to the last election with a policy for coal, and every policy since has said nothing of coal. Only one nation is the, power, is the party of energy security and energy affordability. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, another day, another motion of urgency from the Greens, where it's all about ruining Australian business, ruining jobs, and all about virtue signalling. Well, it's clear to all senators, I believe, and to all Australians that the Greens are not a party of action. They are not a party of government. They are a party of protest and a party that relies solely on selling fear, knowing that they will never, ever have to come up with a plan that works. And this motion today shows exactly that. This motion is not about the Greens providing suggestions on how the Morrison government can achieve zero emissions. They are solely suggesting the Morrison government makes virtue signalling announcements. This government that I'm a part of is focused on results, not hollow promises. All this motion does today is encourage foreign countries to impose tariffs and taxes on Australian business with the likely effect of destroying Australian jobs, Australian industries and Australian families. The actions of the Greens today in providing cover and support for foreign countries to apply tariffs on Australian products is despicable. The Greens should be ashamed of themselves. Because, Madam Acting Deputy President, what do the Greens get out of putting forward a motion such as this? Maybe a headline, maybe a social media post, a tweet, and providing cover for foreign, tax, foreign countries to tax Australian businesses. What is really disappointing about this motion is that the Greens know full well that the Australian government is taking real action to reduce our emissions. We have set targets, we smashed Kyoto, and we are on our way to meeting and beating our Paris obligations. What we know for certain is that it's outcomes that matter, actions and outcomes. The Morrison government is taking real, and practical and pragmatic action and delivering real outcomes. As a result of the actions we are taking, we are delivering lower emissions while protecting our economy, jobs and investment. We have strong targets, an enviable track record and a clear plan. Our plan is driven by technology and not taxes, and, mostly, and most importantly, our plan is working. While ambition is important, achievement and outcomes are what matters. So let's talk about our achievements. As I said before, we've smashed our Kyoto targets by 450 million tonnes. Australia's emissions have fallen faster than the G20 average, faster than the OECD, OECD average, and much much faster than similar developed economies like Canada and New Zealand. Between 2005 and 2018, our emissions fell by more than 13 per cent. New Zealand's reductions, on the other hand, barely budged. Canada's fell by less than 1 per cent. The G20 actually increased emissions across those countries. The latest figures have us at nearly 17 per cent below 2005 levels, which shows we are on track to meet and beat our 2030 target, which, we, which is currently to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels. Furthermore, on a per-person basis, our 2030 target is more ambitious than Norway, Canada, Germany, New Zealand or France. So let's not forget, Madam De Acting Deputy President, this is not a ceiling uh, on, um, on our ambitions. It's a flaw. We will go beyond these. As we did with the Kyoto targets, the Morrison government wants to not only meet our 2030 targets, but also to beat them. The latest emissions projections 
published in December 2020, showed that we are on track to do exactly that. All Australians should be proud of our achievements. Unlike the plans from those opposite, we have achieved this without increasing taxes. We are committed to the principle of technology-driven emissions reduction, not taxes. As the Prime Minister has said, we want to get to net zero emissions as soon as possible. However, we will not sacrifice jobs and industries across Australia, particularly in our regional areas, for virtually no global emissions benefit. Instead of focusing on virtue signalling like the Greens are, the Morrison government is focused on how we will do that. We are focused on assisting to develop technological breakthroughs that we will need to make net zero emissions a reality. By focusing on technology, not only will Australia reduce our emissions, but we will also help reduce the emissions right across the world. As I have repeatedly said in this place, actions and outcomes are what matter, and our track record is one that all Australians can be proud of. So I repeat again. We beat our 2020 target by 459 million tonnes. Recently updated forecasts show Australia is on track to meet and beat its 2030 Paris target. Over the last two years, our position against our 2030 target has improved by 639 million tonnes. Again, 639 million tonnes. This is the equivalent of taking all of Australia's 14.7 million cars off the road for 15 years. Between 2005 and 2018, our emissions fell faster than Canada, New Zealand, Japan, the United States and against the OECD average. Emissions in the national electricity market have fallen to their lowest level since records began. In the last 12 months, our emissions are down by 5% with record levels of investment in renewables continuing. In 2020, a record 7 gigawatts of new renewable capacity was installed in Australia. That's more renewables in injected into the Australian market in a single year under the Morrison Liberal government than under the whole previous Labor government. Compared to the rest of the world, Australia now has the highest am total amount of solar PV capacity installed per person. We have the most wind and solar per person of any country outside of Europe. Today, Australia, Australia's emissions are lower than in any other year under the previous Labor government. However, Madam Acting Deputy President, despite the great success that the Morrison government has already had in this space, we have the Greens coming into this place and encouraging foreign countries to tax Australian businesses. Now, even by this is even a new low, even by the abysmal standards of the Greens. But while the, but while the Morrison government has seen great achievements in this space, we are not resting on our laurels. We have a clear plan to keep this momentum going. To do this, we have developed Australia's technology investment roadmap, and our commitment is clear: lower prices, keeping the lights on, and all while doing our bit to reduce global emissions without wrecking the economy. Advancing the next generation of low emission technologies is crucial to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. Why, you might ask? Because the technologies to get us to net zero don't currently exist. Our technology investment roadmap will accelerate technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, soil carbon measurement, low carbon materials like steel and aluminium, and long-duration energy storage. Widespread global deployment of those technologies will reduce emissions or eliminate them in sectors responsible for 90 per cent of the world's emissions. This is approximately 45 billion tonnes. It's about setting practical goals for the technologies that offer the most abatement potential for the least cost, and that is where Australia has real advantage. That is real ambition focusing on the big picture and on the long game rather than political point scoring, news headline capturing that we see time and time again from the Greens. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of this urgency motion. 
And in doing so, I have a revolution to make to those opposite. It might shock them. Some may be horrified and they'll rush away to check their diaries. It's not a revelation to the rest of us. We know the date. We know what year it is. But for those op opposite, I feel I need to inform that it is 2021. One more year has slipped away. One more year of the Morrison government's inaction on climate change and carbon emissions. One more year, one more lost opportunity. One more year in a run of many years through three Liberal Party prime ministers, yes, three, that have done nothing to curb our country's emissions. One more year of coalition infighting. One more year of denialism. One more year of failure when it comes to meeting our international obligations, when it comes to the future of our planet and our way of life, of failing in our moral obligations as global citizens. The European Union plans to introduce a carbon border tax, which will require Australian exporters to pay a levy based on the amount of carbon used in making and shipping their products. The levy on exporters would equal the cost, of, the cost European producers face through having to buy carbon emission permits via the EU's emissions trading system. The world has moved on without us, and sadly we are left behind. We are no longer at the table. We are no longer even invited to the meetings. And now the Morrison government's smug denialism, the parochial dog whistling and short-term political manoeuvres, its win-at-all-costs mentality, but most of all, its absolute lack of vision and leadership have doubled back to bite us and to potentially savage our exporters. Suddenly the cold hard truth, the cost of doing nothing, has reared up in the Morrison government's face. And suddenly the cost of doing nothing in 2021 is very, very real. The European Parliament's decision gives initial backing to the EU's carbon border levy, levy and Brussels is now walk, working towards the US President Joe Biden's emission-busting goal of a global, global climate club. That's a club that we won't be able to join, not under this government anyway, not under the Morrison government. European politicians and, and analysis expect the US, Britain, and potentially even China to get behind the plan to jointly adopt carbon border taxes. And our exporters are now at serious risk because the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, and his science-denying cronies are frozen to the spot and living in the last century. On top of that, the EU is also insisting on stronger climate targets as a condition of the free trade agreement that it is negotiating with Australia. I call on the Trade Minister, Mr Dantian, to publicly explain how the Morrison government's climate inaction will affect the proposed free trade agreement with the European Union. He needs to come and tell us how is that going to affect that proposed free trade agreement with the European Union. I call on him to explain to the farmers, to the foresters, to the fishers, the miners, the manufacturers, the innovators and the investors of Australia, the cost of doing nothing. Let them hold him to account, particularly when we know that many of Australia's largest exporters support the net zero target because they understand Australia can become a clean energy superpower, leading to stronger economic growth and more jobs. More than 120 countries worldwide have adopted a net zero emissions target, with more, and more than 70 per cent of Australia's two-way trade is now with countries moving to net zero by the middle of the century. Yes, this century, just 29 years away. And yet, with all this hanging over our heads, Mr Morrison has said, I am not concerned about our future exports. Well, I am, Mr Morrison, and so is the Australian Labor Party and a lot of Australians. And just a few days ago, the Nationals leader, Mr Michael McCormack, said that he was not worried about what might happen in 30 years' time. 
Well, it's 29 years now, Mr McCormick. He doesn't, clearly doesn't know that it's now 2021. And absurdly, the Energy Minister, Angus Taylor, decided that Australia was dead against carbon tariffs and was somehow try trying to twist the EU proposal as protectionism, when, as noted by Laura Tingle in the Financial Review, and I'll quote, in fact, fact, these tariffs would aim to level the playing field for local industries against free rider countries such as Australia that won't engage in real climate policy action. This government is in a state of climate and energy policy chaos, which we can now clearly see will lead to dwindling opportunities for our exporters. And those exporters are rightly and extremely worried about future exports. Of course they are. Their jobs rely on thinking ahead, and they've been doing it for years, for many years. And to also to mention the many, many workers that they employ in this country. They completely understand that this is the year 2021, and it is past time for genuine leadership and action from this Australian government, the Morrison government. Net zero emissions by 2050 is a target backed by every state and territory in Australia. Key business groups, the National Farmers Federation, Big resources, uh, big resource companies, our biggest airline, our biggest bank, and countless experts and scientists. Mr Tian must now explain how the government's failure to adopt a target of net zero emissions by 2050 will affect Australian exports and jeopardise Australia's free trade agreement ne negotiations with the EU. Maybe now. Now that there is a tangible financial cost to doing nothing, now that the cost of inertia and irresponsibility will hit the government's hip pocket and the hip pockets of some of the big businesses who support them, maybe now the Prime Minister, Minister, Prime Minister Morrison, will call the climate-denying rabble in his government to order and show some leadership. It's about time. Australia needs to adopt a target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050, but we need to start that process now. We need it legislated. In 2021, that is blindingly obvious. We have known about this for a very long time. It is also blindingly obvious that the Morrison government has its head in the sand about carbon borders and our exporters, with the jobs that they create because they are the ones that will pay the price. It is the exporters that provide the thousands of jobs around this country that will pay the price for the inaction of this government in relation to climate change. And this government, caught in a loop of smug inertia, should pay the ultimate price at the ballot box at the next election for their inaction and the effects that that inaction on car uh, uh, reducing Australia's carbon emissions will have on the Australian community. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It might surprise you, but over Christmas I read uh, Malcolm Turnbull's uh, memoirs, and he, he very clearly labelled up uh, Senator Canavan as one of the, as he calls it, terrorists within his own party, the, the culture warriors who did so much to derail climate action in this country and blow up uh, any, any agenda uh, for climate action uh, in the last five years. And uh, it's the contribution from Senator Ganavan tonight. Uh, it's very clear that uh, nothing, nothing has changed. Interestingly, Malcolm Turnbull also says that the right wing within his own party, the culture warriors, are also socialists. And I, I would have to con con I would have to agree with him, based on what I've heard tonight, Acting Deputy President, uh, a national senator rallying against free trade deals. That's what we heard in here, a tirade of anti-free trade, uh, anti-farmer uh, abuse from Senator Canavan. Well, perhaps in some senses his concerns around free trade deals are very much in line with the Greens. So there you go, Senator Canavan. That's something I think we could all agree on. But clearly he's failed. 
to stop even his own Prime Minister putting into place a, a so-called uh, 2050 climate ambition target. Um, but two days or oh, a day after that was announced, Acting Deputy President, uh, we get uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce in the other place and the Deputy Prime Minister in this country. When asked about the Prime Minister's new found 2050 ambition, which by the way has only come because a new US administration has decided to show some global leadership and he's looking for some kind of face saving gesture, uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce and the Acting Deputy Prime Minister go, uh, 2050? I'm, I'm not going to be here in Parliament then. Uh, none of us are. In fact, I'll probably be dead. That's how serious uh, the Nationals are taking this issue. That's how short-sighted they are on this most important of issues. And when you look at uh, putting out climate targets for another 30 years, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's a complete joke. You'd also be forgiven for not trusting this mob, Acting Deputy President. In the last eight years since they've assumed power in this country, they have literally torn up every existing climate policy every existing climate policy that was put in place. A carbon price, a clean energy package, they've ramped up fossil fuel exploration, especially during COVID, whilst not providing a single credible policy to tackle global warming. And it's worth highlighting that Australia has, within this past decade, gone from being a global leader on climate action to a global embarrassment. And it's been particularly astounding this week to watch Senator Canavan and the other Nats roll out and call for agriculture to be excluded from any 2050 climate ambition. And it's particularly galling because there, are, there is no other industry more vulnerable to climate change than agriculture. There is no other industry more vulnerable. The Bureau of Meteorology told us at Senate estimates recently that even on existing emissions trajectories, a business as usual scenario, we are looking at three to four degrees warming globally by the end of this century. Think about that. Record heat, drought, extreme weather, fire that we have seen in recent years is going to get much, much worse. And a public rebuke, a public rebuke for the LNP by some of their key Stakeholders, the National Farmers Federation, they don't want agriculture excluded from 2050 climate ambition. They believe the farming community in this country has an important contribution to make. And it's not just the National Farmers Federation. The national position of climate is at odds with various agricultural bodies. Meat and Livestock Australia, Farmers for Climate Action, Meat and Livestock Australia, who are potentially facing a carbon tariff, has an industry target to be carbon neutral by not 2050 but 2030. And Farmers for Climate Action also support an economy-wide target of 2050. So clearly farmers groups think this is really important. Yet the farmers' friends, the National Party, continue to come into this place and deny climate, deny climate action and turn their back on rural and regional agricultural communities in this country. Now, the reality of this situation is, whether we like it or not, and it's not just Europe in our free trade negotiations with Europe that has said that they planned to put in place a carbon tariff. President Biden went to the last election promising this is something the US would look at. And we know there are negotiations between the UK, the EU, and at G7 meetings to talk about carbon border adjustments, whether we like it or not. Even Japan, our biggest customer of coal and gas, is looking at making a decision in July. Farmers should be benefiting from a carbon price in these countries, Acting Deputy President. If this government hadn't come in here and ripped up the carbon tax, if this government hadn't come in here and ripped up a price on carbon, if this government hadn't come in here and ripped up the carbon farming initiative, where Australian farmers get to sell their carbon abatement credits into export markets 
for example, in Europe, they'd be getting $50 a tonne for their carbon abatement credits. Now, industries like Meat and Livestock Australia and other farmers and agricultural industries are facing a $50 a tonne tariff. We estimate that since this government ripped up the carbon farming initiative and brought in their emissions reduction fund, which has been almost a complete failure, Australian farmers have lost out to the tune of $12 billion on this lucrative market of carbon trading, purely because of the ideology of a few terrorists within the Liberal Party using the words of Malcolm Turnbull, like Senator Canavan and others in this place. They've held this country to ransom, and farmers and agricultural rural and regional Australia are paying, and they're paying in so many ways. These, there has to be incentives for our farmers to be involved in climate action. That is what we're talking about here, bringing all our country with us, bringing the whole nation with us to actually put in place not just 2050 targets but 2030 targets based on science. Unless we have 2030 targets, we will never achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Do not trust this mob. They have done everything to avoid even talking about climate change in the last 10 years. Do not trust them on their track record. Without the Greens in parliament to hold them to account, we will get nothing. There needs to be a political pathway for change. You need to vote Greens. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. I want to conclude this debate by returning to the core issue of the topic at hand, and that's the need for science-based targets. Because political reality must be grounded in physical reality, or it's completely useless. That statement by climate scientist Professor Hans Schulenhuber was the starting point for a presentation a fortnight ago by climate policy researcher David Spratt at a public forum organised by the National Climate Emergency Summit. The Greens' target for 2030 is at least 75 per cent reductions in carbon pollution by 2030 and zero carbon no later than 2035, because that is what the science tells us will give us any hope of stabilising our climate below one and a half degrees of heating above pre-industrial temperature. David Spratt argues that we need to go even faster, that we need zero emissions at emergency speed by 2030. 2020 was the equal hottest year on record, and the planet is now 1.2 degrees hotter than it was 200 years ago. And frightening, frightening, frighteningly, Regardless of what we do in the next nine years, we are likely to be at one and a half degrees hotter in 2030 because that heating is already baked in. Yet one and a half degrees hotter is not safe. Already at 1.2 degrees hotter, climate tipping points have almost certainly already been passed for coral reefs, for Arctic sea ice and the West Antarctic glaciers. And the Amazon rainforest may have passed its tipping point, and there's strong evidence that at or around one and a half degrees hotter, the Greenland ice sheet will reach its tipping point. And as for two degrees hotter, that's very unsafe, because hothouse earth tipping points may be reached at that point, where feedback loops mean the earth just keeps on getting hotter, regardless of what we do to try and pull it back. Yet the targets of the government and the Labor Party are consistent with a catastrophic three to five degrees of warming by 2100 within the lifetime of children alive today. David Spratt quoted from a seminal paper on climate tipping points that the evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we're in a state of planetary emergency. Both the risk and the urgency of the situation are acute. If damaging tipping cascades can occur and a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this is an existential threat to civilisation. And he went on to outline how, in addition to slashing our carbon pollution, we're going to need large-scale drawdown of carbon and a safe means of immediate cooling to protect people and nature from the catastrophic impacts of our climate crisis. In the light of this, the least that the Senate can do today is to support this motion to adopt science-based 2030 targets. Thank you, Senator Rice. The question is, is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. 
I think the ayes have it. We will now proceed to we will now proceed to the consideration of documents. The, uh, the documents are listed on page four of the notice paper. Any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Documents not called on today will remain on the notice paper. There being no objection, it is so ordered. Documents. Um, Civil Aviation Safety Authority, Crimes Act 1914, Department of Defence Special Purpose Flights, Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, Local Government Financial Assistance Act, Act 1995, and others, My Health Records Act 2012, Review of the Operation of the Act, Telecommunications Inceptions and Access Act 1979, and, now, and responses to Senate resolutions, Australian Broadcasting Corporation and the New Daily, restrictions on social gathering. Are there any ministerial statements? No, there being no ministerial statements. Committee member, we will proceed to committee memberships. The president has received a letter requesting a change in the membership of a committee. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. That, mo that motion agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. No, the ayes have it. Uh, messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Response Number no. 2 Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is, is that the bill be now read a first time? All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law in relation to the financial sector and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. Clark. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the intervening business be postponed until after consideration of the Export Control Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020. The, the question is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day No. 3, Export Control Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020, uh, resumption of second reading debate. Uh, uh, Senator Ciccone. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I just want to draw your attention to the state of the chamber. A quorum not present. Ring the bells.
Uh, we'll just wait till Senator Stirl takes his position. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this bill amends the Export Control Act and is designed to support the implementation of the new export control framework. The amendment seeks to clarify the circumstances where a fit and proper person test is required for an application to vary registration of an establishment or to approve an alteration of an establishment. The amendment also expands the discretion of the Secretary with respect to export permits. There is no doubt that Australia's previous legislative framework for agriculture production and certification of exports was overly complex. In fact, there were 17 acts. However, farmers and this parliament must remember that the act we are seeking to amend here today was initially introduced to the House on the 17th, I'm sorry, on the 7th of December 2017, but lapsed. The act did not pass until March of 2020. The failure to prioritise reforming the agriculture export framework is indicative of this government's attitude towards farmers. They claim they are the government for farmers, but they are leaving our primary producers behind. Labor is glad that the government has finally decided to take steps to assist farmers with gaining and maintaining access to markets. However, Madam Deputy President, farmers have been waiting for seven years for this government to do something for them. The minister has claimed that the new export framework is designed to ensure that Australia has appropriate regulatory settings to enable exports to grow and help drive productivity and increase returns at the farm gate. But if the minister really cared about supporting the growth of agricultural exports and increasing productivity, he would not have abandoned farmers during this pandemic or waited three years to deliver this for want of a better word, better framework. Regional communities and our farmers have experienced extreme droughts, they've experienced floods, they've experienced bushfires and now a global pandemic. And if, it, if that wasn't all the, uh, enough, Australian agriculture's most high volume and value market is under serious threat. Australian agricultural producers and exporters must be wondering, where are these new markets that Mr Little Proud promised? The answer, Mr Littleproud doesn't know because he hasn't put in the work. After three years of failing to legislate this new framework, it is not good enough that when faced with the loss of high volume and high value markets, Mr Littleproud wiped his hands clean of the issue and told producers it wasn't his problem. To add insult to, industry, uh, in, in, to injury, despite the myriad of challenges facing the agriculture sector, all this minister has to offer to deliver a $100 billion agriculture sector is a few dot points on a page. Farmers need and deserve more than a few dot points on a media release and obfuscation of responsibility. Farmers need the Liberal National Government to actually deliver outcomes, not just say they will. Now, Mr Littleproud has been absent throughout this pandemic. He has refused to work with states to deliver agriculture workers the sector so desperately needs. All this minister has managed to do is pull together a workers' code that couldn't pass muster with chief health officers and then blame the states when it didn't work. Madam Acting Deputy President, talk is extraordinarily cheap and our farmers are suffering. Farmers deserve a government that will prioritise legislation designed to support the sector's growth. Labor supports growing agriculture to $100 billion by 2030, but we need a comprehensive plan to get there. A few dot points on a media release simply isn't good enough. Thank you, thank you. Senator Steele. Senator Steele, John. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise in the metaphorical sense this evening to, uh, to make some contributions in relation to the Export Control Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill of 2020. Um, the bill makes amendments to the Export Control Act of 2020 uh, and seeks uh, to do a couple of different things. Um, to clarify the operation and fit um, proper persons test when verifying the registration 
of export establishments, uh, provide greater flexibility in the requirements uh, for lodging and notice of intention uh, to export, enable uh, the rules relevant to provide guidance in relation uh, to the approval of export permits, um, enable the rules uh, to modify the provisions of the Act and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975 in relation to the review of the uh, tariff quota certificate decisions uh, and provide uh, that the rules may incorporate matters contained in agreements between Australia and other countries that relate to tariff rate quotas. Uh, now, the Greens have a, a couple of uh, serious concerns uh, with the bill. Uh, while this bill uh, claims to make minor, uh, largely technical amendments, uh, the provisions which allow for changes to the 2020 Act uh, and the AAT Act are actually quite significant in nature. The function of these provisions uh, is to limit uh, the scope of the types of decisions that the AAT uh, can make when reviewing tariff quota that is to say, TRQ uh, certificates. Uh, we are primarily concerned that the implication of narrowing the resource, recourse for exporters uh, to challenge the outcome of, of a review on their TRQ certificates. The aspect we are uh, least comfortable with uh, is the fact that this bill is seeking to constrain uh, the types of decisions uh, that both require the AAT and the Department Secretary uh, that they can make and uh, are reviewable in relation to TRQ uh, certificates. They will not be able to make decisions uh, on TRQ certificates where Australia has reached its tariff uh, rate quota for any particular goods. The implication we fear, uh, the implications we fear are that in the context of this bill uh, being uh, one that is primarily concerned with agricultural exports uh, and exporters, smaller, less powerful, uh, less connected agricultural exporters uh, risk being locked out of accessing and appealing TRQ certificate decisions where bigger exporters have been able to get access to them first. In principle, uh, limiting the recourse for decisions made by government departments where the department is empowered to make decisions on whether one private company can earn money over another is of significant concern. As stated by the Minister in response to the Senate scrutiny of Bill's report, uh, and I quote, it is proposed that under section 386 of the Act, as amended by the Bill, uh, will be made in the equivalent terms of the current export control tariff weight quota order of 2019, which prevents a person making a decision to overturn an initial decision if there is insufficient amount of quota available at the time. This means that there will, no longer, uh, there will be no change to current administration of tariff quota significant certificates or the impact on related trade agreements. Now, while we acknowledge uh, that this bill seeks to retain the status quo of how TR code certificates, TRQ certificates are administered, uh, we are taking a principled decision uh, not to support the provisions which allow for regulations to make changes to the original Export Control Act and the AAT Act, as we see it limits the capacity of individuals or entities to access a fair hearing uh, where review of decisions are limited in scope. This issue was raised at the scrutiny of Bill's committee level, and we do not see that the Minister's response satisfac satisfactorily accounts for this provision. Our amendments, which we will uh, move, uh, are very simple. Uh, we are seeking to remove items 9 to 13 of this bill, uh, which will allow for the modification of the Export Control Act uh, and uh, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975. 
Uh, the function of our amendments are to ensure that exporters seeking to challenge the decisions uh, around TRQ certificates and entitlements have access to full uh, to the full available extent of recourse. Now, in closing, I will reflect upon a, uh, a very fine speech uh, made in this chamber during the last sitting uh, by Senator Carr, a distinguished and long-term uh, member of this place. Senator Carr made a very compelling argument uh, that unless there was a uh, very well articulated case uh, made by the government, uh, made by uh, the public service, made by the department, uh, that uh, legislative ability be put beyond the review or in intervention of this chamber, uh, that such an act should not be taken. And I'll just uh, quote uh, directly from the, the digest of this bill uh, in relation to the comments made by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. Um, and I quote, the committee further stated that its concerns were heightened by the fact that modifications uh, may be made in relation to the review of decisions and therefore affecting an individual's right to a fair hearing. It is requested uh, Advi it requested advice from the Minister as to why the provisions are considered necessary and appropriate, the circumstances in which it envisages the powers will be used, and whether they may trespass on the right to a fair hearing. Now, at the time of the production of the digest of the bill, the Minister had not even uh, deigned to answer. The answers that were subsequently given uh, went no way. Uh, far enough to justifying uh, such a potential risk. Uh, in addition, the Scrutiny of Bills Committee expressed concerns about the amendments which enabled delegated legislation to modify primary legislation. If I remember rightly, uh, another key point made by Senator Carr in the previous sitting. The committee stated that such provisions, referred to as Henry VIII clauses, uh, impact on the level of parliamentary scrutiny and may subvert the appropriate relationship between the parliament and the executive. As such, the committee expects a sound justification for the use of a Henry VIII clause to be provided in the explanatory memorandum. In this instance, the explanatory memorandum provides no justification as to why it is necessary and appropriate uh, for rules to modify the operation of the Act or of the AAT Act. No justification as to why it is necessary. Now, in the absence of such a justification, I would put it to the Senate that the only responsible legislative course of action uh, is to remove such provisions, and that is what our amendments will seek there to do. Uh, in the absence uh, of the adoption of these amendments, we will proceed to vote against the bill. Uh, on the principle that uh, such action should not be taken by the legislature without the relevant justification made. We must draw a line. We must draw a line in relation uh, to the uh, systemic, uh, what seems now to be perpetual undermining um, of this legislature not out of any attempt to retain uh, any sense of prestige or ego in ourselves, uh, but out of an acknowledgement that uh, we are here on behalf of our community to do the work of scrutiny. We are a house of review. And so we should never, without good cause, diminish our ability to review. This legislation does that, and therefore, uh, and I must say, does that based on some evidence given to the uh, relevant committee from the department, uh, justifying it on the basis of removing unnecessary administrative burden upon the department? Now, this was a not dissimilar argument uh, made a couple of weeks back in relation to uh, the 
trade legislation uh, that prompted Senator Carr's contribution. Uh, this argument that uh, basically having to do your job, having to put a bit of work in, uh, having to do the admin is a justification for undermining the legislative purview of Australia's uh, ultimate chamber of review should be roundly rejected as nonsense, absolute nonsense. And so, as I said, should the amendment that we will offer fail to gain uh, the support of the Senate, we shall vote against the legislation. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Export Control Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill. This bill is important as it will help modernise Australia's trade environment and ensure our farmers have continued and reliable access to overseas markets. The bill will amend the Export Control Act to make sure that it is fit for purpose. It will streamline and consolidate existing export controls. The bill will make five um, amendments to the Act. It will clarify the application of the fit and proper person test to vary a registration of or to approve an alteration of an establishment. <clears throat> Secondly, it will enable the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment to make rules to enable a notice of intention to export a consignment of pre prescribed goods to be approved or refused. Thirdly, it will enable the Secretary to make rules to prescribe requirements for determining whether to issue an export permit. Fourthly, it will modify how certain provisions apply to reviews of decisions for, travel, for tariff rate quotas. And finally, it will clarify which instruments may be incorporated into the framework to calculate the tariff rate quotas for goods. Madam Acting Deputy President, our farmers, producers and agricultural exporters are the lifeblood of our nation, and they must be provided with an environment that is easy to navigate and one that allows them to thrive, particularly in COVID and hopefully post-COVID environments. This bill is particularly important to the Northern Territory, where our two biggest agricultural products, cattle and mangoes, have large export markets. We have a good reputation for high quality produce. We can't compete on price. Labor and unions have seen to that. We can't compete on quantity. Most countries in the world produce cattle and most countries in the tropics produce mangoes. The only things we can compete on are proximity to markets in the case of cattle and buffalo, which are going to, to Indonesia and Vietnam mostly. And we compete on quality, again, with our cattle and with our mangoes into Asia and the UAE. It is vitally important to ensure we continue to develop legislation to support these markets. Labor don't support agriculture in rural Australia. This was evident in 2011 when they recklessly slammed a live export ban on the cattle industry. Madam Acting Deputy President, I can't tell you how devastating this ban was, particularly in the Northern Territory and certainly to my hometown of Catherine. Producers suddenly overnight had no income. They had no capacity to buy or pay for goods or services. This immediately flowed on to associated industries, such as transport, feed producers, stock and station agents and veterinary practices. Again, in a small town, the flow on was immediate and severe. Suddenly, a large portion of the town 
could no longer go to a restaurant or a cafe, could no longer buy something from a retail outlet, could no longer afford to get something fixed on their home or property. It devastated our economy and it did so for many years. However, we as a government do care and do support our agricultural industries. We must give them all the support and assistance we can and use the levers at our disposal to ensure they have the best possible opportunities to maintain and grow export markets. This bill will reduce some of the red tape and congestion that can be an impediment to their trade. The Liberals and Nationals government has announced a sweeping set of reforms and investment into Australia's agricultural export sector to help drive an economic recovery in rural, regional and remote Australia and the nation more broadly. The investment is a major drawdown payment on achieving a hundred billion agricultural sector by 2030. It currently stands at 65 billion. It's an ambitious target, but one that's very achievable. Our investment and reform agenda is an opportunity to reimagine our services from an exporter's perspective. The government wants to get out of the way of business, but provide a seamless service experience. By using advanced technology, we will significantly transform how the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment delivers its services. And in the meantime, we will freeze fees and charges. We are investing $328.4 million in the agricultural export system to modernise Australia's training environment and lead a strong economic recovery. We have provided $222.2 million to transform our export systems, including contributing to a single digital one-stop shop, fast-tracking goods to international markets. And we have invested $14.3 million to improve our regulation, particularly for the live animal and seafood industry, to provide greater access for exporters refocusing their businesses into new markets. Live animal exports have remained relatively strong, but we've all heard about the lobster industry and their suffering at the hands of the Chinese market. Madam Acting Deputy President, the Liberals and Nationals government has also provided $10.9 million to reduce the regulatory burden on meat processors and maintain Australia's status as a leading source of premium animal products. Now, our, our friends at the opposite back corner would like to ban live exports today. Well, I'm sure they will rejoice at this announcement as increased processing will eventually replace live export. But we are doing much more and have invested $10 million for streamlined plant export services, giving farmers quicker, easier and cheaper access to overseas markets. There is $71.1 million in direct cost savings to exporters, including immediate price freezes, plus $21.4 million in reform-driven fee reductions over four years. These investments are anticipated to return benefits of at least $236 million to the sector as we progress towards the target of a $100 billion agricultural sector by 2030. Remember that achieve, uh, um, ambitious but achievable target. With about two-thirds of Australia's agricultural products being exported, it is vital that we support these exporters and create an environment in which they and Australia as a whole benefit. And Madam Acting Deputy President, that is exactly what we have done. 
We have invested $72.7 million to help Australian agribusinesses expand their export markets as part of the Agribusiness Expansion Initiative. There is $669 million to address air freight shortages and disrupted supply chains for agriculture and fisheries exports through the International Freight Assistance Mechanism. $11.4 million to enhance the international competitiveness and profitability of the horticulture sector. $6.14 million to extend the Package Assisting Small Exporters Grant process and $5.1 million to reduce the impact of non-tariff measures by funding industry-based analysis. These initiatives build on the $51.3 million commitment under the Growing Australian Agricultural Exports Measure from 2018-2019 to expand our agricultural exports and seize market access opportunities in global food chains. This includes funding for the Overseas Agriculture Councillor Network and expansion into new locations such as Mexico, Chile and the UK. As I mentioned, Madam Acting Deputy President, the government has also beefed up its agribusiness expansion initiative, which is a targeted measure being put in place to help Australian farming, forestry and fishing exporters expand and diversify their export markets. We understand only too well how important that is in the face of what's become very apparent to us with regards to the Chinese markets. <clears throat> As I said, and it's worth repeating because it is such a good initiative, the government is investing $72.7 million to help Australian agribusinesses expand their export markets as part of the Agribusiness Expansion Initiative. This including $42.9 million to support 2,000 agri-food exporters through the Australian-led Accelerate program, providing targeted advice and trade missions to help exporters grow in new and existing markets. We have also invested $18.4 million to extend the Agricultural Trade and Market Access Cooperation Program to develop strategic partnerships with industry <coughs> to support trade expansion and diversification. $6.8 million to accelerate the negotiation of technical agreements to provide food safety, animal health and biosecurity protocols with trading partners by boosting our scientific and technical capabilities. $3.5 million for three new short-term agricultural councillors, able to be rapidly deployed to, to pursue market access priorities with the greatest commercial prospects to complement the work of our existing 22 agricultural councillors. $1 million for marketing intelligence and analysis to assist in identifying opportunities for exporters. <coughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, this bill is important to not just our farmers and agricultural exporters, but to the whole of the country. Because if our farmers thrive, the rest of the country thrives too. This is a government that is committed to making the right choices <coughs> that help our farmers and exporters to maintain and grow their markets and contribute to Australia growing a strong and healthy economy. We know that when our rural industries thrive, when the bush is doing well, the nation as a whole does well. And certainly for the Northern Territory, where export is such a vital part of our agricultural industries, streamlining the process, removing the red tape, making it easier for exporters to do business, is an absolutely vital function of this government. 
And this government, unlike those on the other side, has shown that it cares for rural areas, it cares for regional areas, it cares for primary producers, it cares for exporters, and this government will continue to support all those industries now and well into the future. Um, I am very, very happy to commend this bill to the Senate. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, the bill that is before us, the Export Control Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020, is required to amend parts of the Export Control uh, Act 2020. The bill addresses issues identified since the Export Control Act received royal assent on 6 March 2020, following consultation with key industry stakeholders. The bill will clarify the application of the fit and proper person test for variations of registration of or to approve an alteration of an establishment. It will enable the Secretary to make rules to enable a notice of intention to export a consignment of prescribed goods to be approved or refused. Furthermore, the bill will modify how certain provisions apply to renew, uh, reviewable decisions for tariff rate quotas and enable the Secretary to make rules to prescribe requirements for determining whether to issue an export permit. The bill will also clarify which instruments may be incorporated in the framework to calculate the tariff rate quotas for goods. The bill will support the implementation of the new export control framework and minimise administrative burden for Australia's agricultural export industries and stakeholders. The bill will support the initiatives of the Morrison-McCormack government to bust congestion in regulation and ensure that agricultural industries come out firing after the threat of the coronavirus has passed. I commend the bill to this chamber. Is leave granted? The question is the bill will be read a second time. Those um, say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Oh, Clark, sorry. A bill for an act to amend the Export Control Act 2020 and for related purposes. Is the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There is no objection. It is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Clarify. Um, there is a need. I would like to move an amendment to the bill, um, and I would. I think that requires us to go into the committee stage for me to do so. So I just want to make sure I didn't just miss my opportunity to do that. You would like to move your amendment now, Senator? I, I can, if that's all right with you. I move amendment uh, one on sheet uh, one two zero two. Uh, and move that the uh, amendment be agreed to. Uh, is there any speakers? Do you want to speak to it? Just clarify the intention of the amendment. Minister. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, um, uh, Senator Steele, John, the, um, we are not going to support um, the amendment. Um, because it would deny the Department of Agriculture, Water Resources and Environment its legal basis to ensure tariff quotas were not over allocated. Um, the intention of this bill that's before us is to provide greater clarity under the Export Control Act and the inclusion of tariff rate certificates in addition to tariff rate entitlements reflects the fact that some of the trading partners use different terms. Uh, it's also important to note that the measure is already in the Export Control Act 2020 and the proposed government bill seeks to avoid confusion for exporters. Uh, the amendment that you've put forward, would, as I said, would deny the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources and Environment its the, the legal basis to ensure that quotas aren't over allocated. Uh, and the bill and the retrospective measures also make clear that exporters will be unable to seek a formal review of the quota allocated to them where the full quota has been allocated. So quota arrangements are negotiated as part of bilateral arrangements, regional and multi trade agreements and it would be inappropriate for the department and the government to put in a, be put in a position where it is exceeding its agreed quotas uh, and allocations. So that is the reason why we will not be supporting uh, your amendment, Senator Stilldrum. Senator Stilldrum. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, as noted by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, uh, there is a question to as to whether this uh, bill, as it currently stands, 
uh, may trespass on an individual or an entity's right to a fair hearing uh, because of the uh, amendments that it makes to uh, the relevant legislation uh, relating to the administrative uh, tribunals uh, administrative appeals tribunal um, as i said in my first contribution to this debate uh, when combined with the Hen so called henry the eighth clause uh, within this bill um, these two aspects of this legislation take something which uh, would otherwise be seen as purely administrative and they put up some pretty significant red flags. Um, and I'm speaking particularly to the, to the ALP when I'm thinking here that there, is, there are a few times during the course of my time here when I've been genuinely moved and motivated by a speech made by uh, a member of this place. Uh, one of those times, however, uh, was the speech made by Senator Carr in the previous sitting in relation to the absolutely urgent need uh, that this House of Review, this Chamber of Review, reassert its prerogative uh, to review actions and decisions made by the government under legislation and that it, do, that it in no way volunteer the opportunity for that power to be taken away unless there's a good point, good reason made for it. Uh, it's our view in the Greens that a good enough reason has not been made for the inclusion of the so-called Henry VIII clause here, um, and that additionally there has been nowhere near the compelling case made uh, to uh, remove relevant decisions from the purview of the AAT. Uh, the amendments offered by the Greens this evening address these flaws in the legislation uh, and I commend them to the Senate on that basis. Thank you, Senator. Minister? No. I'll put the amendment be agreed to. Minister, would you seek response? Look, um, thank you, um, Madam uh, Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, Senator Sealjohn, the, the methodology for allocating quotas differs across um, different markets, um, and it also allows the way that it's been um, um, designed allows new entrants and small exporters to be able to access those uh, those quotas as well. So, um, it is just simply a means of us being able to provide all exporters with an opportunity to be able to participate in our export markets. And uh, whilst I've heard your concerns, we do not believe um, that, uh, that your, the, the, the amendment that you um, are putting forward will improve the bill. We believe it will be detrimental to the bill, so therefore we won't be supporting it. Um, put to the chamber that uh, the amendment sheet 1202, that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? No. Uh, the noes have it. Uh, you require a division? I call a division. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. The bills have stopped ringing. The motion before the chair is an amendment moved by Senator Stilljohn. All those in favour, please say aye. Yes, those in favour of the motion move to the right of the chair. Those who are against move to the left of the chair. I'll put the um, point of um, Senator Smith and Senator Seward as the tellers. The question, um, there being 34 ayes and 9 nays, oh, sorry, there being 9 ayes and 34 noes, the amendment has been lost. Um, I now move that the bill stand as printed. The question now is that the bill be reported. Sorry. Uh, I move that the, the motion before the chair is that the bill as amended, uh, that the bill standard as printed. Those in favour, please say aye. All the against, say nay. I declare it carried. The question now is that the bill be reported. All of those in favour, please say aye. All those against, say nay. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Export Control Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020 and agreed to without amendment. All those in Minister? I move that the report of the committee be adopted. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against? Declare it carried. Minister. I move the bill now be read a third time. The motion is that the bill be read a third time. All of those in favour, please say aye. All those against? I declare the ayes have it. There's a call for a division. Ring the bells for one minute.
sorry. Uh, stop the bells. Those um, who support the motion move to the right. Those against to the left, I appoint Tellers Seawert and Brockman. The question was that the export bill be read a third time. Eyes 34, nays 9. Declare it carried. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Export Control Act 2020 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 2. National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment, Technical Amendments Bill 2020. Second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Seeing as I've spoken to the motion, it just needs to be put, I believe. Is that right? You had finished? The bill has been um, all those. No. Your amendment, sorry, Senator. I've moved the amendment, and I, I'm not sure that I need to do anything else. To, I think it just needs to now be put by the chair. The amendment moved by Senator Pratt uh, be amended, uh, be agreed to. All of those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against? No. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Call a division. Four minutes. Have we got the amendment?
Lock the doors. Question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Green tell if the ayes and Senator Brockman tell if the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 31. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. The question is now that the, bill's, that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. As we're going into committee, I'll ask a temporary chair or the deputy president to come up. What are we up to? Is it the wish of the committee that we will take them? <coughs> uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand is printed. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Labor has some 10 amendments to this bill uh, and we had sought to move them together but I understand in negotiations that we need to split them out. Now the reason Labor is moving these amendments today is that the scheme as it currently stands does not deliver on the promise made by this parliament for redress. Redress that's timely, redress that, d that does not re-traumatise and redress that does not leave survivors missing out. The reality of this scheme, as rolled out by the government, does not reflect the will of this parliament. It falls short of the original recommendations of the Royal Commission. Our amendments seek to address major structural shortcomings of the scheme. We seek to bring the scheme back in line with the original intention and motivation of the Royal Commission. To end the delays caused by institutions not doing the right thing and not joining the scheme. To ensure no one misses out through strengthening funders of last resort provisions and the introduction of an advanced payment scheme. By delivering full redress for survivors by lifting the cap on payments as prescribed by the Royal Commission and making sure that prior payments are not indexed, not indexed to take away from redress, a redress payment, including from members of the stolen generations who were paid redress for the fact that they were removed as children, not necessarily for uh, the sexual abuse that they suffered at the hands of the perpetrators in the institutions that they were stolen away to. Making sure that a request for a review of redress cannot, uh, uh, and the offer, a review of that offer cannot result in that offer being reduced, and scrapping the existing misguided and arbitrary assessment matrix and delivering on one that is fair and properly recognises the full impact of abuse ensuring ongoing psychological and other forms of uh, cultural support for survivors throughout their lives. After so long, it is time for this parliament again to reflect on the promise that it made to deliver redress, to deliver redress to survivors of childhood sex abuse within Australian institutions. We have today, tonight in this chamber, an opportunity to improve this scheme and this parliament should deliver on that. We are some uh, quarter way through the 10-year life of this scheme and still the number of redress payments are tracking well below what was expected. And do you know what this means? This means there are institutions out there that know 
They've got records. They've heard of how many victims of abuse inside those institutions uh, have experienced that abuse. And still, even though those institutions have signed up and are ready to make those payments under this scheme, still there is enough deterrent to people uh, inside the scheme for people not to seek to do the paperwork and sign up. And our amendments today are designed to help clear that path to make the application and pursuit of redress that much easier for victims and survivors. It's a clear warning sign, uh, the low uh, take-up rate in and the low number of payments. And we have something today, uh, we have a responsibility today to do something about that. Um, I'd like to ask um, the minister this, after, this evening, in relation to the matrix, are you aware that many of the concerns that Vic, uh, survivors have raised with the matrix and its potential use were indeed identified the first before this scheme was even implemented and in the early debates we had about this legislation? Senator uh, Ruston. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, well, in, uh, in, in a broad response um, to the contribution just made by Senator Pratt, um, I would say um, a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, um, there seems to be a lack of understanding by those opposite about um, how this scheme was actually designed to operate. Uh, it's designed to operate in such a way as um, all of the states and territories who have um, a level of responsibility and have got some uh, have made a commitment towards this scheme um, have established a board in conjunction with the Commonwealth government that requires the uh, the unanimous agreement uh, for any changes to the scheme to actually be negotiated through that particular board uh, the other thing that um, is failed to be recognized in the contribution that has just been um, given to us is the fact that um, part of the, uh, the establishment of the scheme in the first place was that we would undertake a statutory two-year review by an independent assessor. Uh, that person is Robin Cruck, uh, AO. Robin uh, was the person who undertook um, the redress scheme that was established with inside the, the, uh, the military or the defence forces, uh, and she is due to report um, from uh, her review that has been undertaken over the past few months in a couple of weeks' time. Her review has sought to get the advice from a number of different sources, but most particularly her review has been informed by the contribution uh, and the interviews and the consultation that have been undertaken by survivors themselves. And, uh, what the government wishes to do um, as part of the process of that review is to wait to find out what the reviewer recommends um, so that we are able to be able to understand um, a review, a formal independent review uh, that has actually taken into account the voice of survivors. So, um, you know, whilst I think that uh, much of uh, the, the amendments, uh, many of the amendments that have been put forward um, uh, by the, the opposition today, um, you know, in, in principle, um, you know, there is nothing to say that, that, that many of them don't have very good merit um, to them, and, and, in, and in principle, um, you know, the government is certainly not arguing against them. But what we are saying is. You know the process. You understand the reviews in place. I have had significant and detailed conversations with the shadow minister in the other place, um, and it was tremendously disappointed to see that these amendments were still intending to be moved. Um, and in doing so, we seek to supersede or preempt the uh, the response that we get back from our independent reviewer, who has been inf informed by survivors. So um, the government will not be supporting um, any of the recommendations or any of the amendments that have been put forward um, by the opposition um, because we actually believe there is an appropriate process to go through to enable us to, to uh, have a firm and solid independent benchmark uh, against which we can make 
um, at continuous improvement. And, uh, Senator Pratt, we do not shy away from the fact that this scheme has not been perfect, um, but what we do say is that we wish to work together and continue to work in a bipartisan or a multi-partisan way so that we can make sure that this scheme is the best it can be. Coming in here two weeks before the independent review reviewer is due to table her report, which I have agreed to make public, um, I think um, suggests to me that you're not perhaps as genuine as you might be suggesting you are. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. How quickly will the government put forward amendments to this legislation on the basis of the findings of the review? You've said many of the issues that we've raised you expect to be canvassed. Uh, how, how quickly will you make a decision to amend uh, the very same bill that we are debating, the, the very same act that we are debating amending today? Um, well, cl yeah, clearly, the, the, um, the bill that we're debating today has absolutely no um, relevance whatsoever. Um, this is actually a technical um, bill that yeah. seeks to make. Uh, to, yes, indeed, but I just wanted to make it very clear. This is, these are technical amendments to support the bill, uh, the, to support the act, to make sure that it, it is, is functioning in a way uh, that is, is more effective. Uh, so this bill has got nothing to do with the, the matters that are before the chair in relation to the amendments. Um, but as I said in my previous contribution, um, we have a redress board. The redress board is made up of me as the representative of the Commonwealth Government and also all of the other ministers in the states and territories who have responsibility in their respective jurisdictions um, for, the, uh, for the redress scheme. And so the process that would happen after we receive the review, um, clearly we would all have the opportunity to have a look at the, uh, the recommendations of the review and then we would seek to go back because, as I said, um, we require a consensus amongst this, uh, the ministers, all of the ministers that sit on that redress board. Um, but I want to reiterate: this government absolutely is committed to a, a program of continuous improvement in the redress scheme. We know that when we started off with this scheme, uh, it certainly did not start off <clears throat> um, as well as we would have liked it to. The complexity uh, of the, of the, um, the, the survivor. Um, the applications that we received from survivors was much, much more, um, more complex than we ever imagined. But we don't shy away from the fact that we are absolutely committed to continuous improvement. We will give an absolute commitment to say that we will work with the state and territory ministers, uh, informed by the review and informed by the advice that we've received from survivors, to make sure that we continue to provide the redress in the most timely way we can for survivors who have come forward. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Can I ask, Minister, will you commit now to implementing all of the recommendations of the review? I know it's an independent review, so I'm assuming that they will be public uh, quite soon, that you may ha even have some idea uh, of what they may, some of them may be. Uh, and I want to ask you if you will implement all of the recommendations. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, as I made um, the contribution in my previous contribution to your previous question, um, as I said, I am but one of a number of ministers that sits on the National Redress Board. I require to be able to consult and negotiate with those other ministers in relation to any changes that might be made to the Act. Um, and equally, um, I do not know what is in the review. Uh, and so to come in here and speculate on this technical amendment bill about something that I haven't even seen would be inappropriate. Senator Pratt. If the redress board minister does not agree to a much needed change, will you call them out publicly? Will you act unilaterally to make some improvements? How will you work to address the issues raised by survivors? What happens if this board rejects the findings of the review? Are you going to hide behind that board uh, in order to uh, get out of acting on behalf of survivors. Minister. I can assure you that I have no intention of getting out of acting on behalf of survivors, and I find the comment actually quite offensive. Um, however, I'm not going to come in here and speculate on hypotheticals, um, but I will reiterate my commitment and the commitment of this government to make sure that this scheme is as best as it possibly can be to support survivors. Yeah, yeah. Senator Pratt. Given the process you've outlined, Minister, that we're waiting for the re recommendations uh, that come out of the review. You said that's due in a couple of weeks, I believe. Uh, and you 
say that, yes, it's coming soon, so why are you pursuing these amendments now? And yet, then you go on to say, well, it's still got to go, any changes still have to go to the redress board in order to uh, make any changes to this, uh, this act. I want to ask you, Minister, given the issues with the matrix, given the indexing uh, of payments, given the problems with the uh, number of redress payments tracking below what is expected, given uh, the delays caused by institutions not joining the scheme, giving, uh, given the issues around strengthening funders of last resort to ensure that everyone's got access, but particularly the issue of things like indexing, things like the matrix, what, what is your advice to survivors today? If they are concerned about the current management of the redress scheme and the current provisions of the Act, uh, should they wait to put their application in? Will they be judged according to the old matrix, the new one? Will they be invited to resubmit their applications? You must have some idea noting that this review is coming, you must have some idea of the kind of issues that you are going to need to take to this board rather than just saying, wait and see. You've got to, actively, you've got to be able to actively manage right here and now the expectations of survivors. Otherwise, they might be thinking, well, I might, I'm going to have to wait two more years to put my application for redress in and yet they may well find that nothing changes. What is your advice to survivors today, Minister? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And as I've said before, um, the independent two-year review that's being undertaken by Robin Croc AO has sought to draw on the advice and experience of survivors in relation to this scheme. Her review will be informed by that advice. The amendments before us here today have not been informed by a formal process of consultation with survivors, and I believe the most responsible thing that I can do as the minister, that this government can do, and other governments of states and territories, is to wait and have the independent review informed by survivors before we make decisions about any changes going forward. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I ask you, Minister, to reflect more specifically on the amendments we have moved today, which indeed allow you as Minister to respond uh, with flexibility and latitude to those recommendations. And I'm happy uh, now, if you like, to go through some of the specifics of those. But if you look at uh, the form of the amendments that, lay, uh, that we seek to move um, from three onwards, that the issues that are going to come up in the review are, li are very closely match the issues that we raise in these amendments and, again, would enable you in large part, and we can await to be corrected because you are going to have to legislate to make these changes at some point in the future anyway, would enable you to move much more quickly in response to that review in a couple of weeks' time. It would enable you to, go, to take the findings of the review and use the amendments made in this place to respond flexibly and take new arrangements to uh, the board. So again, Minister, I ask you to reflect on the need uh, to urgently pass these amendments today, rather than waiting, as you have uh, suggested, uh, until the outcome of the review. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, um, the, the contribution that we've just received from Senator Pratt um, assumes, uh, assumes that um, the amendments that have been put forward will be um, the recommendations of the review. We do not have the review, and so we are preempting uh, an independent review. Um, so I, I don't accept the premise of your comment. Uh, 
Senator Patrick. Uh, with your indulgence, Chair, I'm uh, not quite sure of the status of where we're up to. Um, I heard Senator Pratt saying that you will move uh, uh, mo um, you will move amendments separately. I'm not sure whether you've actually moved any amendments at this point, so the answer is no to that. I know that Senator Seawitt's got some more general questions. Uh, perhaps if you could um, assist Senator just— Senator Patrick, no amendments have been moved. Okay, so I'm just, uh, uh, I would ask for the assistance. Perhaps Senator Pratt could uh, tell, because the running sheet basically says that everything's being moved together, just to understand how they're going to be broken up. And, and I do have some general questions, as I know Senator Seawitt does. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, there are 10 amendments. Uh, and they're numbered uh, specifically because in our discussions with the crossbench uh, we are not as yet clear on which amendments are being supported by which senators. It's incumbent on us, therefore, to move one to ten separately. Uh, but the revised sheet does specifically number them um, separately. Senator Seawood. Thank you. Um, I have some questions for the minister about the bill and a couple of things more generally as they apply to the scheme. Um, can I ask, and I indicated in my second contribution, can I ask, in terms of associate institutions, um, that survivors will no longer be provided with the full list of the associate institutions under these amendments. What are you going to do to ensure that survivors can access this information in alternative ways. Um, as I made the comment in my second reading, uh, second reading amendment, um, they have a right to know um, who they are then signing away to the fact that they won't undertake any civil litigation. Minister. <clears throat> Um, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator, in response to Senator Seawitt's question, um, uh, all of the institutions that sit underneath this, um, that the, the actual application will be available online, so the survivors can actually have a look at um, all of the institutions. But um, the purpose of this measure, I suppose, is to um, not put a huge list of institutions to a survivor, um, but they will be able to get access to the actual institution. Yeah, it's a trauma, and, and the, the changes have been sought to be put in place because we've been advised of uh, the fact that this is a more trauma-informed way of being able to provide the information to survivors. Senator Seawood. Thank you. Will that, uh, so will the, um, the specific site be, or a specific link be provided to uh, survivors so that then they, they, if they choose to, and I take your point, um, but if they choose to, they can then access that list. Uh, Senator Seward, I, I'm advised advise that, that that will be possible um, as part of the um, you know, subject, obviously, to the, um, the, this bill being passed. Senator Seward. And thank you. And I presume, therefore, that people will be given the the information that's provided to survivors um, when they're uh, making an application, etc., will be changed in order to let to inform them that you're not the reasons why the list isn't being provided and that they can access it so that, in other words, they know to go and look for it if they want to. Minister. Um, I, yeah, Senator Seward, I'm advised that that will be able to be, a, um, be facilitated for the survivor if that is their wish. Senator Seward. S um, thank you. The issue here is they, uh, they may not know to go and look for it unless they're specifically told, not ask for it. I, I take the point about not giving them the whole list, that it should be up to the survivor, but they don't know. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know to ask for unless you are told that you can access it if you want to. Minister. Thank you, um, Senator Saywood. Uh, I'm advised that in the letter that is responded to the, uh, the applicant um, that they will identify the specific institutions in that uh, instead of, as we currently do, um, just putting a great big long list, uh, it will be more specific so that 
the, the survivor doesn't have to trawl all the way through a million organisations to find the one that has perpetrated the action. Senator Seward. Thank you. And I presume, um, just so I've dotted the I's and crossed the T's, that if somebody is not using the online uh, system, there will be an alternative way to be able to access that information. Minister. It will also be provided to them in written form by way of a letter. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, the next one that relates to, the, to the, this bill, um, the bill clarifies, as we've articulated during the debate, that one or more participating government institutions can become funders of last resort. Um, what guarantees are there that no survivors are going to have to wait even longer and experience delays as further delays as a result of these changes, because it's already a lengthy process when you've got one funder of last resort? Minister. Yeah. Uh, look, the, the purpose of this actual amendment, Senator Seward, is we actually believe that it will make it, um, it will expedite the, the process and, and make it um, faster. Uh, so, but more than happy to keep you briefed um, and up to date as, as, this, uh, as these amendments roll out um, to, to demonstrate, you know, why we're putting them in place. But it is our belief um, from the advice that we've received um, that these changes will actually make it faster, not make it more um, complicated. Senator Seward. Um, could you just outline briefly uh, why you think it's going to be quicker um, to do it this way, and will you be specifically looking at the times from now on that these provision, these um, applications that that are for funders of you know, institutions that are um, are defunct, um, how? what the timeline is, so that there's actually going to be a process to make sure you're tracking it really carefully? Minister. Yeah. Um, the, the, when the, um, the, the Royal Commission um, undertook its in, in investigation, they didn't actually anticipate this as being an issue. So for that reason that in the primary legislation there was no provision um, for the funder of last resort to actually be shared between um, various jurisdictions. So what this actually seeks to do um, is to make sure that you know there is a possibility of a um, uh, you can have more than one funder of last resort, and so that um, the defunct institution's share of um, the liability um, or the redress cost is divided equally between uh, the two government institutions. At the moment, it, it, it doesn't actually work like that, so it just puts clarity back into it, um, and, and, and it gives us a quick and easy mechanism contained within the actual act to be able to do it. At the moment, it, the silence in the act in relation to being able to split the, the, the funding liability of a defunct institution. Senator Seward. Um, thank you. I um, will just comment that I think that we are going. This isn't the end of dealing with the funder of last resort, and I think you will <laughs> acknowledge that process. That there's further reforms that are needed. Um, can I go on to? Fairbridge Restored and the Princess Trust. I, I want to ask for an update. You'll be aware that this is close to a lot of people's hearts, and in particular us Western Australians. Um, this is a very tricky issue. I will freely and frankly acknowledge that. But could you please provide the Senate with an update as to where the ongoing negotiations are and consideration of this issue, given that Fairbridge Restored, unless something is done, it's going to, by the very nature of the legislation in the UK, will cease to exist shortly, as I understand it, unless there's been some progress there. Minister. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, and look, thank you, Senator Seward. And I, I know for the West Australian senators in this place and, and others in this parliament, this has been a particular issue, um, not the least of which because of the, um, the sizeable number of people that were involved with Fairbridge. Um, and uh, so, as a result of Fairbridge's restored refusal to join the scheme, we named and shamed them on the uh, the first of July last year, um, and we are continuing to consider um, and work through the particular options uh, about how we can um, ensure that we get the, the redress that the survivors of that particular institution deserve. Um, so. At the moment, um, we are in negotiations that included um, you know, the Department of 
um, has engaged with the Department of Home Affairs and the Australian Government solicitor in relation to um, the unique situation in terms of the relationship between Fairbridge, Fairbridge Restored and the Prince's Trust. Um, and because of the stage of those negotiations, um, I can't really give you um, a lot more information because clearly we need to um, move to the settlement and we would not seek uh, by any commentary in here uh, to prejudice the, the outcome of those negotiations. But um, can I just say that you know, we, are, we will continue to advance the work to make sure that we resolve this issue and we are confident that we will be able to find a solution that can be progressed to ensure that survivors of that particular institution can get the redress that they deserve. And I regret I can't give you any more detail on that. Um, I do appreciate the sensitivity of these, uh, of these particular um, discussions. Is there a timeline that you can share with the chamber? Because a number of us have been pursuing this for quite some time and are concerned about the slowness, and, and I'm not casting aspersions, I, I get it, um, in terms of these things take time, but we've also got group, a group of survivors who are very keen to find out what's going on. So have you, could you give us a sense of a timeline um, for a start, please? Look, um, thank you, um, Madam Acting Chair. Um, I can't give you a timeline, but what I can say to you that in terms of um, the priorities of uh, this scheme uh, and issues before us at the moment, uh, no priority could be higher uh, than to resolve this particular issue. Not to suggest for a minute that you know, every survivor is a priority of the scheme, um, but on the basis you know, of, of the comments that you've just articulated, uh, we place a very high priority on resolving this particular matter as soon as we possibly can. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Um, to, the, to the minister, I just wanted to get a feel for um, the, the timeline in respect to the review. I, I say this uh, having just over the last couple of days got a, uh, a return on an FOI about, a, uh, about the National Archives review. And uh, I note it was commenced in April 2019. Uh, it was provided to the minister in, uh, in February of, or thereabouts, February 2020 still not public and um, I'm, I listen to what you said that you uh, that you suggest these amendments might be premature but uh, I will of course give much stronger consideration to supporting Labor's amendments or at least some of the, the amendments if uh, indeed uh, any uh, legislation that's likely to remedy or deal with some of these issues is in fact uh, two years away. So I'm just trying to get a feel for, uh, you know, you're going to get the review at some stage uh, in the next couple of weeks, and uh, I wonder how long you're anticipating considering uh, the review, uh, and then perhaps a timeline. Best endeavours. Um, I just want to get a feel for that, please, Minister. The Minister. Present. Um, well, um, Senator, um, the. The operation of the scheme is such. Well, so just a quick. I mean, you weren't in the chamber when I, I gave a bit of a timeline to um, Senator um, Pratt a minute ago. Um, the process that occurs will be the report will be provided to government sometime in the next few weeks. I mean, hopefully by the end of this month. Um, the, reckon, the, the report will then be provided to the other members of the redress board, which are the ministers in the states and territories who have responsibility for redress in their particular dis, de, um, jurisdictions, um, and then. Um, we will seek to meet um, straight afterwards. So, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming we meet April. We are meeting in April, um, so that the, um, the state and territory ministers will have a month to consider the recommendations in the review. We will then meet uh, in April, and then uh, at that which at what at that meeting we will consider those recommendations and um, seek for decisions to be made as to whether there is unanimous support. To, uh, to implement those recommendations. Um, the thing that uh, I think that has been failed to be realised in this place is that the federal government does not have the capacity to act unilaterally and make changes um, because whilst we could do it, 
um, we require, because of the way the Redress Act is written and the way the board is established, we require the support of the states and territories. You know, this is a, is a partnership agreement, um, and so that is the way it's been set up. Um, because we obviously um, much of the uh, responsibility um, exists within those state and territory jurisdictions. So um, I can certainly give you um, a commitment that the speed that, that you know, the Commonwealth seeks to move as quickly as we possibly can. But I can't preempt, firstly, what the report is going to say, which is what these amendments seek to do, uh, and secondly, I can't preempt what agreement that I'll be able to reach around the, uh, the redress board table. But I certainly can give you an absolute commitment that, firstly, the, the, the review will be provided to the states and territories immediately after the Commonwealth government receives it. Uh, I can give you a commitment that I will be meeting with the board, the redress board, in April, at which time we will consider those recommendations. And I can also give you a commitment as soon as the board has agreed to it, I will be releasing the report so that it is, uh, is available for, for public review. Senator Patrick. So just a couple of follow-up questions on, on what you've just said, Minister, and I thank you for that. Um, uh, for the first question is, uh, based on what you've just said about a partnership agreement, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if the amendments that are being moved by Labor uh, would put that agreement in, in, into a breach situation, just to get an understanding of that as, as a first question. Well, certainly um, it is in breach of the, 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 good, the intent of the, the legislation. So, as I said, the federal government cannot unilaterally make a decision on behalf of the redress board, which is what these amendments seek to do. What I would seek to do is to take um, any um, changes to the redress act that are um, recommended in the review, to take them to the redress board to seek f for their approval, because there may be situations where they have to also. Um, undertake you know, legislative amendment within their own jurisdictions um, so that I can get their agreement so that when I come back to this place and, and I will give you an undertaking that we will move as quickly as we possibly can, uh, when I come back to this place I know I'll be coming back with the full support and agreement of the other members of the redress board. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to ask you, Minister, um, you currently have the power to do things on behalf of the Commonwealth, like top up payments or respond to some of the issues that indeed we all know are being already being publicly canvassed. Do you acknowledge that you have the power to do that? The Minister. Um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, this is a cooperative scheme. Um, we went into this in, in good faith with the states and territories that we would operate um, together. Um, I, I, I am actually getting a little tiny bit distressed that, um, despite my responses to, to many similar questions and many similar questions, that um, you seem to refuse to accept what I'm saying. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I'm well aware of that, coming from the state of Western Australia, where. Uh, the state had some difficulty in signing up because of the complexities in negotiating with the Commonwealth around um, some of the uh, agree agreement around some of those issues. So you certainly don't have to underscore that to me. Can I ask you, Minister, will you ensure that the report uh, uh, of the review is responded to by the government and uh, the committee within 90 days. The Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, as I responded to um, Senator Patrick for the questions that he asked, I outlined the process. We will receive the report, I would imagine, within the next um, couple of weeks, um, hopefully by the end of February. Uh, we have a redress board meeting that has already been scheduled for April to give them the opportunity, the other members, the opportunity to consider the, uh, the report. Uh, and at that redress meeting, the, the matters that are contained in the report will be considered. So um, that is the process that already has been put in place. And I, as I said, I also will make the report available um, publicly. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, I refer to our third amendment. It's numbered number three uh, uh, on those pages. Uh, I'm happy to move it now or I can move them in order. But I, specific to this question, I want to ask you, Minister, do you agree that the um, issue of the cap 
remaining at $150,000 uh, that the um, restricting of that cap does not provide adequate redress to some victims and that this is an issue that will be need to be actively considered in the review. The Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, well, look, Senator Pratt, um, it is not for me to unilaterally make a decision. These matters are all before the review. Uh, the review. The review, no, it is actually, and that is where you're absolutely wrong, Senator Pratt. It is not a decision of this parliament. It is a decision of the parliaments of the states and territories across Australia. There is an, an, an agreed process. It was agreed in this place when the scheme was stood up, and I understand, um, Senator Pratt, that, that everybody in this place agreed with the establishment of the scheme um, under its current format. We are seeking, as part of that process, we undertook a two-year review because we believed, you know, setting up a scheme of this magnitude. I mean, this is a this is a very complex scheme, and, and it has proved to be very difficult. We are not shying away from the fact that it has been a very difficult scheme, um, but we are absolutely committed to the continuous improvement. And part of that is making sure that we allow the independent review to under, be undertaken and to provide that advice back to us. Um, you know, I, I think really all we're seeking to do here today. Um, is to preempt by a couple of months um, the determinations of a group of um, people that have been established under the Act uh, with the responsibility uh, for delivering uh, this particular scheme. Um, so I can't. Every single amendment, with the exception of the one about naming and shaming, has exactly the same answer, Senator um, Pratt, and that is that they are all matters that are likely to have been canvassed in the review, and I will not preempt the views of survivors that are contained in that review for the political purposes of this chamber. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, in turning to the amendment uh, on uh, the, the third amendment in the 10 that we are moving, what we ha have outlined here is to call on you as the minister to consider the action that needs to be taken to increase the cap from 150 to 200 within 90 days of the commencement of this section that you must report on what the minister has done or plans to do to have the cap increased. If the minister has not done and does not plan to do anything, the minister's reasons for this. Now, you can do all of those things in a manner that is consistent with the review, except if the review says, well, I guess we don't want to uh, recognise uh, the, the rest of the public debate that's happened that clearly argues that the cap is too low and that uh, $150,000 is an inadequate uh, cap and that it needs to be increased to $200,000. I do not understand why, if you are heading into negotiations with the states, why you would not want to be armed uh, with uh, the demonstrable will of the Senate and, indeed, the parliament to show that there is a clear position that the cap should be increased. It does not restrain you in any way other than commit you to working through a process about what actions you will undertake to increase the cap. The Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. What I have committed to do is what the Act has asked me to commit to do, and that is to undertake an independent review that is clearly informed by an independent structured process to get the views uh, of survivors to make sure that anything that goes before the redress board is fully informed by an independent assessment that takes into account the full views of survivors uh, that, have, uh, that have been a significant part of the consultative process. Nothing changes from that. I have given an absolute commitment to this place, uh, and I will continue to give a commitment to this place to work through the appropriate processes to make sure that I am listening to the voices of survivors through the most appropriate means, and that is the independent review, not a political discourse. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'll now move to moving some of our amendments. Amendment number one, asking that a review 
cannot result in a reduced payment. I'm sure these issues will come up in the review that you are referring to, but it is a common sense safeguard. It is a safeguard that could be uh, enacted and considered by the parliament now so that uh, we uh, do not, so that this government and the parliament can make progress on these issues. It's such a simple amendment, but it would mean so much to those in the scheme. As we know, people are not asking for a review uh, of their payments because they fear the amount being offered being reduced. It's con connected with the complexities uh, in the matrix and the application, whereby uh, there are a whole range of reasons where the sum offered to them does not in any way uh, reflect what they think and what any other assessment, if you actually went through the particulars of their case, would show adequate redress to be. Uh, the Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, the government will not be um, accepting, uh, will not will be opposing this amendment. Um, I'd just like to inform the chamber that um, I had very detailed discussions with um, uh, Shadow Minister Burney in the other place in relation to this particular issue. It was a matter that she raised with me when she came to see me about this particular bill. I gave an undertaking to the Shadow Minister that I would investigate any specific situation that the Shadow Minister was aware of where somebody had sought a review and that the review had come back and indicated that they had a decrease in payment. Um, I'm still waiting for um, Ms Burney to, um, to come back to me because um, you know, if, if in any situation in this place, if there has been a, a detrimental or a, an outcome that has been delivered through my department that has caused concern to somebody's constituent, my door remains open. Um, as I said, I have never received any advice from Ms Burney about a, a, any instance where this has happened, despite the fact that it has been spoken about. Um, and I have asked, um, as part of the review process, that, that this issue be considered. Uh, I am happy to, to have a look at any situation. And if Senator Pratt's got a particular, uh, a particular case that she would like me to, um, to, to undertake an investigation on, I'm more than happy to do so. Um, but I think you know, to come in here and, and actually talk about hypotheticals when um, I am unaware whether you're aware of anybody who has actually received a review that has re resulted in a, in a detrimental um, or a, a resulted in a, a decreased, decreased payment being um, undertaken. Uh, and um, uh, my understanding um, is that uh, the situation as it currently exists is that if there was a situation where there had been an error made by my department in relation to um, an assessment resulting in um, the, the review showing it, that no, I'm, well, I'm telling you that now, Senator Pratt, um, that in any circumstance where the review has resulted in a mistake by the independent um, assessor or, um, or by my department where the, a, a lower amount has been recommended underneath the review, uh, the payment ha a, has not been reduced. Uh, Senator Pratt, can I just clarify, did you wish to formally move Amendment 1 uh, or are you wishing to move them together? Uh, I do want to move them separately. Uh, however, uh, it would make sense so that we're not calling everyone down to the chamber um, uh, after individual yep. debates for me to outline all of the amendments so that we can then put the questions one after the other, if that seems to make sense to others. Okay. Um, so I have outlined amendment number one, which is that a review should not result in a reduced payment. Our second amendment was to hold the government to account on its naming and shaming of non-participating institutions. Uh, so number two on uh, our pages of amendments, it amends Schedule 1, page 15, and inserts a section that uh, calls on the government, well, in, uh, legislates that the government must name an institution uh, if after the first six months uh, where an application has been made that it continues not to want to participate. 
It, it introduces a requirement that the minister names any institution that refuses to join the redress scheme within six months. I acknowledge the government's policy. I acknowledge, acknowledge that that policy was put in place after significant pressure from survivors, uh, and we brought Labor brought voice to that within the parliament. But this naming and shaming is not guaranteed. It requires proactive management by the government. I've no doubt you'll do the right thing, but this is also parliament wanting to express its will about this policy uh, and that this policy should be legislated. If you, as you say, that your undertaking uh, as a minister is entirely consistent with ours as a parliament that sees this as important, then you, we've got a moral duty in this place to vote this amendment up. Participating in redress is a part of any institution's social licence, and we have an expectation in this parliament that a failure to participate should have the full glare of the Australian community. Now, in speaking to the further amendments, uh, they are, are, as I outlined, deliberately structured to give the government flexibility and latitude, flexibility to negotiate with the states and territories to make the changes needed by the scheme. And it foreshadows very much a commitment to not only the outcomes of the review, but the issues that have been identified in public debate, in parliamentary committees and by senators in this place. We don't need to wait for the review to know how substantial these issues are. We have a clear commitment from the government to bring the scheme uh, back. We need a clear commitment, I'm sorry, for the government to bring the scheme back to what the Royal Commission intended. And what we need is leadership, not we're just going to wait for the review. We need leadership because we know that that's what uh, survivors of abuse have been saying. They require the minister to report to parliament within 90 days on what steps will be taken to achieve these changes. There's no reason for the government and the minister not to accept this responsibility and accept this level of scrutiny. Indeed, it is our right to be able to scrutinise uh, these movements, not just that of the committee uh, that's made up by the states. These issues include increasing uh, the cap on redress payments, as we've already outlined in debate. Again, with flexibility, uh, that it calls on you to, to draw, to outline your actions on increasing the cap, and that that table, that report, should be tabled. Ending the indexing of relevant prior payments. What the minister has done or plans to do to have indexing ended, as mentioned in the subsection. And if the minister has not done and does not plan to do anything, the minister's reasons for this. We've seen the legacy of the impact of prior payments being indexed, and it's heartbreaking to hear those stories of people who go through the onerous process of retelling the story of their abuse to then barely get any redress once a tiny payment from years ago is indexed. People feel insulted and disrespected when this happens. It's incredibly difficult for people to dredge this up, and they should not be left with the feeling they are being left empty-handed after this process. Deducting prior payments. We need to see safeguards, and this is item five. Deducting prior payments. We need safeguards to ensure that the prior payments deducted from redress are relevant prior payments. And again, I'm sure this issue will come up uh, in the review. This, um, uh, uh, so we, then we've got uh, Schedule 1, Item 51, at Item 6, 
Amendment 6, advanced payment schemes for elderly and ill applicants. We know for elderly and old applications, too many people have already died. It's a scheme already working well in Scotland. There's no reason that you should not accept the will of the Senate today uh, on behalf of survivors of abuse to uh, support this amendment. It would not cost more. It would just give people recognition and peace of mind at the end of their lives. And seven, finally, an amendment in relation to the funder of last resort. This amendment makes sure that no one misses out on redress. If an organisation that's folded and has no longer any links to a continuing organisation or if an organisation genuinely does not have the resources to participate in the scheme, the government should make sure redress is paid. And this, of course, leaves it open to the government to continue to pursue avenues of um, seeking that, those monies from other institutions. But you can't put people through uh, the prospect of seeking redress, victims at places like Fairbridge, and then tell them that there's nothing on the table. At number eight, psychological counselling and support. As Senator Smith already highlighted in the earlier debates today, we need to make sure that ongoing counselling and support is provided, but also that it's culturally appropriate. The, the money that has been, uh, as the bill is currently structured, uh, sorry, as the act is currently structured, uh, is paid in a lump sum, and it's supposed to be uh, enough for a lifetime. People can be left with as little as $1,250 for their lifelong counselling and support needs. So again, this amendment calls on you to report on what the minister has done and plans to do to ensure that those resources are flexible and available to people over their lifetime. Amendment number nine, better recognising the impact of sexual abuse. This is very significant, and I would hope that the report in the review picks this up. But indeed, the government should and has the capacity to respond to that issue now. One of the reasons I think that redress some uh, survivors are unhappy with the uh, offers that are put to them is actually about the cruel and arbitrary nature of the matrix. And I recall in the Senate when these issues were discussed in the past, including in hearings about the legislation and the nature of the matrix, where we couldn't get details from uh, the bureaucrats at the table in relation to how the matrix would work. It seemed that there was a concern that the matrix would somehow be gamed. Now I know that the notes and introductory statements when people apply and go to fill out the matrix asks people to be explicit as to the nature of their abuse. However, the evidence that we have heard uh, before the uh, joint committee, and I'm sure it's been an issue uh, before other committees, is that survivors of abuse do find it very difficult to be completely forthcoming about that, and that they <coughs> believe that those assessing these should be able to read between the lines. Senator Pratt, your time's expired. I'm happy to. Uh, so I'd like to move amendments. Uh, I'll just move number one. Thank you. And I would like to speak to the final two, unless, of course, the, okay. the minister wants so, to give me an opportunity to finish that. To amendment number one, then uh, you have the opportunity to finish your last two amendments. Okay. Um, look, um, thank you very much, um, Madam Acti Deputy President. Um, Senator Pratt, um, I, I think you, in, in moving this amendment in relation to the naming and shaming, have misrepresented um, what we already do and how the scheme operates in relation to the naming and shaming of institutions who fail to join the scheme uh, within the time frame that it has been um, allocated to them. 
but I think you fail to understand um, this is, these, in, in many instances, are incredibly sensitive situations, um, and every every application that we receive is different in some way. And so the scheme needs to retain um, the flexibility to make sure that we are acting in the best interests of the survivor and providing the information to the survivor. And when you end up with some extraordinarily complex um, uh, applications, um, you know some of them. Terribly heartbreaking um, to read. Uh, it is uh, when they've named many, many institutions. The process through which um, making sure that we get all the institutions to to join is uh, is extremely complex. What we would seek have sought to do by making the absolute commitment to this place, by making the commitment through the redress board. Uh, it has been sanctioned by the redress board that we name and shame organisations that have not joined up within six months of being notified um, that they have been named in an application. and We also made the same uh, provisions for those organisations that were named in the Royal Commission. Um, we clearly have honoured that commitment. On 1 July, we named and shamed six institutions. I have to say it was, it was pleasing to find that two of those um, have joined the scheme subsequently. Um, and on the 1st of January this year, we didn't have to name any subsequent institutions because all institutions that had met their um, had exceeded the, the the time period which we put in place had all joined the scheme, which enabled us to be able to progress the, the applications of survivors against those institutions. Uh, we further made a commitment that was um, was approved through the redress board to say that from the federal government's perspective that no further grants would be able to be accessed by an institution who failed their moral obligation to join the scheme. Um, and so that is already in place and I'm pleased to be able to advise this chamber that the state and territory governments have also um, instigated proceedings to make sure that no institution that is named is able to access grants from their respective um, jurisdictions either. And the final thing that we did and we announced um, as part of our name and shame exercise, which, as I say, well, pleasingly, we didn't have to name and shame any further institutions on 1 January this year, was that we made the announcement that we were going to, through the process of the um, Australian Charities um, or the, not -for -profit, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission, uh, that we would be revoking charitable status from any organisation um, that did not join the scheme. Um, so this will have a significant impact on any organisation that has been named by the scheme who doesn't do the right thing, that their chari charitable status will be revoked. So um, we have been absolutely committed and we have done everything that we have said that we would do. We have committed into the future by changes um, that, uh, to, the, to the, um, the Act that we will Every uh, that we will continue to name organisations. We got the policy through the redress board to say that any institution would have six months to join from the time that they were advised that they'd been named by uh, an application um, between to, to join through go through the process of joining. But I also would like to take this opportunity to actually um, commend the many organisations that have actually joined the scheme who have not had an application named against them. These are organisations that have a history of working with children and have taken their responsibility uh, going forward um, to, to working with children to such a degree that they've actually joined the scheme without an application against them. And that means that if in the future we receive an application against that institution, we don't have to wait the time to go through the process of the six-month process for them to join because they've already joined. So I, uh, I think that the, uh, the federal government in conjunction with the state governments through the redress board and actions that have been taken, have demonstrated our absolute commitment to make sure that we um, name and shame organisations that do not join up to the scheme, uh, as well as taking further um, sanctions and actions against those organisations uh, to penalise them in, in a monetary way. Um, but we seek to, to remain the level of flexibility to understand the sensitivity of the scheme so that the, that the government and the scheme, as the scheme operator with the states and territories, that we can main maximum, maintain maximum flexibility to make sure that we're doing the best that we possibly can to have a trauma-informed response to survivors so that we can get them their redress in the least traumatic and fastest possible way. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Minister, and thank you uh, for taking uh, to your feet so that I can uh, finish uh, outlining our amendments. I do note you responded, I think, to Amendment 2. The first 
But the first question before the chair will be um, Amendment 1, which is about the review, just for your um, clarification. So, Amendment number 9 requires that the impact of abuse be better recognised. Survivors have told us uh, in the committees that I've been participating in about the arbitrary nature of the matrix, which likes payments for impacts to the nature of abuse. For example, was it physical? Was it penetrative? Was it exposure? Was it contact? Was it penetrative rate? Was it fingers? Was it, um, uh, and what was the nature of the penetration and what sex organs were involved? Now, this has actually been very hard for some survivors of abuse to be so explicit. And while in some cases they've outlined the very traumatic impact that the abuse has had on them, they haven't been able to bring themselves uh, to be as explicit as they need to be in their documentation. Likewise, there are others that have um, outlined the nature of their abuse, but indeed the matrix discounts because it uh, rates payments on the basis of the nature of the act that took place rather than on the nature of the impact of that abuse. This amendment calls on the government uh, to report again on these issues so that payments for abuse are calculated independently as uh, recommended by the Royal Commission. Amendment 10 requires non-participating organisations to participate. It makes sure that an if, if an organisation refuses to participate in the scheme or deliberately restructures their assets so as to appear they can't participate, the government will be able to get funds from organisations in order to pay redress. This could take the form of a levy or collection through the tax system. Uh, as we know, there are constitutional limits on seizing assets. However, it is indeed unacceptable for organisations to simply refuse to participate or to hide their assets. They need to be compelled and it needs to be legislated uh, that they pay redress to those they have hurt. So I've ripped through our ten amendments and now in uh, looking to the chair, I seek to move amendment number one uh, on the revised page uh, on the revised uh, sheet one one nine six. Uh, it's very clearly numbered number one. It means uh, that this amendment means that if a person seeks a review of their offer, it cannot be reduced, and this will give people more confidence to seek a review. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. Just uh, noting you moving Amendment 1, I, I, um, I just wanted to ask the minister, uh, I think you said in your, uh, one of your statements before that this is a ma matter that would be considered by the review. Um, I'll probably ask the same question of each of the amendments as they're moved. So, so my question is, uh, is it your understanding that the review is looking into this particular aspect of, of the scheme? And uh, I just ask, in the event that the review didn't cover off on this particular um, uh, issue, whether or not you are open to uh, uh, considering it in the event that the report as that, that's provided to you is silent on this. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Chair. Um, Senator Patrick, um, uh, I can confirm that all of the issues that have been travailed in the amendments that have been put forward by the opposition are matters that are currently being considered by the review. Um, and, uh, and so the, the matter of, of um, this amendment that currently is before the chair, um, number one, um, yes, has been, is being considered as part of the review. Senator Patrick. Thank you. That will uh, truncate uh, the, the remainder of my questions. But the, the second part of the question was, um, actually, I, sorry, I, I guess it's uh, redundant in, the, in respect that you say all of them, all of these issues will be tra traversed. That just uh, takes me to amendment number 
three, if I may, uh, in relation to the, the, um, the cap. Uh, it's my understanding that the Royal Commissioner recommended a minimum of $10,000 in, in a payment, uh, a maximum of 200000 as is proposed to be uh, considered here, and indeed uh, 65000 was considered to be the sort of average payment. So this particular amendment is of particular interest to me because the Royal Commissioner had actually made a specific recommendation uh, in respect of this. Minister. Uh, Mr um, Acting Deputy Chair, uh, uh, Senator Patrick, Patrick, you are correct in relation to um, the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Um, however, um, in order for us to be able to get the unanimous agreement that we required with the Redress Board and States and Territory uh, um, Ministers and the Governance Board, um, it was the view of that board um, that the, the maximum payment be $150,000. We have sought for the reviewer to um, undertake an assessment as to uh, that, that particular number. Uh, you are also quite um, correct um, that the Royal Commission also um, suggested that the average payment would be $65,000. Uh, it actually has proved to be higher than that. The average payment is $83,400. Um, so certainly, um, you know, we are seeing payments higher than, than the Royal Commission had anticipated. But um, it, it was by virtue of the fact that we required the unanimous agreement of the states and territories who are represented on the governance board that the um, decision of the scheme when it was set up was $150,000. But as I said, it's a matter of being considered by the review. Senator Patrick. Uh, just for the uh, benefit of the Chamber uh, and perhaps Labor in terms of moving amendments, on the basis of the Minister's answers, um, I won't be supporting the amendments, uh, but I will support uh, uh, number, uh, number three on the basis uh, that it was a recommendation of the Royal Commission, and uh, th that may assist you in terms of calling uh, divisions. Senator Seward. Thank you. I'd just like to clarify the Greens' position on these matters. The Greens will be supporting these amendments because we think that these issues have been well travailed and it's time that we did see some uh, movement on them. In terms of Amendment 1, which is, the, as I understand it, the amendment that, that um, Senator Pratt has just moved, um, I did listen to the Minister's answer to, this, to the question on this. The point being, and the fact that you'd ask for examples. The fact here is that it puts the very existence of this particular um, process where somebody thinks that they could uh, have their payment reduced actually puts people off seeking a review. That's why we think this is so important, is so that people aren't put off. People are traumatised by the scheme. Um, People, um, a lot of people, I will acknowledge, have had uh, a good experience, but a lot of other people haven't, and they find the whole process re-traumatising. We hear from people who say that they start to do the form, um, and it, it just actually th doing the form re-traumatises them because they rethink about it, and they have to, and they they leave it for a while before they go back to it, and before they complete the form. So I can totally see how people could be put off uh, seeking a review, having gone um, through the process, and then, and then thinking that um, their payment might be reduced. So we think this is particularly important, and we think that um, these amendments, as I said, are way past time. Um, for example, the um, increase in the cap and um, f from 150,000 to 200,000, we made that plain at the time. The Greens made it plain at the time that we actually supported that. It, the same uh, that it should have been 200,000 all along. The same with the indexation um, of, pay of prior payments. Uh, survivors have been complaining um, and are deeply concerned about this since the very get-go. And I do acknowledge that the government has done a lot of work to get institutions to sign up. Um, but having, having this in legislation gives effect to that, to something the government um, has been doing now. 
Um, same with the other amendments, um, but I'll come back to those as Senator Pratt um, moves each one. Thank you, Senator Seward. Uh, Senator oh, right. Pratt, so the, the question before the chair is that Amendment 1 on sheet 1196 uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the, the, the noes have it. Aye, aye. Aye, division required. Uh, ring the bells. Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, 
Amendment 1, as moved by Senator Pratt on sheet 1196, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Giacconi as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order, there being 25 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I think, Senator, I'm looking towards the chamber and I'm giving the call to Senator Seward. I would like to take the opportunity, um, prior to that vote, I articulated the Greens' position on some of the amendments. As there's going to be some, as I understand it, moved together, I'll just take this opportunity um, to outline our, our support for um, the amendments uh, and the, re the brief reasoning for that. Um, the um, amendment five, the amendment that um, will make sure that if there's any doubt about whether a prior payment relates to sexual abuse, the scheme will err on the side of the applicant and not deduct the payment uh, from redress. Um, we will be um, supporting uh, this particular amendment. Um, we think that survivors shouldn't be worse off just because of the way prior payments are considered under the scheme. In terms of the advanced uh, payment scheme, um, we think this is a particularly important uh, amendment for elderly, uh, for elderly and ill applicants. Um, other jurisdictions, as Senator Pratt articulated, like Scotland, have made advanced payments available to applicants as part of their redress uh, schemes. This is particularly important as we know that some survivors are uh, ageing and also they um, um, are 
a, 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 a very vulnerable, and we think this would go a long way to helping them and ensuring they at least see some form of justice, um, given the uh, vulnerability of some of um, our, our survivors. In terms of Amendment 7, this relates to the um, uh, issues um, related to. Um, Excuse me, Senator Seward. Yeah. Um, uh, senators, uh, if you're going to have a conversation, could you please have it outside? The level of noise in this chamber is is quite loud. So, just keep everyone just be quiet. Senator Seward, apart from you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was finding it a little bit difficult to um, uh, focus on the issues at hand with the noise levels. So thank you. Uh, this relates to funder of last resort. As I've articulated before, the Greens are, are indeed very focused on funders of last resort um, because we don't want to see people missing out um, because of issues around the funder of last resort. The evidence that the committee has received, um, I'm going on to Amendment 8 to very quickly outline our, um, our support there and our concerns about this particular issue, but ongoing psychological support. The evidence that um, as I've been on, I think all of the various committees looking at redress, both prior to looking at the legislation, at the, pre the uh, legislation itself, but also on the current joint committee and the previous joint committee, uh, or the previous committee, um, I've had heard consistently people's concerns about the issue around ongoing psychological support, in particularly during the joint committee hearings following the implementation of the scheme. There has been consistently cons deep, deep concern about the insufficiency of the funding and the process for psychological and trauma-informed support, so very, we support that um, process. Similarly, I remember standing in this chamber talking about the assessment framework um, from again from the get-go, and do think this needs to be uh, reformed in uh, recommend in um, amendment the group of amendments around amendment nine, and also we support um, recommend a, uh, amendment ten. Um, we're supportive of moves that constructively compel institutions to join uh, the scheme. I'm hoping by giving our feedback on each of these amendments now, that will assist the chamber to group um, and Senator Pratt to group the amendments and not mean that I'm bobbing up and down each time we have to deal with, we're dealing with the separate the, uh, the amendments. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I now stand to move amendments two to ten. Uh, and I ask that each of those questions uh, uh, f from 2 to 10 be put separately. Uh, we seek in this chamber to advance the interests of survivors. We know that these question issues are before the review, and there's nothing in these amendments that constrains the government other than to be accountable uh, to, to this chamber and indeed to the interests of uh, survivors in a positive direction. Uh, so I commend the amendments to the Senate. Uh, Senator Pratt, uh, what, what I might, might need you to do is I'll need you to move each amendment separately unless you do want to group some of them together. Otherwise, you know, I, I, I'm in the hands of the chamber here. But if you want to do it numerically from 2 through to 10, we, we can do that. But that, that will mean uh, nine divisions. Um, we would be happy, I think, uh, with the Chamber's indulgence. Uh, I think everyone knows their voting intention, that we'll move them separately but uh, have one-minute divisions, if that's appropriate. I, I think the first division might end up being a four-minute four, four division. Of course, naturally, that would the, be the, the case. Um, so, so therefore, you... I stand to move amendment number uh, two, question two, uh, on sheet one one nine six. So the, the, the question before the chair is that amendment two on sheet one one nine six uh, be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, those of those against say no. no. Uh, I think the, the, the noes have it. No. Uh, division required. Uh, bring the bells. Four minutes. Yep.
Lock the doors. So the question is that Amendment 2, as moved by Senator Pratt on sheet 1196, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Giacconi as seller for the ayes and Senator Davey as seller for the noes. Order. There being 26 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I am advised that the opposition intends to put the rest of its amendments wherever Senator Pratt is. Um, and with the concurrence of the whips, I think we're ringing the bells for one minute if divisions are required. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I now move uh, item number th amendment number three on that sheet, which is to increase the cap on redress payments uh, from 150,000 to 200,000, as recommended by the Royal Commission. So the question is that the amendment, as moved by Senator Pratt, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against. No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that amendment three on sheet 1196 is moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as seller for the ayes and Senator Davey as seller for the noes.
hora. De...